Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents The King's Men by Nora Sakovich, narrated by Alexander Sendes. Chapter 1 Even after a semester at Palmetto State University and a couple weeks practicing on the largest XE stadium in the United States, Neil was still struck breathless by the foxhole court. He lay flat on his back on the half-court line and soaked it in. He counted rows of alternating orange and white seats until they blurred into an indistinct mess near the rafters, then studied the spring championship banners hanging in numerical order around the stadium. There was one for each of the Foxes, including the late Seth Gordon. They hadn't been there before the Foxes split up for Christmas, and Neil wondered what Allison would say when she saw them. "'You forget how to stand up, Justin?' Neil lolled his head to one side to look at his coach. He'd left the court door open behind him, and now David Wymack stood in the doorway. Neil didn't think they'd been here long enough for Wymack to finish his paperwork. Either Wymack didn't trust Neil to keep his promise not to practice until he was fully healed, or Neil had lost track of time again. Neil hoped it was the former, but the knot in his stomach predicted otherwise. He'd agreed to spend Christmas break at Edgar Allen but the Ravens operated on 16-hour days during their holidays. What should have been two weeks passed like three, and Neil's internal clock was going haywire even after two days back in South Carolina. Classes were supposed to start Thursday, though, and the spring season kicked off the following week. Wymack was sure having a normal routine again would help. Neil could only hope he was right. It's time to go, Wymack said. That was enough to make Neil get up, though his battered body protested. He ignored the pain with the ease of long familiarity and resisted the urge to work at the ache in his shoulder as he crossed the court to Wymack. He didn't miss the critical once-over Wymack gave him, but chose not to acknowledge it. They landed? Neil asked when he was close enough. You'd know if you were answering your phone. Neil pulled his phone out of his pocket and flipped it open. He pressed a couple buttons, then tilted the dark screen toward Wymack. I must have forgotten to charge it. Must have, Wymack said, not at all fooled. He was right to be suspicious. Neil had let his phone die on purpose. Before going to bed on New Year's, he'd shut his phone off and left it unplugged. He still hadn't read the messages his teammates sent him over the break. He couldn't avoid them forever, but Neil hadn't figured out how to explain his actions. The ugly injuries he sported were an unexpected consequence of facing Rico. The tattoo on his cheek would take a little more work to justify, but it was doable. What Neil couldn't get around was what Rico had done to his appearance. After nine years of colored contacts and hair dye, Neil finally had his natural coloring back. With auburn hair and bright blue eyes, he was a spitting image of the murderous father he'd spent half his life out running. He hadn't looked in a mirror in two days. Denial wouldn't change his appearance back, but he'd throw up if he saw his reflection again. If he could at least dye his hair a couple shades darker, he might breathe a little easier. But Rico made it clear what he'd do to the foxes if Neil changed his looks. They're at baggage claim, Wymack said. We need to talk. Neil bolted the court door behind him and followed Wymack up to the locker room. Wymack cut the stadium lights behind them, and Neil looked back as the foxhole court was swallowed by darkness. The sudden absence of light sent a chill down his spine. For a moment, he was back at Evermore being smothered by the raven's malevolence and the court's forbidding color scheme. He'd never been claustrophobic, but the weight of so much hatred had almost crushed every bone in his body. The jangle of keys brought him back from that dangerous edge, and Neil turned, startled. Wymack had gone into the locker room ahead of him and was unlocking his office door. Although they were the only two here, except for the security guard making obligatory rounds somewhere, Wymack had locked the office in his short absence. Neil had been in there enough times to know Wymack didn't keep anything particularly valuable on his shelves. The only thing of any import was Neil's duffel, which he'd tucked into the office corner before heading to the court. On Neil's first day in South Carolina, he had asked Wymack to protect his things, and seven months later, Wymack was still keeping that promise. It was almost enough to make Neil forget all about Rico. Wymack stepped aside and gestured for Neil to help himself. 
In the short time it took Neil to pick up his bag and sling the strap over his shoulder, Wymack disappeared. Neil found him in the lounge, sitting on the entertainment center to one side of the TV. Neil held on to his bag strap for courage and went to stand in front of him. Kevin called me yesterday morning when he couldn't get a hold of you, Wymack said. He wanted to make sure you were okay. Apparently he knew all along where you were. There was no point in lying, so Neil said, Yes. I made him tell the others, Wymack said, and Neil's heart stopped. He opened his mouth to protest, but Wymack held his hand up and kept going. They needed to know what they're coming back to, for your sake. Think for a moment how they'd react if they came back to this with no warning. You flounder when they call you friend. You'd probably have a psychotic break when they freaked out over you. Neil wanted to argue with that. The best he managed was an unconvincing, I was figuring something out. You were stalling, Wymack accused him. So I did it for you. I told them you looked like you've gone six rounds with a Sasquatch and said you probably wouldn't want to talk about it. They promised not to smother you, but I don't know if they'll keep that promise when they see you up close. This, though, I didn't tell them about. He gestured vaguely at his own face. Neil touched the bandage on his cheekbone that hid his new tattoo. This? All of that, Wymax said and nodded when Neil moved his hand to his hair. I don't know why Rico did it, but I'll wait for my answers. What you tell them is on you. It was almost enough to thaw the ice in his chest. Neil didn't know what to say, so he nodded and looked at the clock. He didn't have to pick the others up from the airport because Matt had paid to leave his truck in long-term parking. Neil was supposed to meet them at Fox Tower, but if they were just now getting their bags, it'd take them another twenty minutes or so to get to campus from Upstate Regional. Should I come with you to referee? Wymack asked. To the dorm? Neil asked. Wymack spared Neil a brief, pitying glance. I meant to Columbia. Andrew was being released today. As soon as the others dropped their things off at the dormitory, they'd be on their way to East Haven Hospital. It had been seven weeks since the Foxes last saw him and nearly three years since Andrew was clean. Two of them knew what Andrew was like when stone cold sober. The others knew only unpleasant rumors and speculation. It was highly unlikely Andrew would care that Neil was half-carved to pieces, but Neil had broken his promise to stay by Kevin's side in Andrew's absence. Neil doubted Andrew would take that well. Despite that, Neil wasn't concerned. We'll be fine. If not, at least Abby will be back in town tomorrow to patch you up. Wymack checked his watch and slid off his perch. Let's get going, then. It was a short drive to the athlete's dormitory. The parking lot behind Fox Tower was mostly deserted, but a couple of the Fox's cars were still parked there. Supposedly, security guards made rounds to ensure the cars didn't get broken into during their owner's absence, but Neil still had Wymack pull up next to Andrew's car. He tried the door handles first, then checked the windows for cracks or vandalism. He kicked the tires and decided them satisfactory for the trip. Wymack waited with his engine idling until Neil was done. Do I need to stay? Wymack asked. I'll be fine, Neil said. I'll have Kevin call you when we've got Andrew. Charge your phone and call me yourself, Wymack said. Good luck. He pulled away and Neil went into the dorm. The hallway smelled faintly of air freshener and cleaners. Someone had been by during the break to tidy the place up. His room was on the third floor, the furthest of the Fox's three rooms from the stairs. He let himself in, locked the door behind him, and made a slow lamp of the suite. Finding nothing out of place, he plugged his phone in to charge and unpacked his duffel. The last thing he pulled out was a pack of cigarettes. He carried them to the bedroom window and lit up. He was on his second cigarette when the front door opened. The quiet told him Matt had come alone. Nicky couldn't be sneaky to save his life. Neil heard the thump of a suitcase being set down and the click of the door catching in its frame. Neil took one last deep breath of smoke and stubbed his cigarette out on the windowsill. He forced the tension from his shoulders, prayed his natural expression held, and yanked the window closed. When he turned around, Matt was standing in the bedroom doorway with his hands deep in his coat pockets. Matt's mouth moved soundlessly for a few moments before he finally managed to choke. Jesus Christ, Neil. It's not as bad as it looks, Neil said. Don't, just don't, okay? Matt said. 
He carted his fingers through his hair, mussing his gelled spikes, and turned away. Wait here. Neil went to the bedroom doorway as Matt left the suite. Almost as soon as the door closed, there was the heavy sound of a body hitting the wall. Neil heard Matt's furious tone as he lashed out at someone, but the walls were just thick enough to hide his words. Neil shifted from one foot to the other and made the mistake of looking to his right. The bathroom door was open, giving him a good view of his reflection. The technicolor bruises splattered across his face were awful, but the blue eyes staring back at him were a thousand times more frightening. Neil swallowed hard against a rush of nausea and tore his gaze away. He went back to get his phone and tugged it off the charger. It wasn't anywhere near done, but hopefully there was enough power in it to last until Columbia. Neil turned it off until he needed it and slipped it in his pocket. The temptation to crawl into bed was almost overwhelming. He was exhausted already, and he still had seven teammates left to deal with after Matt was done with him. There was no way he'd survive if the girls were coming back today. Luckily, the three were flying in tomorrow morning. He'd have the night to retreat and recharge. He made himself go into the main room to wait. Matt rejoined him a minute later and closed the door firmly behind himself. He made a visible effort to calm down, but there was still an edge in his voice when he spoke. Did Coach already yell at you? Loudly and at length, Neil said. It didn't do any good. I'm not sorry, and I'd do it again if I had to. No, Neil cut in before Matt could argue. The foxes are all I have, Matt. Don't tell me I was wrong for making the only call I could. Matt stared at him for an endless minute, then said, I want to break his face in six places. If he ever comes within a thousand yards of you again, he has to, Neil said. We're going to play the Ravens in finals. Matt shook his head and grabbed his suitcase. Neil stepped off to one side so Matt could pass, but Matt cast one last look at Neil's face on his way by. Surprise took the edge off his outrage. Neil didn't return the look, but started for the door. He almost made it up. He had his hand on the knob when Matt spoke up. Coach said not to ask about your eyes, Matt said. I'd assumed Rico blackened them. It wasn't really a question, so Neil didn't answer. We'll be back in a few hours. He left before Matt could argue. Kevin, Nikki, and Aaron were waiting two doors down in front of their bedroom. Nikki was holding two gift bags, but dropped them at Neil's approach. Neil was halfway to them before he saw the bruise on Kevin's face. The red stain across half his cheek said a second bruise wouldn't be long in forming. It wasn't the first time Matt hit Kevin, and it definitely wouldn't be the last, but Neil made a note to talk to him later. None of this was Kevin's fault. With that, he pushed Matt from mind and focused on the three men in front of him. Unsurprisingly, Aaron was the safest one to look at. The frown tugging at the corner of his mouth was curiosity, not sympathy, and his gaze lingered longer on Neil's hair than it did on the bruises straining Neil's face. Neil gave him a moment to see if he'd ask, but all Aaron did was shrug. Nicky, on the other hand, looked absolutely crushed as he took in Neil's wrecked appearance. He reached out as soon as Neil was close enough and wrapped his hand around the back of Neil's neck. He carefully pulled Neil up against him and propped his chin on Neil's head. Nicky was tense as stone, but the long breath he let out was shaky. Oh, Neil, he said in a choked voice. You look awful. It'll fade, Neil said. Most of it anyway. Don't worry about it. Nicky's fingers tightened a fraction. Don't you dare tell me you're fine. I can't hear that from you today, okay? Neil obediently went quiet. Nicky held on a minute longer, then finally let him go. Neil turned to Kevin last and felt his stomach drop. Kevin was staring at Neil like he'd seen a ghost. The others might find Neil's abrupt change in appearance startling. The cousins less so, because they'd seen Neil's blue eyes on their trips to Columbia. But Kevin knew who Neil really was, and he'd met Neil's father. He knew exactly what this meant. Neil shook his head in a silent plea to keep quiet. He wasn't entirely surprised that Kevin ignored that, but at least Kevin had the decency to speak in French. Tell me the master did not approve this. I don't know. Neil said. The last several days in Rico's care were a painful, meaningless blur he was still trying to make sense of. He only dimly remembered Jean's hands working dye through his hair. He thought it was one of the last things they'd done to him, but he couldn't remember if Rico's uncle Tetsuji had been present for it. Rico said he'd hurt us if I change it back. All I can do is duck my head and hope for the best. Duck your head, Kevin echoed. 
He gestured incredulously at his own face. Rico called me on Christmas to say he inked you. How long do you think he'll let you hide before he forces you to show it off? The press will be all over this, and they won't stop their questions at your tattoo. He's trying to get you found. Fear was ice in Neil's stomach, eating its way up his throat. Keeping it from bleeding into his voice took everything Neil had. I'll take it as a compliment. He's trying to take me out of the game before semifinals. He wouldn't waste his time unless he thinks we really are going to be a problem for his team. And that means something, doesn't it? Neil. I'll worry about this, Kevin. I'll worry about me. You do what you do best and focus on Exy. Take us where he doesn't want us to go. Kevin's mouth thinned to a hard line, but he didn't argue. Maybe he knew it was pointless. Maybe he knew it was too late. Nicky looked between them as if making sure they were done, then scooped his bags up again and held one out to Neil. Belated Christmas present, he said a little sadly. No one knew your address in Millport, so I figured I'd just give it to you in person. Eric helped me pick it out. At Neil's confused look, Nicky said, he flew to New York for a couple days as a Christmas surprise. Kevin's got something for you in there, too. He wouldn't let me wrap it, so it's in an ugly plastic bag. I'm sorry. Nicky juggled the other gift bag as Neil took the one offered him. I've got Andrews with me, too. Actually, I got you two the same thing because you are like the most impossible people in the world to buy for. I'm sorry, Neil said. I didn't get anyone anything. I'm not used to celebrating Christmas. You mean you were too busy getting pulverized to shop, Aaron said. Nicky looked like he choked on his cousin's rudeness, but Aaron continued like he hadn't said anything wrong. Kevin said you went because of Andrew. Is that true? Neil flicked Kevin a warning look. Yes. Why? Aaron asked. He won't be grateful. He won't be grateful to you for killing Drake, Neil said. It doesn't matter. We did what we had to do. I don't care what Andrew thinks. Aaron studied him in silence. He was looking for answers, but Neil didn't know what the question was. All he could do was gaze back until Aaron finally shook his head and looked away. Neil wanted to push for an explanation, but he needed to save his energy for Andrew. He distracted himself by opening the present Nicky gave him. Wrapped in orange tissue paper was a black coat. It looked small, but was heavy in his hands. It would keep out the bitter chill that had settled in South Carolina. Neil let Nicky take the bag from him. Thank you, he said. You still don't have any proper winter clothes, Nicky said. We should just take you out and expand your wardrobe again, but I figured we'd start with this. You can't keep wearing team hoodies and not expect to catch a cold. Does it fit? Neil unzipped it and started to shrug into it. He only got one arm through before his entire chest and side lanced white-hot with pain. He froze and blinked away the fuzz eating through his vision. I'm sorry, he said, and regretted it immediately. He could hear pain in his voice, thick enough to slur his words. Nicky looked stricken with guilt. I can't yet. I'm sorry, Nicky said. I didn't. I wasn't thinking. Here, here, let me. I've got it. Nicky eased the coat off Neil's arm and folded it. I'll hold on to it until you're better, okay? Okay. Neil gave himself another moment to breathe before digging Kevin's gift from the bag. He knew what it was as soon as he felt the weight of it. He'd worried over this notebook too long not to recognize how it felt in his hand. At a first glance, the binder was an obsessive fan shrine to Kevin and Rico. A little more digging would unearth everything Neil needed for a life on the run. Money, underworld contacts, and his uncle's phone number were hidden between the countless Exy articles. You're not gonna look? Nicky asked. I know what it is. Neil clutched the bag close and looked to Kevin. Thank you. I didn't open it. Neil didn't want to deal with Matt again, so he figured he could take the binder with them to Columbia and lock it up later. Are we ready? If you're sure you're okay with the drive, Nicky said. Neil started for the stairs without answering. The three fell in behind him and followed him to the car. Kevin took his usual spot in the passenger seat and Nicky followed Aaron into the back seat. Neil hid his binder under the driver's seat and ignored the way his body ached as he got in. As soon as everyone was settled, Neil got them on the road. He'd looked up directions to East Haven on WiMAC's computer yesterday. It was an easy drive from here, almost the exact same path they took to Eden's Twilight when they went drinking in Columbia. The only real difference was in the last fifteen minutes, when they looped around the capital and headed northeast. 
Neil didn't realize he'd expected East Haven Hospital to look like a prison until it finally came into view, and the lack of barbed wire on the fence startled him. The gate was unmanned and the parking lot relatively empty. Neil killed the engine and got out. Kevin wasn't far behind him. But Nikki and Aaron were slower to move. The look Nikki flicked the front door was nervous. He hid his unease behind a smile when he realized Neil was watching him. Are you honestly afraid of him? Neil asked. Nah, Nikki said unconvincingly. Kevin was close on Neil's heels as they headed indoors, and Neil didn't miss the way Aaron and Nikki both hung back a bit. He thought their last-minute reservations should make him a little more apprehensive of what was waiting for them here, but he felt nothing. He cased the lobby on his way to the front desk. Floral paintings added a bit of color, and a fireplace facade was built into the far wall. The place was trying for homey and came off like a catalog showroom. At least it didn't smell like antiseptic and sickness. Gracious, the clerk said when she looked up from her computer and saw Neil's battered face. Are you all right? We're here to pick up Andrew Minyard, Neil said. That's not what I meant, she said, but Neil only gazed at her in silence. At length, she motioned to the clipboard on the desk in front of her. If you'll sign in, I'll ring Dr. Slosky and let him know you're here. They crowded the desk and took turns scrawling their names on the top sheet. Neil was the only one who hesitated when his pen touched the paper. Rico hadn't let him be Neil at Evermore. Every time Neil answered to it on the court, Rico beat him for it. Neil hadn't had much choice since the Ravens hadn't known what else to call him, but Rico wanted him to know how much trouble he'd caused the Moriyamas with all of his alibis. The clerk was waiting with her hand out, so finally Neil gritted his teeth and jotted his name under the others. He passed her the clipboard and tried to force the new tension out of his shoulders. They didn't have to wait long before a middle-aged man joined them. He smiled and shook hands down the line. His eyebrows went up when he saw Neil, but he didn't ask. My name is Alan Slosky. I've been Andrew's primary therapist during his stay here. Thank you for coming today. Primary, Nicky echoed. How many did you assign him? Four, Slosky said. At the look on Nikki's face, he explained, It's not unusual for our patients to see multiple doctors. For example, a patient might see me for group counseling, a colleague of mine for intensive one-on-one, -on -one, and one of our rehabilitation specialists for medication management. I handpicked Andrew's team, and I assure you they were some of my finest. I'm sure it made a world of difference, Aaron said. Slosky didn't miss the sarcasm in Aaron's voice, judging by the look he slid Aaron but he didn't take the bait. Neil wondered if it was prudence or an unintended confession of failure. Can I trust that he will have your support in the days ahead? If you have any questions or need advice on how to proceed, please feel free to call me. I can give you my card. Thanks, but we've got Betsy, Nikki said. And at the questioning look Slosky sent him, said, Dr. Dobson? Ah, yes, Slosky gave an approving nod. He looked over his shoulder at the empty hallway, thought for a moment, then gestured to the adjoining waiting room. Please, make yourselves comfortable. He should be down in a moment. He just needs to sign out of his room. They arranged themselves around the room, Nicky and Aaron on separate chairs and Kevin sharing a couch with Neil. Neil gazed at the fireplace without seeing it. His mind was half a world away, drifting between Lebanon and Greece. The room was just warm enough to make him sleepy. He had three, two weeks worth of sleep to catch up on. The raven's nights were short, and pain and violence had broken up most of Neil's. He didn't realize how close he was to drifting off until Kevin's subdued French startled him awake. I know what he's like, Kevin said. Neil looked at him, but Kevin was studying his hands. Rico, if you want to talk. It was the most awkward and uncomfortable thing Kevin had ever said to him. Kevin was known for his talent, not his sensitivity. Consideration and tact were as foreign to him as the German the cousins spoke. That he tried it all was so unexpected Neil felt it like a balm to every bruised inch of his skin. Thank you. I know what he's like, but I can't. Kevin made a helpless gesture. Rico was cruel, but he needed me to succeed. We were the heirs of Exy. He hurt me, but there were lines he would not cross until the end. It was different for Jean. It was worse. His father owed the Moriyamas a great deal. The master paid those debts in exchange for Jean's presence on our court. 
He was property, nothing more. You are the same in their eyes. I'm not property, Neil said in a low voice. I know how he sees you, Kevin said. I know he means he did not hold back. It doesn't matter. It sounded like a lie even to him, but Kevin didn't call him on it. It's over now and I'm back where I belong. The only thing that matters now is what comes next. It's not that easy. I'll tell you what's not easy. Finding out from Jean that Coach is your father, Neil said, and Kevin gave a violent flinch. Were you ever going to tell him? I was going to when he signed me, Kevin said. I couldn't. Were you protecting him or yourself? Both, perhaps, Kevin said. The master is not like his brother, nor is he like Rico. His kingdom is his court, and that is the only sphere he chooses to exert control over. He's never raised a hand or voice against Coach before because Coach has never been a real threat to him. I didn't know if a confession would change things. I couldn't risk it. Maybe when all this is over... Is it ever going to be? Neil started, but movement in the doorway made him forget his words. Andrew stood in the doorway with Slosky at his back. He was wearing the same black turtleneck and jeans he'd been committed in. A bag hung off his shoulder, but Neil didn't remember him packing before Betsy let him out of the house. Neil might have asked what East Haven was sending him home with, except his gaze finally caught on Andrew's face, and he forgot his words. Andrew's expression was blank, and his stare empty enough to put a knot in Neil's gut. Andrew lingered just long enough to see who'd come for him and turned away. Aaron was the first to react. He'd been ignored by his brother for years, being looked at like he was no more interesting than a rock was old hat by now. Aaron motioned to Nicky and started after his brother. Neil and Kevin exchanged looks, calling a temporary and silent truce, and stood. Slosky said something to them as they filed out of the lounge, but Neil didn't waste time deciphering his words. Slosky had served his purpose by getting Andrew off his medication. Neil didn't need or want anything else from him. By the time Neil reached the door, Andrew was halfway down the building already. Aaron didn't follow but cut across the yard toward the parking lot. Nicky went with him, but Neil and Kevin stopped to watch Andrew. Two dumpsters sat against the corner of the building. Andrew upended his bag into one of them, and Neil saw clothes fall out. He doubted East Haven had supplied them. It was more like Betsy Dobson and Andrew had picked a couple outfits up on the way to getting Andrew admitted. Andrew found his family in a sweeping glance and used their path to locate his car. When he set off for it, Neil and Kevin started after him. Nicky had his keys on him, and he got the car unlocked so he and Aaron could pile into the back seat. Andrew opened the driver's door but didn't get in. He stood with his back to the car, one arm propped on the hood and the other draped along the top of his door, and watched the strikers approach. Neil stopped right in front of him to inspect his returned teammate. Neil hesitated by the open back door so he could watch their reunion. If Neil hadn't known Andrew spent the last year and a half fiercely protective and territorial of Kevin, he'd think they were strangers. Andrew treated Kevin to a bored inspection, then flicked his fingers in dismissal. Not even the bruises were interesting enough to get a comment, it seemed. Kevin nodded and went around the front of the car to the passenger seat. Neil didn't wait to see if Andrew's gaze swung his way again, but got in the car. Andrew slid into the driver's seat when everyone was settled and held a hand up between the seats. Neil dropped his key ring into Andrew's palm. Nicky caught Neil's wrist as he lowered his hand and gave a short, fierce squeeze. Nicky likely meant it as an apology for his cousin's cold shoulder— but fire sizzled up Neil's forearm and down to his fingertips. He'd rubbed his wrists raw fighting Rico's handcuffs, and his bandages weren't thick enough to protect him from Nicky's tight grip. Neil flinched before he could stop himself. Nicky let go like he'd been burned. Sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't. Neil's hand was throbbing, but he said, It's fine. It isn't, Nicky insisted, and looked to his cousin. I mean, Jesus, Andrew, aren't you even gonna ask? Andrew cut the radio on loud enough to drown out anything else they had to say. Nicky's mouth twisted, but Neil shook his head and waved it off. It didn't ease the sick look in Nicky's eyes, but Nicky let it drop for now. Kevin reached for the volume controls only once. Andrew popped his hand out of the way and pointed a warning finger at him without taking his eyes off the road. Kevin crossed his arms in a silent declaration of displeasure that Andrew ignored. Neil's head started pounding before they even reached the halfway point to the upstate. He was glad to see Fox Tower, 
gladder when Andrew parked and the car went mercifully silent. Neil was the first out and he caught Andrew's door before Andrew could close it. Andrew didn't move, but there was just enough room for Neil to lean in and get his binder. He straightened and turned to find Andrew had shifted closer. There was nowhere for Neil to stand except up against Andrew, but somehow Neil didn't mind. They'd been apart for seven weeks, but Neil keenly remembered why he'd stayed. He remembered this unyielding, unquestioning weight that could hold him and all of his problems up without breaking a sweat. For the first time in months, he could finally breathe again. It was such a relief, it was frightening. Neil hadn't meant to lean on Andrew so much. At length, Andrew took a step back and slid his gaze to Nicky. You stay. The rest go. Neil looked to Nicky to see if he was okay being alone with Andrew. At Nicky's slight nod, Neil went around the car to join Aaron and Kevin. Kevin stared hard at Andrew over the roof of the car as if he could see through Andrew's blank mask. Neil had to forcibly turn him toward the dorm. They took the stairs up to the third floor. Aaron got the suite door unlocked, but Neil shook his head at Kevin's gesture to join them. He waited until they closed the door behind them before going to the end of the hall and powering up his phone. When the flashing logo finally gave way to his home screen, he dialed WiMac. I was starting to think he'd killed you and left you to rot on the side of the road, WiMac said in lieu of hello. Not yet, Neil said. We're back now. If anyone needs anything, I have my phone on me. Attempt to keep yours on. Yes, coach, Neil said and turned his phone off again as soon as he'd hung up. He'd given his keys to Andrew, so he had to knock to get into his room. He carried his binder into the other room and dug his safe out of the closet. The safe held only a well-worn letter now, but he tucked that into his binder and locked it away for safekeeping. He went back to the living room to see Matt waiting for him on the arm of the couch. Neil returned Matt's searching look with a guarded expression of his own. He waited for the inevitable questions and accusations, but when Matt finally spoke, it was only to say, You okay? I'm fine, Neil said. For the record, I don't believe you, Matt said. Neil lifted one shoulder in a tired shrug. You probably shouldn't believe anything I say. Matt huffed, too strained and quiet to be a real laugh. <laughs> I get the feeling that's the most honest thing you've said to me all year. But Neil? We're here when you want to talk about it. I know. It surprised him that it was the truth. He knew just from looking at Matt that Matt would accept any truth Neil gave him right now, no matter how cruel or unbelievable. He'd done the right thing by going to Evermore. He was making the right choice in standing his ground here with the foxes. It didn't matter how much his reflection freaked him out. If this was the only way to keep his teammates safe from Rico's cruelty, it was an easy price to pay. Neil said, I've never been to New York. It wasn't what he needed to say or what Matt wanted to hear, but Matt didn't push it. He regaled Neil with stories of their holiday, from the cousin's awkward first meeting with his mother to Nicky's crazed shopping sprees. Matt took Neil into the kitchen to show him the whole beans he'd brought back from a local coffee shop. It was late in the day to have coffee, but Matt was tired from traveling and Neil was still out of sorts. Neil dug filters out of the cabinet while Matt ground enough beans for a pot. Neil was filling the pot with water when there was a knock at the door. Matt was closer, so he went to answer it. Neil couldn't see their guest from this angle, but when Matt stepped back in silent invitation, Nicky stepped into the doorway. He looked unharmed but nervous, and there was no hiding the guilt in his expression as he faced Matt. I'd, uh, lie low for a while if I was you, Nicky said. Andrew just found out who put the bruises on Kevin's face. I tried defending you because Kevin deserved it and you paid Aaron's bail, but I don't know how much good it's going to do. Logic and Andrew aren't exactly on speaking terms. Thanks for the heads up, Matt said. Nicky looked to Neil. He sent me to get you. How much did you tell him? Neil asked. Nothing about you. Nicky stuffed his hands in his pockets and gave an uncomfortable shrug. He wanted an update on everything else. Aaron's trial and Kevin's face and the Ravens. I told him we made it to championships and told him about the fight at Christmas banquet. I didn't tell him you weren't with us in New York. Neil nodded and went back to his bedroom. He grabbed his pack of cigarettes first and tucked it in his back pocket. Andrew's armbands were under his pillow where Neil hid them last November. Nicky grimaced at the sight of them. Maybe not a good idea to arm him right now, Nicky said. It'll be fine, Neil said and headed down the hall for the stairs. 
Andrew was waiting in the stairwell, arms folded loosely over his chest and back propped against the railing. His gaze dropped immediately to the dark cloth in Neil's outstretched hand, and he took them without a word. Neil had already seen Andrew's scars in passing, but Andrew turned away to tug the bands on. When his sleeves were hiding the bands, Andrew headed upstairs instead of down. The stairwell dead-ended at a door marked Roof Access, Maintenance Staff Only. Neil assumed it would be locked, but Andrew only needed to give the handle a couple hard jiggles to get it open. Judging by the neat cuts on the door and frame, Andrew had sabotaged the lock long ago. Neil didn't ask, but followed Andrew out into the chilly afternoon. The wind felt stronger this high off the ground, and Neil wished he'd been able to wear his new coat. Andrew went to the edge of the roof and surveyed the campus. Neil stepped up beside him and looked cautiously over the side. Heights didn't make him squeamish, but the lack of a safety rail was unnerving when it was a four-story drop. Neil pulled his cigarettes out, shook two free, and lit them. Andrew propped his between his lips. Neil cupped his in his hands to shield it from the breeze. Andrew turned to face him. I'll take an explanation now. You couldn't ask for answers inside where it's warm? Neil asked. If you were worried about dying of exposure, you're a little late. Andrew raised a hand to Neil's face but stopped with his fingers just a breath from Neil's skin. Andrew wasn't looking at his injuries. He was staring at Neil's unguarded eyes. Did I break my promise, or were you keeping yours? Neither, Neil said. I know you have had ample time in my absence to come up with your precious lies, but remember I gave you a truth on credit in November. It is your turn in our game, and you will not lie to me. Neither, Neil said again. I spent Christmas in Evermore. He shouldn't have been surprised that the first thing Andrew went for was the bandage on his neck. Aaron and Nicky had looked past it, not even noticing it amongst the rest of the gauze and tape. Andrew had spent too much time watching Kevin's back to not put the pieces together. He scratched up a corner of the tape and ripped the bandage off like he wanted to take Neil's face with it. Neil braced himself for violence, but Andrew's blank expression didn't change at the sight of Neil's new tattoo. This is a new low, even for you, Andrew said. I'm not wearing it by choice. You chose to go to Evermore. I came back. Rico let you go, Andrew corrected him. We are doing too well this year, and your feud is too public. No one would have believed you willingly transferred to Edgar Allen mid-season. Andrew smashed the bandage against Neil's face again and pressed the tape flat with hard fingers. You weren't supposed to leave Kevin's side. Did you forget? I promised to keep him safe, Neil said. I didn't say I'd hound him every step of the way like you do. I kept my end of the deal. But not like this, Andrew said. You already said this had nothing to do with Kevin. Why did you go? Neil didn't know if he could say it. Thinking about it was almost too much. Andrew was waiting, though, so Neil choked back his nausea. Rico said if I didn't... Dr. Proust would... Andrew clapped a hand over his mouth, smothering the rest of his words, and Neil knew he'd failed. Rico said East Haven's Dr. Proust used therapeutic reenactments to help his patients. It was a thin line between psychological cruelty and real physical abuse, and Rico made it clear Proust was willing to cross that line if Neil disobeyed. He should have known better than to trust Rico's word. Hatred thawed a little of the new ice in his veins, but the bored look on Andrew's face was hard to stomach. A couple months ago, Andrew was so drugged he laughed at his own pain and trauma. Today, he didn't care enough to do even that. Neil didn't know which extreme was worse. Andrew lowered his hand when Neil went quiet. Do not make the mistake of thinking I need your protection. I had to try. If I had the chance to stop it but did nothing, how could I face you again? How could I live with myself? Your crumbling psyche is your problem, not mine, Andrew said. I said I would keep you alive this year. You make it infinitely more difficult for me when you actively try to get yourself killed. You spend all this time watching our backs, Neil said. Who's watching yours? Don't say you are because you and I both know you take shit care of yourself. You have a hearing problem, Andrew deduced. Too many balls to the helmet, perhaps? Can you read lips? Andrew pointed at his mouth as he spoke. The next time someone comes for you, stand down and let me deal with it. Do you understand? If it means losing you, then no, Neil said. I hate you, Andrew said casually. 
He took a last, long drag from his cigarette and flicked it off the roof. You were supposed to be a side effect of the drugs. I'm not a hallucination, Neil said, nonplussed. You're a pipe dream, Andrew said. Go inside and leave me alone. You still have my keys, Neil reminded him. Andrew dug Neil's keys out of his pocket and pried his car key off it. Instead of handing the rest back, he tossed them after his cigarette. Neil leaned out to see if they'd land on anyone, but the sidewalk below was empty. His keys clattered harmlessly against the ground. Neil straightened and looked at Andrew. Andrew didn't return his stare, but said, Not anymore. Neil opened his mouth, changed his mind at the last second, and turned silently away. He took the stairs down to the ground floor and pushed open the front glass doors. His keys had landed further out than he expected, but sunlight glinting off the metal made them easy to find. Neil scooped them up and spotted Andrew's cigarette a couple feet away. The ash had broken off on impact, but the end still gave off a thin tendril of smoke. Andrew was watching him, still perched on the edge like he had a death wish. Neil wasn't sure why he did it, but he plucked Andrew's cigarette off the sidewalk and stuck it between his lips. He tipped his head back to meet Andrew's unwavering gaze and tapped two fingers to his temple in Andrew's mocking salute. Andrew turned away and disappeared from sight. It felt like a win, though Neil wasn't sure why. He ground the cigarette out beneath his shoe on his way back indoors. Matt was on the couch when Neil made it back to his room. The coffee pot was done brewing and a hot mug felt good to Neil's chilled hands. Matt checked him on his way to the couch, likely looking for new injuries. Neil sat down as carefully as he could on the far cushion and breathed in the steam from his drink. Where were we? Neil asked. Matt sighed but picked up where he'd left off. He told Neil about snow in Central Park and a New Year's countdown spent in Times Square. Neil closed his eyes as he listened, trying to picture it, imagining for a moment he'd been there too. He didn't mean to fall asleep, but a careful tug at his coffee mug had him jolting awake. Matt narrowly avoided getting hit and held up his hands to ward Neil off. Hey, he said, it's just me. The mug was cold in his hands, and the light in the room seemed wrong. Neil looked to the window, needing to see the sky, but the blinds were drawn. He let Matt take his coffee away and lurched to his feet when Matt stepped back. He crossed the room as quickly as his battered body could move and yanked the cords to pull the blinds up. The sun was down, but there was still some light in the sky. It was twilight or dawn. Neil didn't know which. Neil pressed his hands flat against the window. What day is it? It felt like forever before Matt answered and his words came slowly. It's Tuesday. Twilight, then. He'd only lost a couple hours. Neil, Matt asked. You all right? I'm more tired than I thought, Neil said. I'm going to go to bed early. The unhappy frown on Matt's face said he didn't believe Neil for a second, but Matt didn't try to stop him. Neil closed the bedroom door firmly behind himself and began the painstaking process of getting changed. He was breathing through clenched teeth by the time he finally got his sweats on. He clenched his hands to stop them from trembling, but the climb into his loft just sent the quakes to his stomach. It was too early and he was too sore to fall asleep again yet, but he pulled his blankets over his head and willed himself to stop thinking. Chapter 2 Getting out of bed Wednesday morning took a Herculean effort, one Neil managed only because he was as keen on self-preservation as he was on maintaining his lies. He needed his teammates to think he was okay. That meant going about the day as if Christmas had never happened. He bought himself time to lock his thoughts down by going for the world's slowest run down Perimeter Road. Every step sent pain jolting up his legs, and Neil was numb from knees to toes by the time he made it back to Fox Tower. Matt, who disappeared to the gym before Neil got up, was waiting for him in the living room with an incredulous look on his face. You're crazy, you know that? Tell me you didn't really go out like that. What time does Dan land? Neil asked. For a moment, Neil thought Matt wasn't going to play along and let him change the subject. Matt's mouth thinned to a disapproving line. Instead of launching into a lecture, though, Matt said, I'm going to get them at eleven and bring them straight to the court. You catching a ride with Andrew? Yeah, Neil said. 
Coach wants me to check in with Abby before the meeting. Neil locked himself in the bathroom for a quick shower. Drying off afterward was almost more painful than his run had been, despite his best efforts to be careful. He dressed at a snail's pace, grimacing the entire way, and took a minute to catch his breath afterward. It bought him time to put a fresh bandage over his tattoo, but his heart was still pounding in his temples when he left the muggy heat of the bathroom. Matt was sprawled on the couch with the TV on when Neil left the bedroom fully dressed. He said nothing when Neil left, maybe assuming Neil was going two doors down to bother the cousins. Instead, Neil left the dorm and took the winding path down to Perimeter Road. He cut a slow path across campus to the library. He saw only a couple other students on his way up the stairs to the computer lab. Despite the relative privacy, Neil went to a computer on the very last row. He'd stopped obsessively keeping up with the news in September, but today he wasn't looking for dredges of his past. He looked first for anything about his stint in Evermore, found nothing, and moved on to researching the other teams who qualified for spring championships. It was an easy way to stop thinking and waste a couple hours. He didn't remember putting his head down, and definitely didn't remember falling asleep. Fingers digging into the back of his skull startled him awake. He grabbed for a gun, for a knife, for anything close enough to buy him room to flee, and sent the computer mouse skidding across the table. Neil stared blankly at it, then at the screen in front of him. Fingers clenched into a fist in his hair, and Neil didn't resist as Andrew forcibly tilted his head back. Is your learning curve a horizontal line? Andrew asked. I told you yesterday to stop making my life difficult, and I told you I wouldn't promise anything. Andrew let go of him and watched pitilessly as Neil rubbed at his head. Neil sat up straight and started shutting his browsers down. He went through three tabs before he saw what time it was. It was after eleven, which meant Matt was greeting Dan and the girls at arrivals and Neil was supposed to already be at the stadium with Abby. Neil didn't know what was worse, that he'd lost two hours like that or that he'd fallen asleep in the open. He silently counted to ten in French and Spanish. It did little to take the edge off his frustrated anger. Andrew started for the stairs, rightfully assuming Neil would follow. The car was at the curb, hazards flashing. The other three of the group squished into the back seat. Neil didn't know who talked Kevin into giving up the passenger seat or why, but it wasn't worth asking about. He got in and buckled up. I didn't tell anyone I was going to the library, he said when Andrew got them on the road. You only have a couple hiding spots, Nikki said. Coach said you weren't at the stadium. You didn't answer your phone when we called. Neil padded his pockets and dug his phone out. When he flipped it open, the screen stayed dark. He'd charged it yesterday, but not for long. He flipped it shut and dropped it in the cup holder between the front seats. Andrew reached across the car and popped open the glove compartment. A charger was tucked inside. For a moment, Neil thought Andrew had gone through his things, but the red sticker on the cord wasn't familiar. This had to be Andrew's, then. They had the same model phone. Neil pulled the charger out and snapped the glove compartment closed again. A key was fastened to the adapter head with a rubber band. Neil had used Andrew's car key often enough in the past couple months to recognize the shape of it. Neil looked from it to the key in the ignition. Either Andrew had confiscated Nicky's copy or he'd gone out and gotten Neil one of his own. Neither option made much sense to Neil. He'd only used Andrew's car because Andrew needed a second driver in his absence. It was a short drive to the foxhole court, and Andrew didn't follow them inside. Neil keyed in the code to let them in and preceded the others into the locker room. Wymack and Abby were waiting for him in the lounge. Abby looked immeasurably sad as she took in Neil's sorry state, but she didn't chastise him for what he'd done or ask him why. Maybe she'd gotten satisfactory answers from Wymack already, or maybe Wymack was here to make sure she didn't pry. Neil was grateful either way. I can't believe you trusted David to patch you up, Abby said. The man can barely wash a dish, much less clean stitches. Shush, woman, Wymack said. I was careful with him. Abby beckoned with both hands for Neil to follow. Come on, let's take a look at you. She led the way into her office and closed the door as soon as he was inside. Climbing onto the bed wasn't quite as painful as climbing the ladder to his loft was, and Neil perched on the edge of the thin mattress. Abby collected gauze and antiseptic while Neil tried to get his sweater over his head. 
He gritted his teeth at the heat that knifed down his shoulders into his back and tried to take shallow breaths through the pain. Abby helped him with the sleeves and carefully set his sweater aside. Neil picked a spot on the far wall to look at and sat silent while she worked. She started at the top, gently rubbing her fingers through his hair for hidden bumps, and worked her way down. Wymack had just checked Neil yesterday morning, but Abby peeled off all of Neil's bandages save the one on his cheekbone. He told you about my tattoo? Neil said. And these. Abby slid her thumbs along the tender skin under his eyes. You won't ask? Neil said. I've seen your scars, Neil. I'm not as surprised as I should be to find out they're not the only things you hide. I want to ask, but you told me once already not to pry. She went back to work, but it was a long time before she finished. When she was done with his upper half, she still had to take care of his legs. The striped bruises across his thighs, left there by heavy rackets, had her pursing her lips in outrage. There were layers of them, fresher purple ones over fading green and yellow. Neil's knees weren't better off, consequence of falling to them so many times. "'Coach won't let me on the court until you clear me,' Neil said. "'How soon can you?' Abby looked at him like he was speaking a foreign language. "'You can gear up when you don't look like you were trampled in the derby.' "'I'm getting better,' Neil said. "'Besides, I played in worse shape at Evermore.' "'This isn't Evermore. "'I know the season is important to you, "'but I won't let you risk your safety and health any further. "'You need to take it easy for a while. "'For a week,' she said, "'raising her voice when Neil started to protest. "'Next Tuesday I'll decide whether or not I want to let you play. "'If you do anything strenuous between now and then, "'I will bench you for another week. "'Understand? "'Use this week to rest.' And when you can, leave the bandages off. These need air. A week, Neil echoed. That isn't fair. No, Abby said, and cupped his face in her hands. This isn't fair. None of this is. The pain in her voice killed Neil's argument in his throat. Abby looked him over, tracing his vicious scars and new wounds with a desolate gaze. Sometimes I think this job is going to kill me, Abby said. Seeing what people have done, what people continue to do, to my foxes. I wish I could protect you, but I'm always too late. All I can do is patch you up afterward and hope for the best. I'm sorry, Neil. We should have been there for you. I wouldn't have let you be, Neil said. Abby folded her arms around him and pulled him into a hug. She tried to be careful, but it hurt regardless. It wasn't pain that made Neil go still, but uncertainty. The only people who'd ever hugged Neil were his teammates, and those were quick squeezes throughout a good game. His mother had pulled him close before, but usually it was when they were sidestepping curious eyes and she wanted to shield him with her body. She'd never held him like he was something to be sheltered. She'd always been hard. She'd been fierce and unbreakable until the end. Neil thought about her clawing at the air and choking for one last breath. He remembered the tear of her body where her blood had glued her skin to the vinyl. Neil's fingers twitched with the need for a cigarette, for the smell of smoke that was as awful as it was reassuring. Fire was all he had left of her. There wasn't even a hint of her in his reflection. He was every inch his father. She was gone. Even if she was here, she wouldn't have comforted him for this. She wouldn't have held him like he was a hard breath away from shaking apart. She'd have cleaned his wounds because they couldn't risk being slowed by infection— but she'd hit him for choosing the foxes over his own safety. Neil could almost hear her harping at his ear. He wouldn't survive long enough to forget the sound of her voice. It was at once reassuring and depressing, and a sudden swell of grief threatened to swallow him whole. I need to go, Neil said. Are we done? Abby slowly let go of him and helped him get dressed again. He could have tied his shoes, but Abby did it for him. Neil let her and focused on smoothing down his sweater. Abby moved so he could get down from the bed and didn't follow him out. Instead of heading down the hall to the lounge, Neil went out the back door into the court. He couldn't breathe until he was in the inner ring with his hands crushed against the wall, and then the first real breath he managed almost tore him apart. Neil could feel every wall he'd put up to survive at Evermore crumbling around him. He clung to control with his fingertips, knowing he'd drown if he let himself go. His heart felt like molten stone, but every breath soothed the heat a little. 
Neil willed his shaking fingers to go still and headed back to the locker room. Wymack and Andrew were missing, but Matt and the girls had shown up in Neil's absence. He didn't want to look at them yet, so he stalled by looking for an open outlet. He found a spot on the surge protector behind the entertainment center and plugged his phone in to charge. When the light on his phone turned red, he headed for the couch. His casual act worked only until he had to sit down. Nothing he did could disguise how carefully he needed to maneuver onto the cushion. That was where Dan's temper finally snapped. That motherfuck! She cut off so abruptly Neil had to look at her. Renee had a hand on Dan's shoulder. Renee smiled when Neil looked her way and said, We were just debating what to order for lunch. Abby said she'd call it in and pick it up for us so we don't have to wait on delivery. Any suggestions? I'm fine with anything, Neil said. Allison raked him with a skeptical look. Can you even chew? Yes, Neil said. Where's Andrew? Saw him on our way in, Matt said. He and Coach are talking at the far end of the parking lot, getting to know each other all over again, I guess. He's hoping it goes better than their last first meeting. I'm still talking to you, Allison said. Neil rewarded her persistence with another dodge. Have you seen Seth's banner yet? It took a moment for the words to sink in, and then Allison was out of her chair and striding toward the court in six-inch rainbow heels. Dan looked for a moment like she'd go after her, but she changed her mind with a short shake of her head. Sandwiches or Chinese? She asked Neil. Either one is fine. I'm with Allison on the chewing thing. Nicky gestured at his own face, indicating the bruises staining Neil's cheeks and jaw. Noodles and rice are softer than subs. Let's go with Chinese. Matt got up and went to relay the decision to Abby. He was on his way back when the outer door thumped closed. Across the room, Dan sat up a little straighter and shot Renee a meaningful look. Renee dropped her hand and laced her fingers together in her lap. It wasn't the eager response Dan was looking for, judging by Dan's disappointed frown, but Dan didn't have time to push it before Andrew stepped through the lounge door alone. Matt made the mistake of stopping to look. Andrew didn't even hesitate but punched Matt hard enough to knock him off his feet. It should have been impossible to topple him. Matt had more than a foot on Andrew and could outpress any of them at the gym. Andrew had the advantage of surprise, though, and didn't stop when Matt fell. He smashed his fist into Matt's face as soon as Matt hit the ground. Dan was on her feet in a heartbeat, but somehow Neil made it to Andrew first. He didn't even remember deciding to move. He used his body and momentum to shove Andrew back. He expected Andrew to hold his ground, but Andrew let himself get pushed and flicked Neil an unconcerned look. Neil put his hands up between them in case Andrew tried to go around him. Enough! he said. Matt didn't do anything wrong. Andrew flicked his fingers in dismissal. He knew what would happen if he laid a hand on Kevin, yet he was stupid enough to do it twice. If he does it again, I will not be as friendly. You're not seriously threatening him, Dan said, incredulous. Who do you think paid Aaron's bail? If it weren't for Matt, Aaron would still be in prison waiting for his trial. Doesn't matter, Aaron said from his chair. Yesterday, Nicky looked guilty when he warned Matt to lie low. Today he closed ranks with his cousins and shrugged expansively at Dan. Matt helped Aaron by doing that, not Andrew. You can't count a favor for one as a favor to both just because they're twins, you know. That's cheating. Nice to see you too, monster, Matt said a little sourly. Neil looked back as Matt got to his feet again. Matt dragged a hand through the blood sliding from his nose, gave a thick sniff, and grimaced a bit at the taste. Good to see you're still fuck all crazy. Don't look surprised, Aaron said. It wasn't the drugs that made him crazy. Hello, Andrew, Renee said. Andrew said nothing but slid an impassive look her way. A pleased smile curved Renee's lips and she gave a slight nod, acknowledging and accepting whatever she saw in Andrew's heavy stare. That two-second exchange was the entirety of their reunion. Andrew turned his attention back to Neil as soon as Renee had looked her fill. Abby walked in a moment later and hesitated with her purse half-slung over her shoulder. She looked from Dan's obvious anger to Matt's tight expression and bloody nose. It didn't take long for her to put the pieces together, and she turned a guarded look on Andrew. Andrew, she said, welcome back. It hasn't been the same without you. Andrew gazed at her in silence. Abby waited, then figured out she wasn't going to get a response. She glanced awkwardly around at the rest of the gathered foxes. 
The food should be ready by the time I get there. I'll be right back, okay? Try to behave while I'm gone. Thanks, Dan said. Abby flicked one last look at Andrew and left. The door had barely banged closed behind her before Wymax strode in. Neil wondered if he'd been smoking or just wasting time, letting his team acclimate to Andrew's abrupt re-entry and Neil's injuries the same way he'd abandoned them to Allison's grief in September. Wymack quirked a brow at Matt, then looked to Neil and Andrew. Didn't we have a talk about not killing your teammates? Wymack asked. Andrew feigned not to hear, so Wymack looked around. It took him a split-second glance to realize they were down a fox. Allison was just here. Where did she go? She went to see the championship banners, Neil said. She'll come back when she's done crying, Nikki added. She's not crying, Neil said. Nikki grinned. Five bucks says she is. Neil should have brushed it off. Maybe a month ago he would have. He knew his teammates were obsessive gamblers. They would bet on everything from final scores to Andrew and Renee's non-existent relationship to who'd take the first swing in an argument. Putting money on someone's psychological trauma was not new or unexpected, but Neil wasn't in the mood to put up with it today. His meeting with Abby had rubbed his nerves raw and he was barely holding it together for his team. The acrid scent of cigarettes that clung to Andrew's coat was the final straw. Neil kept the edge out of his voice, but barely. Don't you dare bet on someone's grief. Oh, hey, hey. Nicky put his hands up in self-defense. No harm intended, right? No offense. I was trying to lighten the mood. Lighten your chair and go check on her, Wymack said. We've got a lot to go over today, and I can't start until she's back. She'll be angrier at us if we start without her than she will be if you interrupt her. And yes, I mean you, Hemmick. I don't want Neil moving more than he has to. I can walk, Neil said. Proud of you. Wymax said. Didn't ask. Nicky hoisted himself out of his chair and left. Andrew dug a fingernail into the hollow of Neil's throat until he had Neil's undivided attention. Sit down and be still. Neil batted Andrew's hand away and turned back to the couch. Andrew claimed the middle cushion, so Neil eased into the open spot at his side. His body regretted interfering with that fight, but Matt gave a slight nod in thanks when Neil caught his eye across the room. Neil looked to Andrew, trying to gauge his mood, and followed his hooded stare down. Andrew had brought a small knife out and was turning it over and over between his fingers. It wasn't one of the ones he kept in his armbands, but Neil wasn't surprised he didn't recognize it. He almost never saw the same knife twice. It is not that fascinating, Andrew said. No, Neil agreed. He didn't know how to explain the complicated emotions a sharp blade stirred up. His father was called the Butcher for a reason. His favorite weapon was a cleaver sharp and hefty enough to take limbs off in a single hack. Before the cleaver, Nathan Wesninski used an axe. He still kept that axe around for when he really wanted someone to suffer. The blade was dull enough now it required a bit of extra weight, an effort, to cut through bone. Neil only saw him use it once, the day he met Rico and Kevin at Evermore Stadium. It's just... Neil grasped for words, too aware that the conversation across the room had quieted down a little. The upperclassmen were trying to listen in without being obvious. Neil settled for the vaguest explanation he could and hoped his teammates would mistake the pronoun for Rico. I've never understood why he likes knives. Such simple words should not have gotten the reaction they did. Andrew went still and looked up, but he didn't look at Neil. He looked at Rene, so Neil did too. She'd stopped mid-sentence to stare at Neil, but the Renee studying him wasn't the fox's redeemed optimist. Her sweet smile was gone, and the too-blank look on her face reminded Neil of Andrew. Neil instinctively tensed for fight or flight. Before his body figured out what to do, Renee shifted her inscrutable gaze to Andrew. They stared each other down, soundless and still, oblivious to the bewildered looks their teammates sent between them. Andrew didn't say anything, but Renee lifted her chin. Andrew hummed in response and put the knife away. He will lose his taste when he has one in his gut, he said. Neil looked at Renee again in time to see other Renee disappear. A calm mask melted away the death on her face, and Renee picked up right where she'd left off. She didn't acknowledge what had just happened or the obvious questions on Dan's face, but gently bullied her friends into rejoining the conversation. Allison and Nikki returned together. 
Allison's cheeks were dry and her eyes fierce with determination as she took her seat. Renee's smile was encouraging, and Dan grinned in approval. Allison drummed impatient fingernails on the arms of her chair and fixed Wymac with an expectant look. Who are we eliminating first? Round one, southeast versus southwest. Wymac picked up his clipboard and skimmed the top page. Odd-ranked teams play on Thursdays this year, so we've got Fridays. January 12th, we're away against University of Texas. Good news is that Austin's just outside the thousand-mile range, which means the board's going to let us fly there. The 19th, we're home for a rematch against Belmont. January 26th, we're away against Arkansas. It's two out of three to proceed to death matches. Belmont is fourth ranked, but you remember what they were like last fall. SUA is also fourth ranked. UT is second ranked, and they have been second in their region for the past five years. All three of these teams have been in spring championships before with varying results. They know what they're doing. They know what it takes to qualify. We are the weak link. That doesn't mean we're going to break. It just means we have to work twice as hard to keep up. If you're willing to do that, we have a fighting chance. He unhooked a stack of papers and waggled them at Matt. Matt got up and passed them out. Wymack had put together round one packets for them. The first page was UT's fall schedule, complete with results. Notes at the bottom detailed UT's last seven attempts at spring championships. For three years, they'd made it as far as the third round before getting knocked out. Neil flipped the page and skimmed the team roster. The next four pages followed the same pattern for Belmont and SUA. Monday will break down their playing style and depth and pin down strategies, Wymack said. By then, I'll also have copies of all their fall games burned onto discs. Watch them in your free time if you're curious. With one exception, I'm not taking time out of practices to show you more than a couple highlights. There's a week break between round one and the first set of death matches, Wymack continued. Bad news is we won't know who we're up against until February. Good news, this year the big three are all in the odds bracket. They have to face each other in the third round. For the first time in six years, one of them is getting knocked out before semifinals. Oh, damn, Dan said, startled. That's lucky. My money's on pen dropping, Nikki said. Don't. Kevin said before the others could place their bets. It doesn't matter which one is eliminated. We are nowhere near ready to face any of them. How long is Neil benched? A week, Neil said, a little resentfully. Abby won't reconsider until next Tuesday. Generous, Dan said. I'd have benched you for the entire first round. I'm fine to play, Neil said. Kevin reached behind Andrew to smack the back of Neil's head. Every awkward ounce of empathy he'd managed yesterday was gone. He returned Neil's annoyed look with a fierce glower and a scathing, I warned you once already not to lie about your health. We need you on the court, but not if you're going to drag us down with you. In the shape you're in now, you'd be a complete waste of our time. I would not, Neil said. Put me on the court and I'll prove it. Shut up, Wymax said. When you're sporting fewer than fifty stitches, I'll consider letting you on my court again. If I catch you so much as looking at your gear before then, I will bench you another week out of spite. Do you understand? But give me a yes, coach. Coach? Neil forgot the rest of his argument when Andrew pinched his wrist. A bolt of fire popped through his fingers and he snatched his hand away as fast as he could. Neil flicked Andrew an irritated look, but Andrew didn't even look at him. Neil wrapped his arm around his stomach to get his hand out of Andrew's reach and sullenly turned his attention back on Wymac. Appreciate it, I think, Wymack said. Andrew, how behind are you? I didn't see a fitness center listed with East Haven's amenities. There wasn't one, Andrew said. I improvised. Do I want to know? Wymack asked, then answered his own question. No, I don't. Unless there's an impending lawsuit I should know about. Morning practices are at the gym again. Neil, until you're back on the court, you'll be meeting me here instead. I'll put you to work watching tapes and researching UT's defense. Tomorrow afternoon we're doing semester meet and greets with Betsy. You know the routine, you can't go with someone who plays the same position. Dan will figure out the pairs and give you an allotted time during morning practice, right? On it, Dan said. Last order of official business for me is damage control, Wymax said. We've got everyone's attention. A fierce season and ample tragedies mean we're the talk of the town, and this year people might actually root for the underdog. 
The board wants us to encourage that fever with more publicity. Expect more cameras at games, more interviews, and more noisiness in general. If I could ban some of you from ever opening your mouth in public, I would, but this is out of my hands. Attempt to behave yourselves without sacrificing your confident image. Think you can do that? You're no fun, coach, Nikki said. I will be a lot less fun if you make us look like fools, Wymax said. But I'm not as worried about you as I am about our resident punching bag and his smart mouth. Anyone have any ideas on how to make Neil look a bit less like a battered wife? It's under control, Allison said, and looked to Neil. You'll come to our room after the meeting. I was going to buy my textbooks today, Neil said. I wasn't asking, Allison said. You can go when I'm done with you, unless you want to go out looking like that. We promise not to ask you about Christmas, Renee said. Either she didn't see the annoyed look Allison shot her for killing their chance at getting good gossip, or she chose not to acknowledge it. It'll only take a couple minutes, I think. Neil didn't trust Allison not to pry, but he trusted Renee to intervene on his behalf when that happened. Okay. I need to get my stuff, too, Nikki said. We can go when they're done with you. Wymack nodded and surveyed his team. Anyone got anything official to add? We're going to need a shelf or something in here to put our championship trophy on, Dan said. Can we rearrange again? Board won't sign off on a purchase like that until we've at least made it through the second death match, Wymack said. Nice try, though. Who needs the board's permission? Allison said. I'm gonna buy it, because the board is too stingy. We deserve something obscenely expensive. Matt, measure the bed of your truck. I need to know what I can fit before I start looking for the right piece. Oh, to be young and filthy rich, Nikki said. Must be nice. Allison considered her manicure with lofty boredom. It is. Nikki rolled his eyes, but didn't push it. Anything else? Wymack asked. The sound of the main door opening heralded Abby's return, and Wymack shook his head. Never mind, food's here. Stuff your faces and get out of my locker room. I'll be going over paperwork and scheduling if anyone needs me. He hopped off his perch and vanished into his office. Abby covered the coffee table with food containers and passed out paper plates. When she was done, she stayed only long enough to offer a quiet but warm welcome back to the foxes. Neil thought it odd that she wasn't sticking around to ask about anyone's vacation, but the uncomfortable look she flicked Neil and Andrew on her way to Wymack's office made him think she was sparing their feelings. It was misplaced courtesy. Andrew wasn't likely to care if his teammates had better breaks than he did, and Neil didn't begrudge them their happiness. Lunch was a quiet affair. Neil unplugged his phone on the way out, and Andrew wouldn't let him into the car until he powered it on. The team took two cars back to Fox Tower, and Neil followed the girls into their room. Allison had him sit sideways on the couch while she went through her suitcase. She brought a plastic bag with her and sat as close to him as she could. Neil watched as she unloaded makeup into the scant space between them. It would have been better if you'd come to the store with us, Allison said. It sounded like an accusation, even though they hadn't made Neil aware of their intentions. Neil wondered if he was supposed to apologize. Before he made up his mind, Allison barged on. It doesn't matter. I bought out the entire row. Something will match sooner or later. Look straight ahead and let me work. Don't speak until I ask you a question. She lifted the small packets two at a time, one to either side of his face, and checked for the closest matching tones. Some she was able to discard outright, others she set aside for a second inspection. Finally, she was left with three, and she set to work covering up the bruises lining his throat and face. Renee and Dan came around behind the couch to watch her work. Neil didn't risk Allison's ire by looking up at them, but he could almost hear Dan grinding her teeth. Why? Dan finally demanded. What did he hope to gain? Why did he do it? Dan, Renee said in quiet rebuke. We promised. You promised, Dan said. Neil would have let them fight it out, but it wasn't his decision Dan was challenging. To get to Kevin, he said, and Allison lowered her hands from his face. Neil slanted a look at Dan. Did you know Kevin's been with the Foxes a year now, but he still has a room at the Raven's Nest? Rico hasn't even thrown away his schoolwork. Interesting, isn't it? Rico threatens and dismisses Kevin at every turn, but he can't let go. He's as obsessed with Kevin as Kevin is with him. Now Kevin's starting to forget him, Neil said. When we faced the Ravens last October, Kevin cared more about us than he did about having Rico standing at his back. 
He chose us over them that day, and that's unforgivable. Rico is king. He won't be dismissed or belittled or outplayed. So he took away the people Kevin was leaning on. He wanted us to fear him and to infect Kevin with those doubts. Dan gave a rude snort. Ha! Huh, what an incompetent asshole. Thank you, Neil said. Dan looked lost, so Neil said, for not asking me if it worked. Of course it didn't work, Allison said. You're not afraid of Andrew. Why would you be afraid of Rico? He's just another loudmouthed, spoiled child with anger issues. Now eyes forward and let me work. I didn't tell you you could look away. Neil resumed a frozen position until she finished. She leaned back a bit to give him a scrutinizing once-over, then got up to grab a mirror from her desk. Neil's stomach churned as she brought it back to him. Neil took it from her outstretched hand, but let it rest glass down in his lap. Allison motioned for him to take a peek. Neil shook his head. If you say it's good, I believe you, Neil said. Not scared of Rico, but scared of your own reflection? Allison crossed her arms over her chest and treated him to a pitying look. You are one messed up child. You come by that naturally, or did your parents do that to you? Dan jumped in before Neil could react. Looks great. Anyone gets too close, they'll probably figure out you're wearing makeup, but I don't think anyone will ask. From back here, I can't even tell. You'll just have to stop by here after morning practices to get dolled up for classes until the mess fades. Do you have nine o'clock classes this semester? No, I cut it too close too often last fall. To Allison, Neil said. Thank you. I wouldn't have even thought of trying this. It seems like a useful trick. It is. I learned it to keep the paparazzi off my back when I first started playing. I haven't needed it since then, but I never forget a good fashion tip. Allison lifted one shoulder in a shrug. Take it for a test run and get your textbooks. Now, preferably. Dan is waiting to commandeer your room. It's not his room I'm interested in, Dan said. Neil set the mirror to one side and got off the couch. Leaving. Oh, and Neil? Dan said when Neil made it to the door. Neil let his hand go slack on the doorknob and looked back at her. If you want to talk about any of it or anything, or... She gestured vaguely at the side of her head, maybe meaning Neil's abrupt change in looks. You know we're here for you, right? Whatever you need. I know, Neil said. Maybe later. Text me when it's safe to come back? Maybe, maybe not. Neil shook his head and left. He pulled the door closed behind him and lingered in the hallway. He was tired and sore and not at all looking forward to his week off the court. But for a moment, none of that mattered. We're okay, he said to the empty hall. We're gonna be okay. The foxes would be okay at least, and that was more than enough. Chapter 3 Neil expected to feel jilted for being banned from the gym Thursday morning, but Wymac gave him one of UT's more interesting matches to watch. Wymac watched a different game in his office, and the two of them convened afterward to discuss players' styles. The girls picked him up from the stadium since Allison needed to work on his face again. It was faster this time now that Allison remembered what she was doing and had the colors figured out. Classes were a blur. Neil spent more time worrying that people could see through Allison's makeup than he did actually paying attention to his teachers. It was a relief when his second class let out at 1.45 and Neil could escape back to Fox Tower. Matt was missing when Neil stepped into the suite. A glance at the class schedule tacked to the front of their fridge said he wouldn't be back until it was almost time to go. Neil unloaded his backpack onto his desk. The bottom shelf of his desk still held last semester's math and Spanish books. He pried his math notes off the shelf, wiped dust off the binder, and sat down to review. Most of it was only dimly familiar, but the further he flipped, the more it started coming back. Neil had a sinking feeling he knew how he was going to spend his weekend. At a quarter to three, Neil met up with Andrew's lot for a ride to the stadium. The Foxes usually traveled to practices in two groups— Today they took three cars, since they'd be going back and forth to Redden Hall throughout afternoon practice. Andrew and Kevin had the first slots with Betsy Dobson and would head straight there, so Aaron and Nicky piled into the bed of Matt's truck with Renee. Neil didn't think he could climb that high without pulling something, but he didn't have to worry. Allison stuffed him into her pink convertible as soon as he was within grabbing distance. Neil braced himself for questions— but Allison didn't speak to him the entire ride. Neil thanked her as he got out, got a bemused look in response, 
and waited on the curb for the others to arrive. Afternoon practice was as awful as he'd expected it would be. He took the disc Wymac offered him, but stood lost in the hallway while his teammates changed out. He watched them head into the stadium for warm-ups and had to fight not to follow. Sitting down on the couch took every ounce of self-control he had, and he hoped the game would distract him. It worked only until the Foxes came back into the locker room to strap on their gear. Neil lost track of what was going on on screen and stared through the wall instead. Focus, Wymax said somewhere behind him. I am, Neil lied. They just scored an impossible goal and you didn't even twitch, Wymax said. Neil glanced back at the TV and saw the score had gone up. The crowd was going insane in the background. I should be on the court. You will be, Wymax said. Next week, when you're more healed. It won't kill you to sit out a couple days. It might kill you if you pull something and injure yourself beyond repair. I will definitely kill you if you eliminate us just because you're impatient. Look at it like this if you have to. Your teammates are playing catch-up right now. You got two weeks of practice in over the holidays while they were goofing off and stuffing their faces. You're ahead of the curve. Kevin practiced, Neil said. Matt said he was at the neighborhood court every day. That's one out of eight. They can afford to take time off. They're all better than I am, and they have subs. They're more experienced, and they have different strengths than you do, Wymax said. But you're a hundred times better now than you were in May. Don't sell yourself short. Now focus. I'm going to need some good notes when you leave today. Neil picked up his pencil again in silent acquiescence, and Wymack left. He was halfway through the second game before it was time to head to Redden. This time he was going third and was paired off with Aaron. Neil drove, and somehow he resisted asking how long it had been since anyone let Aaron ride passenger. There was nothing yet to gain from antagonizing Aaron. It was too early for most of the student body to start taking up space at the medical center, so Neil found a parking spot close to the door. They bypassed the general check-in and went down the hall to the counselor's quarters. Before Neil could ask which one of them was up first, Aaron continued to Betsy's office just out of sight. Neil sank onto one of the thick chairs to wait. He didn't want to think about the session, but didn't want to think about the foxes practicing without him, so he went through his messages instead. Most were from Nicky, idle comments about things he saw in New York, questions about Millport, and scattered demands that Neil stop ignoring him. At least four messages consisted only of exclamation points. Renee sent greetings twice and Allison once in a group text on Christmas Day. Kevin messaged Neil only once on the day Neil went to Evermore. Neil had missed it by only a few minutes. It was time-stamped for Neil's boarding time. Neil read the eight-word message four times. Jean will help you if you help him. Neil had sorely disliked Jean the first several days, and Kevin's message wouldn't have done him any good then, but he understood in retrospect. Jean was privy to the ugly truth about the Moriyamas, as he'd been sold to Tetsuji years ago to settle a debt with the head of the family. Jean hated his lot in life, but he was past the point where he could even think of fighting back. He wasn't a rebel. He was a survivor. He did whatever it took to get through the day. Oftentimes that meant looking after Neil. Jean stood unflinching guard while Rico tore Neil apart, again and again, but he was always there to pull Neil back to his feet afterward. They were each other's partners on the Raven Court, which meant their successes and failures directly impacted each other. Jean was a questionable ally at best, but he was the only Raven who'd looked out for Neil. It was selfishness, not kindness, but it had been just enough to keep Neil alive. Neil had survived and made it out of there. Kevin had escaped when his life crashed down around him. Jean was still there, keeping it together as best he could. Neil wondered what it cost him to watch them both leave, if he thought them fools for defying the master, or if a quiet part of him was jealous that they had a way out. Neil wondered if he cared. It was safer and smarter not to. If Jean wasn't willing to fight back, if he had nothing to fight for, there was nothing anyone could do for him. A stray memory tugged at his thoughts, just out of reach. Neil tried to focus on it, but thinking about Jean had his mind spiraling back to Rico's abuse. Neil brushed it all aside and skipped through the rest of his messages. Dan and Matt had checked in several times. 
Aaron's single message was the last one anyone sent to Neil before the exchange of New Year's greetings. Don't tell Andrew about Caitlin, it said. Caitlin and Aaron had sneaked around most of fall semester, avoiding each other at games and meeting up at the library between classes. Once Andrew was committed, Caitlin had become a permanent fixture in their lives, having dinner with Aaron several nights a week and dropping by the dorm occasionally. It was strange thinking they were reverting to secrecy, and Neil idly wondered how Caitlin had reacted to the decision. Maybe Aaron told her how much Andrew disliked her. She might not be happy, but at least she was alive and safe. The click of a door distracted him from his thoughts. Neil glanced at the time and closed his messages. Reluctance, more than pain, made him slow to get to his feet when Aaron returned. Betsy followed Aaron to the entryway and greeted Neil with a warm smile. Hello, Neil. He followed her down the hall to her office and went past her to enter it first. The room looked the same as it had in August, from the perfectly angled cushions on her couch to the crystal figurines lining her shelves. He sat on the couch and watched as Betsy closed the door behind her. She took a moment to mix some hot cocoa and looked over at him. I have some hot tea, if you would like. I remember you saying you don't like sweets. I'm fine. Betsy sat opposite him. It's been a while. How have you been doing? The Fox has made spring championships, Andrew is back and sober, and I'm still starting striker, Neil said. I don't have any complaints yet. Congratulations on qualifying, by the way, Betsy said. I confess I don't understand much about sports, but you have very talented players on your team, and your comeback last year was nothing short of brilliant. I think you're going to have an amazing run. Texas is a little far for me to travel, but I'll cheer you on for the home game against Belmont. Are you ready? No, Neil said, but we'll get there. We don't have a choice. Last month we said we weren't going to lose a single spring game. We haven't changed our minds, but I think now that January's here we're realizing what we're up against and what it'll take to pull this off. We're going to face the best in the country, and we're only recent contenders. That's a mature way to look at it. It is also... Betsy spread her hands a bit as she searched for words. Very practiced. It sounds more like a soundbite you would give to a reporter than something you might admit to me. I hoped we might progress past such guarded statements. Remember that I am not here to cast judgment on anything you say. I remember, Neil said, and left it at that. Betsy inclined her head and moved on. You mentioned Andrew's return as a positive thing. I know you supported my decision to commit him last November— it is probably too soon to tell, but how are you handling the reality of his sobriety? Any concerns? I'm not going to talk about Andrew with you. I'm trying to talk about you, Betsy said. This session is about you. This isn't a real session, Neil said. It's an informal meeting, and I'm only here because Coach said we had to come see you once a semester. Neither of us benefits. You're wasting time on me that would be better spent with your actual patients, and I'm missing out on practice. I don't consider this to be a waste of time, but I apologize that it's cutting into your time on the court. She gave him a couple moments to answer, then said, Happy New Year, by the way. I forgot to say it. How were your holidays? There was the question he'd expected and dreaded. He didn't know what his teammates had told her. He wouldn't tell her the truth, but if he lied about it and they'd already told her, she'd start questioning everything else he'd said to this point. Neil juggled the possible consequences and decided to go for it. He was only required to see Betsy once a semester, after all. This was the last time he'd have to sit down with her face to face. She could think what she liked of him. They were fine, Neil said. Does it ever snow in Arizona? Now and then. They consider an inch and a half to be a major snowstorm. Oh, my, Betsy said. I remember when we had a dusting a few years back. I passed a young woman on my way across campus. She was on her phone. She'd called someone just to tell them it was snowing here. She was so excited over such a paltry amount, I wondered if she'd ever seen it before. I wanted to ask her where she was from, but it seemed intrusive. There wasn't a question there, so Neil said nothing. Betsy said nothing either, but sipped at her cocoa. Neil resisted the urge to look at the clock. He didn't want to know how little time had passed. Won't you talk to me? Betsy finally prompted. What do you want me to say? Neil said. Anything, Betsy said. This is your time. Anything? Neil said. When she gave him an encouraging nod, Neil proceeded to tell her about the UT games he'd been watching. 
It was completely impersonal and definitely not at all what she'd been hoping for. But she didn't interrupt and didn't have the good grace to look bored. She drank her cocoa and listened like it was the most important story she'd heard all day. Somehow it made Neil like her even less, but he didn't stop. Finally, he was free to go. He cleared out of there, collected Aaron from the waiting room, and headed to the car. They were halfway to the stadium before Aaron spoke up. I didn't tell her. They were the only two in the car, but it took Neil a moment to realize he was being addressed. He glanced over at Aaron, but Aaron was gazing out the passenger window. Neither did I, Neil said. She asked you about Andrew. It wasn't a question, but Neil said, Yes, you too? She doesn't ask me anything anymore, Aaron said. She knows there's no point. I haven't ever said a word to her. Neil imagined sitting in stony silence while Betsy chattered away about this and that. It was at once inspiring and unsettling. He didn't know if he could stomach a half hour of that. I wish I'd thought of that. I gave her a rundown of UT's merits instead. Predictable, Aaron said. Neil wondered how Andrew killed time. While on his medication, he'd been forced to have weekly sessions with Betsy. Neil didn't know if that would continue. He was more interested in how Andrew's view of Betsy was going to change. Andrew seemed oddly tolerant of her last year, to the point he'd admitted to getting texts from her outside of their sessions. Euphoric drugs probably made anyone easier to tolerate, though. Neil stole the same parking spot he'd found the car in. He went back to his spot on the couch, and Aaron continued to the locker room to get back into his court gear. Neil tried not to resent his good health and almost succeeded. The UT match was a good distraction from unwarranted irritation, but Neil lost track of the game when Renee and Allison passed through a couple minutes later. Neil watched their progress across the room, thought twice about it, then paused the game. Renee? They both stopped, but Allison didn't stick around for long. When she left, Renee came and sat with Neil, close enough to offer silent comfort, but far enough Neil could breathe. What did I say yesterday? Neil asked her. Why did you react like that? It didn't take her long to remember. About the knives, you mean? When Neil nodded, she turned her hands over and considered her palms. Do you remember I told you I used to be in a gang? There was a man there who went out of his way to hurt me. He liked knives and kept a half dozen on him at all times. I couldn't defend myself by normal means, so I learned to fight with knives, too. I practiced for a year before I finally bested him. Bested? Renee contemplated the word choice for a few moments before saying, He didn't survive the fight. Boss helped stage the bodies so we could pin it on a rival gang, and I was promoted. I kept the knives through my trial and my adoption. I wanted to remember what darkness I'm capable of, and what darkness I'm capable of surviving. You did what you had to do, Neil said. If he lived, he would have come back for you. I know, Renee said, soft. There were other girls before I caught his eye, there would be girls after I left. But I didn't do it for the greater good. I did it because he wronged me personally, and I didn't want to be afraid of him anymore. I regret what it did to me, more than I regret the necessity of his death. I felt no horror when I watched him die. I was proud of what I'd done to him. I told Andrew what I did, Renee said. The next day, while I was at class, he broke into my room and took my knives. When I asked for them back, he said I was lying to myself. If I wanted to remember, I wouldn't hide the knives in my closet like a shameful secret I couldn't revisit or let go of. They weren't doing me any good, so he said he would carry them until I needed them again. I let him have them because I trusted him not to use them, Renee said. I thought he understood what they were supposed to be. Not weapons anymore, but a symbol of what we've overcome. I didn't ask him for his reasons. I knew he would tell me if he wanted me to know. The obvious answer was Drake, but it didn't add up quite right. Neil turned it over in his head, working his way through it, and thought about the scars on Andrew's forearms. Who had Andrew survived? Drake? Or himself? Neil wasn't going to share that idea with Rene, so he said, So those knives he brings everywhere are yours? We're mine, Rene said. He was right. I don't need them anymore. If you need them, he will give them to you and I will teach you how to use them. She wasn't smiling anymore. Neil studied her calm expression and knew she meant it. She'd put her faith in mankind and her Christian piety on hold and show him how to cut a man open throat to groin if he asked her to. 
Neil was starting to understand why Andrew liked her. She was crazy enough to be interesting. Thank you, Neil said. But no, I don't want to be like... him. He didn't say he'd used knives before. One couldn't grow up a Wesninsky without having a blade pushed into his hand. Nathan didn't have the time or patience to teach his son, but he'd put two of his people to the task. Luckily, Neil left home before he progressed past cutting up hunks of dead animals. Of course, Renee agreed. She waited a moment to see if anything else was forthcoming, then got to her feet. I shouldn't keep Allison waiting, but if you want to talk more later, you know where to find me. Okay, Neil said. Renee made it as far as the door before Neil had to ask, How is Andrew doing? Without his drugs, I mean. Renee looked back at him and smiled. Go see. I don't think Coach will mind. Neil stayed where he was until the door closed behind her. He looked from his notepad to the paused game, then set his things aside and got to his feet. The sound of a ball popping off the wall greeted him as he stepped through the back door, and he followed the path to the inner court. Wymack was standing near the home bench, watching his players scrimmage and taking notes. He had his back to Neil, and the noise filtering through the court vents helped hide the soft pad of Neil's footsteps. Neil hung back a safe distance and watched his teammates. They looked so small when they were down three players, but they played with the ferocity of a larger team. Dan and Kevin were paired up on offense against the three backliners, and despite being outnumbered, they put up a tireless fight. Kevin even managed to outstep both Nicky and Aaron a couple times for shots on goal. Andrew deflected all of them, but it took a couple shots before Neil realized what he was doing. Instead of clearing the balls back down the court like usual, he was firing them back at Kevin. More specifically, right at Kevin's feet. Kevin had to execute some pretty nimble footwork to avoid tripping over the ball. Andrew did the same to Dan when she finally bowled past Matt for a shot of her own. She sidestepped it, but barely, and Matt had to catch her when she stumbled. Wymax swore and turned to put his things down. As he twisted, he spotted Neil, and he hesitated with his clipboard halfway to the bench. Neil expected a marching order back to the locker room. Instead, Wymax snapped his fingers at Neil and jerked his thumb toward the court door. Tell your pet psycho to knock it off before he cripples someone. I don't think he'll listen to me, Neil said. You and I both know he will. Now get! Wymack pounded on the wall, calling a pause to the scrimmage as Neil headed for the door. Neil let himself onto the court and headed for the goal. Andrew slung his racket across his shoulders at Neil's approach. Neil knew better than to call Andrew out with an audience, so he stopped as close to Andrew as he could and kept his voice down. Coach wants to know what you have against the offense line. Andrew slid a look past Neil to the court wall. He can ask me himself. Or you can answer me since I'm already here, Neil said. There are only nine of us left. If we lose anyone else, we're out of spring championships. You know that. Neil waited a beat, but of course that wasn't enough to get a reaction. Andrew looked bored of this conversation already. Neil put a hand up in front of Andrew's face, neatly blocking his view of Wymack, and waited until Andrew looked at him again. I want us to get to finals. I want us to be the ones who finally bring the Ravens down. After everything Rico's done to us, don't you want that too? You say once so freely, Andrew said, when I have told you a thousand times before. I want nothing. Probably because you're spending all your energy on not wanting anything, Neil shot back. But if you can't grasp that simple concept, I'll put this in terms you do understand. This is a game we can't afford to lose. This is how we get to Rico. This is the only thing we can take from him that will actually hurt. Let's rip his rank out of his fingers and show him he had a reason to fear us all along. Do your teammates still think you're the quiet one? Andrew asked. Our teammates, Neil said with emphasis, want this as much as I do. Stop cutting them off at the knees before they have the chance to try. I don't believe in giving people chances. I didn't until I came here, Neil said. I took a chance on you when I decided to stay. You took a chance on me when you trusted me with Kevin. Is it really that hard to support them when they've been with you every step of the way? What will you give me in exchange for my cooperation? Andrew asked. Because revenge isn't good enough? Neil asked. What would it take? Andrew didn't have to think about it. Show me your scars. It was not what Neil was expecting, which was probably why Andrew asked for it. Neil opened his mouth to protest, but the words died in his throat. Wymack and Abby had already seen them, and the foxes knew they were there. 
He'd put Andrew's hand to his ruined skin back in November to earn Andrew's trust. Neil had promised Andrew the missing parts of his truth if they survived the year. He hadn't thought Andrew would settle for a visual. When? he said at last. We're going to Columbia tomorrow, Andrew said. Now walk away and tell Coach to mind his pay grade. I will not let him get away with this a second time. Neil didn't understand, but he nodded and left. The Foxes waited until the door was shut and locked before resuming play. The next time Kevin managed a shot on goal, Andrew cleared it all the way down the court. Neil had the feeling the Foxes would regret his intervention soon enough. This was definitely safer, but now Dan and Kevin had to chase the ball every time Andrew deflected it. Neil went back to Wymack's side and relayed Andrew's message. He expected Wymack to brush off Andrew's threat without batting an eye. He wasn't expecting Wymack's amused huff and dry, Just promise me this isn't going to be a problem. What? Neil asked. I can't tell if you're being obtuse to fuck with me, or if you're really that dumb, Wymack said. When Neil just stared blankly at him, Wymack rubbed his temples as if warding off a headache. I would pity you, but Andrew's right. I don't get paid enough to get involved in this. Figure it out yourself, on your own time. You're supposed to be studying UT right now. Wymack plucked up his clipboard and started scribbling notes. Neil looked from him to the court. Goodbye, Wymack said. Neil swallowed his questions and headed back to the locker room. The upperclassmen went out to dinner Friday after practice, but they swung by the dorms first to change into fresh clothes. Andrew showed up at Neil's room almost as soon as Matt had left, and he brought a bag of clothes with him. Neil still didn't understand why the cousins insisted he wear something new every time they went to Columbia, but he was past the point where he'd question it. He carried the bag into his bedroom to change. When he turned to close the door, Andrew was right behind him. Andrew said nothing but gestured to Neil's shirt. Neil hesitated, then set the bag on Matt's bed and struggled out of his shirt. It was getting a little easier every day, but it hurt when he raised his arms too high and when he twisted he felt the pull at his stitches. He got his shirt over his head and to his elbows before Andrew got tired of watching him struggle and tugged the shirt loose. Andrew tossed it off to one side and didn't look to see where it landed. He was more interested in the scars and bruises covering Neil's front. Andrew reached for the bandages on Neil's wrists, and Neil let him rip tape and gauze off. The scabs looked worse today than they had when he first landed in South Carolina. Abby was right. He needed to let his wounds air. Neil dragged his stare up from the ugly lines striped across his wrists to Andrew's face. Neil wasn't sure what he was looking for. A hint of Wednesday's violence or last semester's callous, cheerful dismissals. He got neither. Andrew looked a thousand years from all of this, detached and unconcerned. On Neil's right shoulder was a burn scar, courtesy of getting smacked by a hot iron. Andrew put his left hand to it, fingertips lining up perfectly with the raised bumps the iron's holes had left behind. His right thumb found the puckered flesh from a bullet. Neil had slept in his bulletproof vest for almost a month after that close call, too scared to take it off. His mother had to bully him into shedding it long enough to wash up. Someone shot you? Andrew said. I told you someone was after me, Neil said. This, Andrew dug his fingers harder into the iron mark, is not from a life on the run. My father gave me that. People came by asking questions about his work. I didn't say anything, but I didn't sit still enough either. He hit me as soon as the door closed behind them. That's why I gave you Abram. Neil said. I don't want to give you my father's name because I don't want anyone to call me it ever again. I hated him. Andrew was quiet a long time, then dropped his hand to the slashes across Neil's gut. Renee said you refused our knives. A murder magnet like you shouldn't walk around unarmed. I'm not, Neil said. I thought you were going to watch my back this year. Andrew glanced up at him again, expression unreadable. He said nothing, so Neil pressed on with... You're not actually a sociopath, are you? I never said I was. You let them say it about you, Neil said. You could have corrected them. Andrew waved that off. What people want to think of me is not my problem. Does Coach know? Of course he does. Then your medicine? Neil asked. Were those pills really antipsychotics? You ask a lot of questions, Andrew said, and left Neil alone to get dressed. 
Neil found Andrew's lot in the hallway when he was done. Nikki gave a toothy grin of approval at how the new clothes fit. Aaron didn't so much as look at Neil. Kevin checked Neil's face for smudges in the makeup but said nothing. Andrew only waited long enough to hear the lock slide into place and started for the stairs. He had two cigarettes lit before he reached the second floor landing, and one he passed over his shoulder to Neil. Neil held on to it until they reached the car. Nicky sent him an odd look as he opened the back door. You don't smoke? No, Neil agreed, and rubbed the cherry out on the bottom of his shoe. He pocketed the other half of the cigarette for later. He got in the passenger seat before Nicky could ask anything else, and tugged his buckle into place. The others weren't long in piling into the car, and Andrew had them on the road as soon as the last door was shut. Neil would have been happy to never step foot in Columbia again after what happened in November, but the others seemed unmoved. They pulled into the parking lot at Sweetie's like nothing bad had ever happened in this city and took the first booth available. Nicky rambled at length about his classes, but Neil couldn't focus on his words. He let them go in one ear and out the other and ate his ice cream in silence. Eden's twilight was as busy as usual. One bouncer sat on a stool checking IDs while the other guarded the doorway. The former actually hopped to his feet at the side of Andrew's car at the curb. Neil hung back as Nicky and Aaron endured vigorous handshakes and backslaps. One of the bouncers said something to Aaron, voice low but expression intense. Neil assumed it was a promise of support in the upcoming trial, judging by Aaron's grateful nod. He looked back at Andrew, who was waiting in the driver's seat for a VIP parking pass, but Andrew was watching oncoming traffic instead of the spectacle at the door. Finally, Nicky got a pass from one of the bouncers and brought it back. Andrew drove off while the others headed inside. Neil followed Kevin through the door, pushing past overheated bodies and wincing a little at the bass crashing from the speakers. There weren't any tables open, so they ended up against the bar counter. It took no time at all for Roland to spot them, and he almost dropped his cocktail shaker. As soon as he finished his orders, he made a beeline for them. I'll be damned, he said. I was starting to think I wouldn't see you again. As if we could stay away forever, Nicky said. It just wouldn't have been the same without Andrew. Andrew's out then? Roland asked with obvious relief. It killed us when we heard the news. I wish we could have done something, anything. You, he said, looking to Aaron, are a hero. We've got your back here, understand? They try to make any of these bullshit charges stick and we'll march on the court. That guy got what he deserved and everyone knows it. Thank you, Aaron said. Roland poured a round of shots. He'd seen Neil maybe a dozen times before and knew Neil didn't drink, but he put a shot halfway between himself and Neil in case Neil was feeling celebratory. Neil left it where it was and watched them drink. Roland had a second round ready to go by the time Andrew caught up with them. Andrew slid neatly into the narrow gap between Kevin and Neil. Welcome back to the land of the free, Roland said. I'd say and the sober, but I know it won't last long. Cheers. They downed their shots with ease. Roland started setting up their usual tray. He was half done before a table finally opened up. Neil stayed behind with Andrew while the others went to claim it. Andrew drank Neil's shot when he saw it sitting there, Roland paused between drinks to refill it. This time, he slid it a little closer to Neil. Let loose a bit. It's a special occasion, Roland said. It's the end of seven weeks' hard work, Neil said. Andrew didn't waste his breath arguing. He drank Neil's second shot, and Roland didn't try to pour Neil a third. When Roland was done mixing drinks, Neil cleared a path for Andrew to carry the tray. The others tore in, but Andrew went through his portion of the drink slower than Neil had ever seen him, Neil assumed his tolerance was in the gutter after two months dry. He told Neil last year he always knew what his limits were. It made Neil wonder if Aaron and Nicky had ever seen Andrew drunk. Somehow, he doubted it. They knocked back cracker dust as a group and Aaron and Nicky vanished. Kevin kept making inroads into the drinks. Andrew watched the crowd and sipped his drink at a snail's pace. Neil didn't know what to say to either of them, so he made himself busy. He traded the remaining full glasses on the tray for the empty ones littering the table and headed to the bar. Roland took it from him as soon as he was able. Neil folded his arms on the bar counter and watched Roland mix the next batch. So Andrew finally gave in, huh? Roland said. That looks pretty bad. Neil almost reached for his face, but Roland was looking at his wrists. 
Neil's new shirt was long-sleeved, but it was made of a thin material meant to breathe easy in a packed club. The ends had slid up his forearms a bit when he folded his arms. He tugged the hems back down, knowing it was too late to hide the half-heeled lacerations. As he did so, he realized that rumble in Roland's words was all checked laughter. Roland gave an apologetic grin when Neil frowned up at him. I'd wondered if being clean would cure that hands-off rule of his. Makes sense it wouldn't, now that we know about... Roland shook his head and visibly forced his anger back. I don't know whether to say thanks for easing my curiosity or sorry that sobriety has obviously exacerbated the problem. Just so you know, they make padded cuffs. You should look into them. The problem, Neil echoed, lost. What hands-off rule? Roland looked startled, then confused. You don't know? But then... I got these in a fight, Neil said. Why would Andrew do this to me? Ah, uh, you don't know, Roland said again. Not a question anymore, but a backpedal out of the conversation. You know what? Let's just forget I said anything. No, really, he said when Neil opened his mouth to argue. Hey, here. Your drinks are done. I've got to check on the rest of my customers. He vanished before Neil could get more than a what out. Neil stared after him, but there were no answers here. He took the tray with unsteady hands and brought it back to the table. He wanted to send Kevin away, but Andrew would never let him get far without a guard. Luckily, Kevin couldn't speak a word of German. Neil sat sideways in his chair facing Andrew and said, Why does Roland think you're tying me down? Andrew hesitated with his glass halfway to his mouth. He glanced down at Neil's hands where they were clenched on the edge of the seat between his knees. Neil didn't look to see if the angry lines were showing again. He couldn't take his eyes off Andrew's face. At length, Andrew put his full shot back on the tray. He didn't let go of it completely, but tapped his fingers on the rim in an uneven beat. It seemed an eternity before he finally dragged his stare up from Neil's hands to his face. Presumably, he thinks you're as bad at following directions as he is, Andrew said. Roland knows I don't like being touched. That doesn't answer my question. It is the answer, Andrew said. Rephrase the question if you don't like it. I want to play another round, Neil said. What's outside coach's pay grade? Andrew shifted in his seat to face Neil and propped his elbow on the back of his chair. He cradled his face in his hand and considered Neil. He didn't look at all bothered by the sudden interrogation, but that calm did nothing to ease the gnawing in Neil's stomach. When coach signed us, he promised to stay out of our personal problems. He said the board paid him to be our coach, nothing more and nothing less. That answer wasn't much better. Neil wasn't sure he should keep pushing, but if he didn't get the truth now, he knew he never would. I didn't think it was a personal problem. You hate me, remember? Every inch of you, Andrew said. That doesn't mean I wouldn't blow you. The world tilted a little bit sideways. Neil dug his shoes harder into the floor so he wouldn't fall over. You like me? I hate you. Andrew corrected him, but Neil barely heard him. For a dizzying moment, he understood. He remembered Andrew's hand over his mouth in excites as he backed out of their conversation. He thought of Andrew yielding to his prodding and holding him up when Neil needed him most. Andrew had called him interesting and dangerous and had given him keys to his house and car. He'd trusted Neil with Kevin because Kevin was important to both of them, and he knew Neil wouldn't let him down. Neil tried to piece it all together, but the more he pushed, the faster it fell apart. It didn't make sense. He didn't know what he was supposed to think. It could be a lie, but Neil knew it wasn't. Andrew was a lot of unpleasant things, but a pathological liar wasn't one of them. Honesty suited Andrew because he was an instigator at heart, and his opinions were often unpopular. It took Neil three tries to find his voice. You never said anything. Why should I have? Andrew lifted one shoulder in a shrug. Nothing will come of it. Nothing, Neil echoed. I am self-destructed, not stupid, Andrew said. I know better. There was nothing Neil could say except, okay, but it didn't sound okay and he didn't feel okay. What was Neil supposed to do with a truth like this? He was going to be dead in four months, five if he was lucky. He wasn't supposed to be this for anyone, Andrew least of all. Andrew said all year long, had said it to Neil's face just this week, that he didn't want anything. Neil shouldn't be the exception to that rule. Andrew downed his shot and dropped the glass carelessly back on the tray. 
He pried his cigarette pack out of his back pocket on his way to his feet and flicked it open to check the contents. Neil should let him leave unchallenged, but he said, It's your turn. Andrew shook a stick into his hand and propped it between his lips. The pack was safely tucked away again before he looked at Neil. I do not have to take it now. Neil stared after him long after he'd disappeared into the crowd. He didn't realize Kevin was saying his name until Kevin finally pushed his shoulder to get his attention. Neil jumped like he'd been shot and jerked his attention to Kevin. Whatever Kevin saw on Neil's face, it was enough to kill his curiosity. Kevin slowly closed his mouth, withdrew his hand, and went back to drinking. It was an hour before Andrew made it back to them. He didn't say another word to them that night, and Neil was happy to give him his space. Aaron and Nicky eventually returned, drunk and exhausted, and they left together. The cousin's house wasn't far, but there weren't enough beds for all five of them. Kevin took the couch, so Neil curled up in a chair with a spare blanket. It was hours before he could stop thinking long enough to sleep. Chapter 4 On Monday, Kevin started up night practices again, but he refused to take Neil along. On Tuesday afternoon, Abby reluctantly gave Neil her blessing to return to the court, so long as he didn't get too rough in the scrimmages. Neil barely stuck around long enough to hear the okay before going for his gear. The foxes were already on the court, since Abby had shown up almost two hours late to practice, but Dan called a halt to drills as soon as Neil thumped on the door. She and Matt greeted Neil's arrival on court with triumphant whoops. Nicky clacked sticks with him on his way to Kevin's side. If you can't play, don't, Kevin said. I know, Neil said. If anything pulls, I'll step off the court. Kevin gave him a suspicious look, but didn't argue. It did hurt, almost immediately, but it was almost a relief to work out his sore muscles. Neil kept an easy pace because Abby and Wymack were watching him from the sidelines. When he had to finally stop and stretch, he feared they'd pull him. They didn't, so he went back to the game with a vengeance. Afterward, Wymack sat them all down in the locker room to go over the day's high and low points. When he was done, he looked at Neil and said, Well... I'm fine, Neil said. He leaned a little away from Kevin's death glare and said, If I wasn't sore right now, I'd be worried, but it's not enough to be a problem. I can pass off the wall if overhand shots start pulling too hard on my stitches. Was that really so difficult to say the first time around? Dan asked Riley. I did say it the first time around, Neil said. I'm fine. The word you're looking for is hopeless or obsessed, Nikki said, grinning. All right. Wymack said. Neil, you're at the gym tomorrow. Go easy for a few days, would you? Adapt the circuit as needed and let me know what doesn't work. Injure yourself here, not there. Wymack had to notice the dirty look Abby shot him, but he didn't acknowledge it. That's it for today, then. Pack up and move out. They washed up and headed back to the dorm. Dan came with Matt and Neil to their room. Neil took it as a hint to make himself scarce, but Dan beckoned to him when he turned to leave again. When she knew he understood, she sat on the couch and hugged her knee to her chest. So it's back to life as usual, Dan said. Us and them, I mean. It was fun last month, wasn't it? I liked our team dinners and nights out. Feels like we're right back where we started in August, Matt agreed. If we knew what Andrew had against us, we could try to fight it, Dan said. She drummed an agitated rhythm on her knee for a minute, then looked at Neil. How'd you get him to stop tripping us up at practice the other day? Neil whittled it down to the barest, easiest truth. I asked. You asked, Matt said. It almost sounded like an accusation. You said that about Halloween and Nikki's parents. Seriously, Neil. How do you keep talking him into doing things he obviously doesn't want to do? Is it bribery or blackmail? Dan flicked Matt an indecipherable look and said, No pressure, Neil. No bullshit. Andrew's sober now, and I know that's a game-changer. But can you bring them back to us? I don't know, Neil admitted. I can try, but... He continued with a glance between them. Someone needs to work on Aaron. Nikki wants to be your friend, and Kevin knows the team is stronger as a whole, but Aaron's almost as dead set against us as Andrew is. That doesn't make sense, because siding with Andrew means hiding Caitlin. If Aaron's willing to do that without a fight, this isn't just Andrew's decision. It goes back to the two of them. Dan looked thoughtful. 
Caitlin has to know something. No self-respecting girl would put up with this unless there was a really good reason. If she won't talk, you think you can wrestle something out of Aaron, Matt? You said he's been better since Christmas, right? It's worth his shot, Matt said. Coach give you our tutor schedule yet? It's somewhere on my desk, Dan said. As soon as I unearth it, I'll text his hours to you. All right. I'll see if I can't hunt him down there. Let me try Caitlin first, Dan said. She shifted to pull her phone out of her pocket and tapped a quick message out. I don't want Aaron telling her we're getting nosy. Matt nodded, but Dan was watching her phone like she could will a response from it. It didn't take long before it jingled. Dan went back and forth with Caitlin a couple times, then got to her feet. All right, I'm going out for a bit. Might be a while, so eat without me. Wish me luck? Luck, Neil said as Matt kissed her goodbye. Neil and Matt ended up eating dinner with Renee and Allison in the girls' room. Allison's choice of movie was instantly vetoed, so Allison threw democracy out the window and put it in anyway. It was probably the worst thing Neil had ever watched, but at least it helped kill time. He was spared the last fifteen minutes of melodrama and limp acting because Kevin was ready to head to the court. They met Andrew at the car. Andrew sprawled on the couch in the lounge while Kevin went ahead to change out. Neil hesitated, changed his mind and started after Kevin, and changed his mind again. He stood behind the couch, folding his arms across the back of it, and peered down at Andrew. Andrew had one arm folded under his head and the other draped over his eyes to block the light. One of these days you might as well practice with us, Neil said. He wasn't surprised when Andrew didn't answer, but he refused to give up that easily. Why'd you even start playing if you weren't willing to practice? It was a bigger cage than the alternative. That was one of the things reporters had liked harping about most when Kevin became a permanent fixture at Andrew's side. Kevin was raised at Evermore, surrounded by the best and practically born with a racket in his hand whereas Andrew learned Exy while he was locked up in juvie. Neil had a page-long article about it in his notebook. It was crassly titled The Prince and the Pauper, and its focus was on how doomed their friendship was. The writer thought their attitudes toward Exy too incompatible and their backgrounds too different for them to stay together long. Neil assumed Officer Higgins was the reason Andrew landed in one of the best juvenile facilities in California— it focused on rehabilitation through discipline and empowerment, which meant all of the inmates learned team sports. There wasn't enough room for a full-sized court, but an officer confirmed in an interview they had a half-court on the facility grounds. The best and best behaved of the would-be XE athletes went on occasional field trips to the community center and competed with neighborhood teams. Neil didn't blame Andrew for thinking the court was a better place to be than a cell, but he doubted Exy was the only sport the facility offered. Andrew chose Exy for a reason. Neil would assume the aggressive nature of the game appealed to him, but Andrew was a goalkeeper. He got very few opportunities to indulge in mindless violence. He said as much to Andrew and got a faint shrug in response. The warden assigned it to me, Andrew said. I couldn't play otherwise. They thought you'd hurt someone if you were loose on the court, Neil asked. Andrew didn't answer. Neil took his silence as confirmation. He tried imagining Andrew in any other position, but couldn't see it. I think it's better this way with you as the last line of defense. You let us run ourselves into the ground and clean up behind us. You play the game like you play life. That's why you're so good at it. Neil looked up when a door opened down the hall. Kevin came in search of him, already changed into his gear and looking annoyed by the delay. He stopped short when he realized they were talking. Kevin hadn't asked Neil yet what happened on Friday. Neil didn't know if he'd asked Andrew, but he doubted Andrew would explain. According to Renee, only she and Neil knew Andrew was gay. Neil had no idea how Wymac picked up on it. I'm coming, Neil said, but he didn't straighten. Kevin held up a finger in a one-minute warning and left. Neil listened for the back door to close before looking at Andrew again. I'm not a striker by choice either he said. I was a backliner in Little Leagues. Rico remembers because I scrimmaged with him and Kevin. He made me play defense with his Ravens over Christmas. That finally got Andrew to lower his arm. Little Leagues, he says. I distinctly remember you telling people you learned to play in Millport. Partial truth, Neil said. I knew how to play Exy. I just didn't know how to play offense.
I didn't want to be a striker, but Coach Hernandez didn't have any room on his defense line. It was striker or nothing, and I wanted to play too badly to walk away. Now I can't imagine playing anything else. Andrew said nothing for a while, then... You're more a raccoon than a fox. Neil stared. What? A raccoon, Andrew said and mimed holding a ball in front of his face. Exy is the shiny object of your sad little world. You know you're being hunted, and you know the hounds are closing in. But you won't let go to save yourself. You once told me you don't understand why a person would actively try to die, but here you are. I guess that was another lie. I'm not trying to die, Neil said. This is how I stay alive. When I'm playing, I feel like I have control over something. I feel like I have the power to change things. I feel more real out there than I do anywhere else. The court doesn't care what my name is or where I'm from or where I'll be tomorrow. It lets me exist as I am. It's a court, Andrew said. It does not let you do anything. You know what I mean. I don't, because you don't have anything, do you? Neil said in quiet challenge. Nothing gets to you like that. Nothing gets under your skin. He catches on at last, Andrew mused. It only took him a year. What are you afraid of? Heights. Andrew. If you make Kevin come looking for you, you will regret it. Neil pushed away from the couch without another word and went to get changed. He tugged on his gear with more force than was strictly necessary, but he was still humming with annoyance when he stepped onto the court. Getting scolded for tardiness didn't help his mood any. Neil almost reminded Kevin that they didn't have a mandatory schedule for their extra sessions, but there was no point. They were here because they had work to do. He went through the drills as hard and fast as he could, knowing he'd regret it in the morning. He didn't care. It was harder to think when everything hurt. Exhaustion finally killed the last of his annoyance, and he wasn't feeling much of anything by the time they left the court. The lethargic peace lasted up until Neil left the shower, and found Kevin sitting on a bench in the changing room. The stern look on his face said he wasn't waiting out of courtesy. Did you fix it? Kevin asked. Fix what? Neil asked. Don't act like an imbecile. If you're here, I expect you to be here, he said, with emphasis on the last word. The second your problems with Andrew interfere with our game, they become our problems. Do you want us to win or don't you? Don't lecture me like I don't know what's at stake. You told me to focus on the team, Kevin said. That's what I'm doing, ensuring you don't jeopardize its success. I wasn't jeopardizing anything. I was two minutes late because I asked Andrew to come practice with us. You were five, and don't ask him again. We do not need him there as a favor to us. He has to come of his own free will or it doesn't mean anything. Kevin got up and motioned sharply for Neil to follow. We're leaving. They collected Andrew from the lounge on their way out and split up in the hallway. Matt was already asleep, but he'd left his desk lamp on so Neil could find his way around. Neil changed out in its dim light. When he went to turn the lamp off on his way to bed, he found a scribbled note taped to the light switch. You were right, it said. Neil put the note in his desk drawer and went to bed. There was no point wondering about it when they'd be awake in five hours, so he pushed his thoughts aside and willed himself to sleep. It seemed like he'd just closed his eyes when his alarm went off. Neil rolled over to turn it off and almost groaned at how sore he was. He'd have to scale it back at practice today or Wymack would ream him out. Matt had his shoes on before he was awake enough to talk. He went still with the knots half done and looked at Neil. You were right. They made a promise. Aaron and Andrew, I mean. That's what Aaron told Caitlin, anyway. Aaron cut a deal with Andrew at Juvie. If Andrew stuck with him until graduation, Aaron would stick with Andrew. No friends, no girlfriends, nothing. Aaron couldn't even socialize with his teammates. Neil combed his fingers through his hair and tested the bandage on his cheek. Aaron would have meant high school graduation. They renewed it when they signed a contract to play here. Now Caitlin's in the picture, but Aaron won't fight for her. Matt shook his head and finished tying his shoes. Caitlin told Dan what Andrew did to Aaron's high school exes. If Caitlin's not afraid of Andrew, she's not safe from him. Is Andrew really that crazy that he'd lash out against someone so important to Aaron? Aaron made a promise, Neil said, choosing his words carefully. Andrew will make him keep it. It's not as crazy as it sounds. Neil had almost forgotten how blind the upperclassmen were to the twins' issues. He hadn't figured it out until his second trip to Eden's twilight, but now the Cold War between them was achingly obvious. 
Caitlin's importance to Aaron was what put her in danger. If Aaron wouldn't fight for her, was it because he was too afraid to stand up to his brother, or did he really think he had more to gain by playing along? More importantly, why did Andrew agree to extend the deal? Was he still punishing Aaron for siding with their mother, or did he think enough time would make a difference? The latter seemed far-fetched, but Neil was inclined to believe it. When Drake left Andrew a concussed and bloody wreck in Columbia, the only thing that mattered to Andrew, the only person he needed to see, was Aaron. His own trauma was inconsequential. He'd cared about the blood splattered across Aaron's skin. Andrew and Aaron had done this to each other, and they were locked in stalemate. They were unwilling to reach out and unable to let go. November should have been the catalyst, but Aaron's arrest and Andrew's exile to East Haven meant they'd recovered from that nightmare away from each other. Andrew had been back a week now, and Neil was positive the two hadn't talked about that night yet, same as they'd never talked through the reasons behind Tilda Minyard's death. Aaron would ignore Neil if he brought it up, and Neil didn't have a big enough secret to talk Andrew into reaching out to Aaron. Kevin wouldn't get involved, and Andrew would just brush Nicky off if he tried. Wymack had promised to stay out of their personal problems, though he'd towed that line the other day for the sake of his team's safety. Renee might hold Andrew's attention long enough to plant a thought toward reconciliation, but Aaron had absolutely no interest in anything Renee had to say. That left few options, and Neil had deleted Betsy Dobson's number out of his phone the same day Andrew programmed her in as an emergency contact. Aaron said he didn't talk to Betsy, but he had to have picked up on Andrew's attachment to her. Maybe he would let her mediate in a confidential setting. If he refused, Caitlin could give him the final push he needed. Getting Andrew to agree to it would be the real trick. Even if sobriety hadn't dimmed his opinion of Betsy, convincing him to open up to Aaron about all of this would be borderline impossible. Idly, he wondered if Betsy even knew the brothers had issues. Neil? Neil glanced up to see Matt hovering in the bedroom doorway. He hadn't even noticed Matt leave the room, too caught up in his thoughts. Matt looked a bit perplexed to find Neil right where he'd left him. You good? We gotta go. If Neil was late to practice twice in a row, Kevin would probably bench him out of spite. Neil scooped his keys off his dresser. I'm good. Did Dan give you Aaron's new tutor schedule? When Matt nodded, Neil said, I changed my mind. I'll deal with him. I've got an idea. Matt forwarded the text to Neil while Neil locked the suite door behind them. Neil felt his phone buzz in his pocket but let it sit unread on the way to the stadium. His screen was too small for anyone to read the message over his shoulder, but Nicky would want to know who was texting Neil this early in the day. Neil would have to get Betsy's and Caitlin's numbers later. If he was lucky, Dan had both of them in her phone. They spent morning practice doing strength circuits at the gym. Neil rode back with Andrew's lot, but stopped by the girls' room to get his bruises touched up. He was looking better a week out of Rico's reach, but he'd need to cover up for a couple more days. Long after everything healed, Neil would have a bandage on his face, though, and he still hadn't told the upperclassmen what he was hiding from them. Neil thought about it as Allison worked on him. Andrew's lot and the staff knew, which meant there was no point in hiding it anymore. Allison he said, a warning that he was about to move. She drew her hand back a bit and Neil reached up to the tape on his face. He didn't know where it was safe to touch, since his cheek felt cold all over from her concealer. Allison understood what he was trying to do, though, and swatted his hand out of the way. She snagged the edge of the tape with her long fingernails and pried the bandage off in one smooth move. It took her a half second to realize what she was looking at and she was on her feet with a shrill, Are you kidding me? Dan was in the kitchen scarfing down breakfast, and Renee was in their bedroom, but Allison's outburst brought them running. Dan was on Neil's left, so she saw it first. She ground to a halt, but only for a second. A heartbeat later, she was across the room and on the couch where Allison had just been sitting. Neil didn't know she could move so fast. This is a joke, Dan said, grabbing Neil's chin. Neil! He told me to transfer to the Ravens, Neil said. He said I could finish this year with the Foxes, but that I'd move to Edgar Allen this fall. They inked me in preparation, and I couldn't stop them. I wanted you to know in case Rico says something about it. I'm still a Fox no matter what he says. I wouldn't sign his papers. Take it off, Dan said. It's permanent, Neil said. Nothing's permanent. Take it off. Matt will spot you the money. 
He will or I will, Allison said. I don't want to see that on my court. Kevin's tramp stamp fouls the atmosphere enough. Kevin knew about this, didn't he? Dan said, incensed. He knew what Rico was going to do to you and he let you go anyway. The next time I see him, you'll do nothing. Neil interrupted her. Kevin didn't have the right to stop me. He let you go to Rico in his stead. No, Neil said. Kevin didn't factor into any of that. He knew it wasn't about him. Dan wasn't expecting that. Confusion took the edge off her anger. You said Rico was trying to get to Kevin. I said Rico focused on me because of my relation to Kevin, Neil said. I didn't say that's why I went. I just thought you should know about this before the season kicks off. Dan let him get to his feet but seized his elbow before he could get far. Neil looked down at her, but she was staring across the room at nothing. It was a minute before she spoke. You never had any plans to go home for Christmas, did you? That whole mess about your uncle flying to Arizona? You made that up so we wouldn't ask too many questions or wonder why you weren't going to New York with Kevin. There was no point in denying it. I did. I get that you don't trust us completely, Dan said. I don't like it, but I think we've been pretty good at working around that all year. We haven't pushed you to give us more than you're comfortable with, and we haven't asked you why you're like this. So don't do this to us. Don't sit here and lie to our faces. She finally looked up at him, frustration pulling hard at the corner of her mouth. We're your friends. We deserve better than that. If you always got what you deserved, you wouldn't be a fox. Neil tugged out of her grip. She let him go without a fight, looking a little startled by that blunt rejoinder. Neil tried to stamp out the trickle of guilt, but couldn't quite manage it. I've never had friends before. I don't know how this works. I'm trying, but it's going to take time. Time was something he didn't have, but that wasn't worth mentioning. Dan accepted his apology and promise with a weary nod, and they let him leave in peace. Neil stopped by his bathroom to put a new bandage over his tattoo. He still had time to kill before class, so he sat at his desk with his textbooks. He meant to review his notes from his previous lessons. Instead, he drew fox paws across the pages until it was time to go. Neil didn't text Dan until lunchtime, wanting to give her a couple hours to cool down. Either she'd forgiven him or she'd forgotten the morning's fiasco because she responded almost immediately with the numbers he needed. Neil ended up programming both into his phone. Nikki had a habit of filling up Neil's inbox, and Neil couldn't afford to lose track of these ladies. He reached out to Caitlin first. He must have caught her while she was in class because it was almost an hour before she got back to him. It only took a couple messages to realize there was no good time in their schedules to get together today. She promised to make time tomorrow to hear him out, though, and that was good enough. That afternoon, Neil finally got the confirmation he was looking for. Even though Andrew was off his drugs, he still had weekly sessions with Betsy. Neil knew what time Andrew's sessions started and assumed Betsy would have a small window without patience before Andrew showed up at her door. As soon as Neil knew Andrew was on his way to Redden, he steeled his nerves and dialed Betsy's desk. She answered on the second ring with a pleasant, Dr. Dobson. It's Neil, Neil said, and continued before she could act surprised and pleased to hear from him. I need a yes or no. If we can talk Aaron and Andrew into doing joint sessions with you, can you fix them? There was only a brief pause before Betsy said, I will certainly try. Don't try, Neil said. Don't guess. This is too important. Can you or can't you? Yes. He could hear the smile in her voice, not amusement, but approval. If you can get them here, I will take care of it. Neil, she said as he was starting to move the phone from his ear. I like the honest side of you. Neil hung up on her. It was too early in the year for the library to be crowded, so Neil had no trouble finding Caitlin. An oversized cup of coffee sat at her elbow, and Neil was tempted to detour past the cafe for his own drink. He didn't want to look like he was staying, though, so he headed down the aisle to her table without stopping. A biochem textbook was pushed off to one side as she highlighted relevant portions of her notes. Aaron had the same book in his room as he was studying biological sciences. Neil guessed their similar majors and overlapping classes was how they'd met outside of games. Caitlin looked up at his approach and flipped her notebook closed. Neil, hello. I know it's only been a few weeks, but it feels like forever. How was Christmas? It was fine, Neil said. How was yours? 
Oh my gosh, amazing. Caitlin clasped her hands in glee. My sister finally found out she's having a boy, so I spent most of my break buying things for him. Mom told me I'm going overboard, but I know she's just as excited. She told them last month that her sister was pregnant, but Neil hadn't held on to the details. He tuned her excited rambling out now, listening only for the key words that meant she was done detailing all her great finds and winter sales. It didn't take her long to remember they weren't here to catch up, and she pulled herself together with a smile that was as sheepish as it was happy. So what's this about? Caitlin asked. You said you wanted to talk about Aaron? Aaron needs help, Neil said. I'm trying to get him some. Caitlin sobered up in a heartbeat. He's having nightmares again, isn't he? He said he was doing better. He promised that— Caitlin gestured frustration or helplessness and pressed her fingers to her trembling lower lip. Nightmares, Neil echoed. It wasn't the turn he'd thought this conversation would take, but he could guess what was tearing Aaron apart. About November, you mean. He doesn't want it to bother him, Caitlin said. He says Drake deserved worse than what he got. He says he's glad he did it. But wanting someone dead and actually being the one to kill them are two very different things. I'm willing to listen to him, and I want to do everything I can to help, but he doesn't hear me when I tell him it's okay. He needs to talk to Andrew, Neil said. Caitlin gave a choked laugh. <laughs> he won't. Caitlin knew what the upperclassmen didn't, that Aaron and Andrew could barely stand the sight of each other on a good day. Maybe she needed to know, since their fight was what was keeping her and Aaron apart. Neil favorably recalculated her odds of actually making it with Aaron in the long run. He has to, Neil said again. They need each other. They just don't know how to take that first step. That's where you come in. Caitlin searched his face for a minute, then said, Why? Why you? Neil asked. Why you? She corrected him. Aaron isn't... She was too nice to say it, but Neil had no problems filling in the blanks. Aaron and I get along when we have to and avoid each other when we can. I'm not going to lie and say I'm doing this for his sake. I don't care whether he's okay in the long run. I care only about the team. We can't win without them. Does it really matter why I'm doing it so long as everyone walks away happy in the end? It matters to me, Caitlin said. I love him. So help me help him, Neil said. Caitlin pressed her lips to a thin line as she debated. I'm listening. Has Aaron ever told you about Dr. Dobson? Neil asked. She works at Redden and she's the go-to shrink for our team. She's willing to run group sessions with Andrew and Aaron. Aaron's mentioned her before. He said she's a waste of time. Because he doesn't use her like he's supposed to, Neil said, neatly ignoring the hypocrisy in his accusation. Luckily, it doesn't matter what Aaron thinks. Dobson's seen both of them. She's treated Andrew for a year and a half now. If she honestly thought she couldn't reconcile them, she would have said so. If we can get them both in her office at the same time, she can make them talk to each other. You want me to talk him into it? Caitlin concluded. You convince Aaron, I'll convince Andrew. Do you really think you can? I have to, Neil said. But how? Caitlin pressed. I'm asking honestly because I don't know how to talk Aaron into it. He wouldn't listen to me the last time I told him to get help. Then don't make this about him, Neil said. Make this about you. You can fix this right here, right now. Stop being collateral damage and make him fight for you. I don't think I can use us against him. It isn't fair. But this is? Neil gestured at her. Look, there's no way I can convince Andrew overnight. So you've got some time to think about it. But when Andrew is ready, you have to pick your side. Try to pick the right one. He got up and left and she didn't call after him. Chapter 5 Classes on January 12th were a complete waste of the fox's time. Neil's lessons were early enough in the day that he made it to both of them, but he didn't learn a single thing. His teacher's voices were white noise. The words they wrote on the board morphed to diagrams of plays. Neil held his pen at the ready, but didn't write a single letter in his notebook. He'd have to borrow notes from a classmate later, but today none of that mattered. All that mattered was that they had a 120 flight out of Upstate Regional. First serve was scheduled for 7.30, but Wymack wanted them on the ground in Austin two hours early. He didn't trust winter weather, he'd said. Neil was sure he'd jinx them with that paranoia. It was pouring outside, cold and hard enough to feel like ice, and Neil worried their flight would be delayed. They had a small cushion, thanks to a 90-minute layover in Atlanta, 
but Neil was still afraid. If they missed their first game of championships over something so stupid as the weather, he would never get over it. It was raining too hard for an umbrella to do any good, so Neil pulled his hood up and jogged back to Fox Tower. He slanted a look at the sky, hoping to see an end to the charcoal clouds, and was rewarded with rain in his eyes. Neil scrubbed a hand across his face and darted through a gap in traffic on Perimeter Road. An athlete on his way down the hill to class slipped and fell with a startled curse. He was back on his feet before Neil caught up with him, but Neil learned his lesson and slowed down. He hadn't survived Rico's cruelty to be handicapped by impatience. The four caution signs set up in the lobby were overkill, but Neil still skidded a little on the wet floor. He caught the wall for balance and waved his wallet over the sensor near the elevator. His student ID was strong enough to trigger the lock through the leather. When the buttons lit up, Neil pressed the up arrow and got on the first car that arrived. There was standing water on the elevator floor, so he held tight to the rail until he reached the third floor. The carpeted hallway was stained from wet footprints. Neil added to the mess as he slogged for his room. Dry clothes did nothing to make him feel warmer, so Neil sprawled on the couch with a blanket. He didn't remember falling asleep, but the sound of the door jarred him awake. Matt looked half a foot shorter than usual with his hair plastered to his skull. Despite his wretched state, he was grinning on his way in. He motioned at Neil to get his attention, but didn't speak until the door was closed behind him. Just past Allison, Matt said. Soaked? Neil guessed. Understatement of the year, Matt said. I think her umbrella broke. She's a hot mess. Told her I was going to take a picture of her for the yearbook and she threatened to cut my balls off with her fingernails. Five bucks says Dan will have to push her out the door when it's time to leave again. She knows we need her. That mean you're in? I don't bet, Neil said. Still, on anything? Matt crossed the room to drop his bag by his desk. We've got, what, sixteen ongoing bets now and you don't want in on any of them? Well, fourteen that you're qualified to bet on. Some of the pots are getting pretty big, and you're probably in the best position to win on a couple of them. Why fourteen? Neil asked. What happened to the other two? Can't bet on yourself, Matt said. That's cheating. Neil tilted his head back to look at Matt. I didn't know you were betting on me. We bet on everyone at one point in time, Matt said. Did you know most of the team bet against me and Dan? They didn't think I'd have the courage to ask her, and they knew she'd never give me a chance. She was kind of a man-hater when I met her. I want to blame it on her time at the strip club, but I think it's mostly due to the guys coach gave her to work with her freshman year. Even Allison told me not to try. You tried anyway, Neil said. For a year, Matt said. Made Renee a small fortune when Dan finally gave in. She's the only one who bet on us. She's always the most willing to bet on lost causes. Andrew had called Neil a lost cause last year, one hand over Neil's mouth to keep him from arguing. Looking back on it now, with all the missing pieces of that argument in place, Neil knew it wasn't really him Andrew was trying to shut up. Neil found the self-censure fascinating in retrospect. Renee would have told Andrew before then that she'd confessed Andrew's sexuality to Neil, and Andrew hadn't hedged his way around the truth when Neil asked for it last Friday. What did Andrew think he was going to say last November? It didn't matter. It shouldn't matter. Andrew didn't want anything to come of his attraction, and anyway, Neil wasn't allowed to let people that close. It was how he was raised. It was how he survived. He was lucky to be so detached now that the end was right around the corner. He'd broken every other rule his mother left him with. The least he could do was uphold one. That's why you bet on Andrew and Renee, Neil said, because he couldn't, wouldn't, think about this. Well, yeah, Matt said. For a while there, Rene was the only one outside of his little group Andrew would talk to. Rene said they had a lot in common and it was nothing serious, but then he let her drive his car. That's a GS, Neil. You don't loan that out to just anyone. Neil waved a hand over his head to show the significance passing him by. I don't speak cars? I'm saying after he finished tricking it out, it cost almost six figures, Matt said. Neil bolted upright and twisted around to stare at Matt. Cost what? He knew Andrew blew most of Tilda's life insurance on it. Nicky once joked that Andrew picked whichever one would eat the inheritance up fastest. Neil hadn't asked how much money they made off her death, but he'd known just by looking at the car it'd been a colossal waste of resources. Having a ballpark figure made Neil feel ill. His key ring suddenly weighed a ton and it was all he could do to not pull it out of his pocket. It's almost as expensive as Allison's Porsche, Matt said. 
and he let Renee drive it just two months after meeting her. Do you blame me for putting money on them? Man, I was so sure that'd pan out. The past tense was enough to distract Neil. You changed your mind? Sort of, Matt said. But rules are rules. Once money's in the pot, you can't change which side you're betting on. You can bet against it in other pots, though, so I might make some of my money back, but hell, it's already after 12. We gotta get moving. You want anything for the plane? I suggest you grab it now. He was gone before Neil could ask what changed Matt's mind about Renee's chances. Neil let it go and grabbed his stack of notes on UT's lineup. Matt's grin was knowing, borderline pitying, when they met up to leave and he saw what Neil was holding. Neil pretended not to see and locked the sweet door behind them. The girls waited for Matt to catch up with them, but Neil continued a few steps past them to Andrew's group. Andrew's car looked like an entirely new monster as Neil approached it. He was feeling well enough to sit back with Nikki and Aaron, but Kevin followed them in before Neil could suggest it. In the time it took them to get from the dorm to the car and the car to the stadium, the foxes were soaked. Allison hadn't bothered with an umbrella this time, but had a second raincoat over her head to protect her newly redone hair and makeup. She was drier than any of them, but she was still swearing at the weather as she stalked into the house. Wymack tolerated their rowdy arrival with his usual lack of patience and herded them down the hall to pack their gear. They took the team bus to the airport because it was cheaper to leave one car in the garage than three. Being back at Upstate Regional made Neil think about his trip to West Virginia, so he focused on his teammates to keep his thoughts from spiraling down dark circles. It was a near miss, at least until Wymack sent a searching look his way. Neil glanced at Wymack and chose not to think about Rico. Instead, he thought about his homecoming, of Wymack dropping everything to pick him up, and Wymack holding him together when he almost broke. The tightness in Neil's chest eased a little, and he nodded an okay to Wymack's silent question. They made it through check-in and security in good time, and set off down the terminal in search of their gate. They were almost at the end, past the restrooms and a dozen shops. A cafe was halfway down, and the smell of coffee and warm pastries was almost enough to distract them, Wymack kept them in line with rude language and half-hearted threats. The Vixens had beaten them to the airport and were camped out at the gate. Neil looked past them to the electronic sign about the desk. It read, Atlanta, 1.20 p.m., so the airline wasn't expecting a delay despite the weather. Neil chose to believe it only because their plane was already waiting outside. The foxes scattered at Wymax OK, half of them to look out the window and the rest to dump their carry-ons on whatever empty chairs they could find. It took Neil only a moment to realize Andrew hadn't budged. Neil looked back at him, but Andrew was staring out the far window. Neil followed his gaze and watched a plane rocket down the runway. The others weren't close enough anymore to overhear, so Neil said, When you said you were afraid of heights, you were joking, right? He gave Andrew a moment to answer, then tried again. Andrew, you can't be. What were you doing on the roof? Andrew didn't answer immediately, but the tilt of his head to one side said he was thinking about it. Neil didn't know if he was searching for words or just figuring out which ones he wanted to give Neil an explanation. Finally, Andrew lifted a hand to his own throat and felt for his pulse. He tapped his finger along when he found it. It was going faster than it should. Neil blamed it on Andrew's surroundings. Feeling, Andrew said at last. Trying to remember fear or trying to remember how to feel anything at all, Neil asked. But Andrew didn't answer. Neil tried a different tactic. If it makes you feel better, fewer than 20 planes crash every year and it's not always due to the weather. Sometimes pilots are just unreliable. I'm sure it's a quick death either way. Andrew's hand went still. What was his name? He looked to Neil, who frowned confusion at him, and said, Your father. What was his name? It almost knocked the breath out of him. Neil didn't want to answer, didn't want that name out in the air between them, but it was Andrew's turn in their game. He didn't have the right to refuse. He tried to take a little comfort in it, because Andrew wouldn't hit this low unless Neil's taunt had gotten to him, but Neil couldn't quite manage. He looked to the foxes, made sure they were still out of earshot, and stepped closer to Andrew anyway. Nathan, he said at last. His name was Nathan. You don't look like a Nathan. I'm not, Neil said through the stones in his throat. I'm Nathaniel. Andrew considered him a minute longer, then turned away without another word and went back to watching the runways. 
Neil retreated, needing breathing room to get that sick ache out of his veins. Nicky waved wildly to get his attention and motioned for Neil to join him. As soon as Neil was close enough, Nicky slung a careful arm around his shoulders. Blatant favoritism, Nicky said. You know, he's said maybe ten words to me since we picked him up from East Haven. I'd be jealous if I wasn't so against dying young. But anyway, we've got some time before takeoff. Want to come with us and grab some coffee? They ended up taking half the team and several of the vixens with them to the cafe. Nicky said they were good on time, but none of them had counted on how slow the line would move. By the time they all made it back to their gate with their drinks, their flight was already boarding. Neil kept a keen eye on Andrew as they joined the line, waiting for him to hesitate. Maybe Andrew noticed the attention because he followed his teammates onto the plane with a bored look on his face. The act lasted up until they were all in their seats and the attendants were going through the safety features on the plane. The only thing Andrew had brought onto the plane with him was a pen. He turned it over and over in his hands while the attendants demonstrated how to use the onboard oxygen masks. Kevin, sitting between Neil and Andrew, didn't even bat an eye. Neil guessed he was used to Andrew being restless. Neil only knew what that fidgeting meant because Andrew had told him the truth when Neil asked what he was afraid of. Neil glanced out the window, but the rain was so thick on the glass he could barely make out the wing of the plane. The lights were a blurry mess. Neil closed the shade as the attendants did a final walkthrough of the cabin. Takeoff had never seemed a complicated process before, but Neil imagined how drawn out it would feel to someone who didn't want to be airborne. Finally, they were rolling down the runway, and Neil risked another look at Andrew. Andrew's expression didn't change when the tires left the ground, but Andrew's pen went still for the entire ascent, and he went tense. He went back at it as soon as they reached cruising altitude. He had to notice the looks Neil sent him, but he kept his heavy-lidded stare on the seat back in front of him. They had time to kill in Atlanta, so as soon as Wymac confirmed their gate hadn't changed, he let them wander the airport for an hour. Andrew's lot spent most of that time wandering from one store to another. Aaron picked up a book while Nicky loaded up on junk food. Andrew disappeared, but Neil finally spotted him near a glass case of figurines. It was an odd thing for Andrew to be distracted by, but Neil didn't have long to think about it. Kevin and Nicky were two seconds away from getting into it because Kevin was trying to put Nicky's snacks back on the shelf. It's not all for me, Nicky insisted, trying to wrestle out of Kevin's grip without dropping anything. There's enough to go around. No one needs to eat this before a game, Kevin said. Eat some granola or protein if you're that hungry. Hello, there's protein in the peanut butter, Nicky said. Let go of me before I tell Andrew you're outlawing chocolate. I said let go. You're not the boss of me. Ouch! Did you seriously just hit me? I'm walking away and pretending I don't know you, Aaron said. Traitor, Nicky called after him. Kevin, just let him go, Neil said. It's not worth fighting over. When our defense is sluggish, we all suffer, Kevin said. You aren't serious, Nicky said. We've got how many hours until serve? This will all be out of my system by then. You can watch me take a shit if you don't believe me. I didn't think you were into that kind of thing, but ha! He crowed when Kevin stomped off. He flashed Neil a triumphant grin, oblivious to the way the store clerks were staring at them. I'm a master at persuasion. Or self-delusion, Neil said. Nicky's eyebrows shot up. Oh my god, did you try to make a joke? Did it hurt a little? No, really, he said when Neil turned as if to leave him. What put you in such a good mood? Turning put Andrew in Neil's line of sight again. Light flashed off the crystal figurine in Andrew's hand as he passed it to one of the cashiers. Neil was too far away to see what shape he'd settled on, but he didn't need to know. His thoughts were on a shelf of sparkling animals all set equidistant to each other. Surprise warred with relief and gave way to a hum of self-satisfaction. Neil didn't understand what Andrew saw in Betsy, but he didn't care anymore. He was right to put his faith in her. She was going to patch the brothers up and the team would finally be whole. The Ravens wouldn't know what to make of them the next time they met on court. Hey, Neil, Nicky said. You ignoring me? Just thinking about tonight, Neil lied. I'll wait here while you check out. Nicky shrugged and headed for the next open register. Andrew collected Kevin on his way back to Neil's side and Aaron drifted back to them when Nicky called him. They headed back to the gate and settled down until boarding time. The skies over Atlanta were cloudy but dry. 
A quick board and all heads accounted for meant they got to leave a couple minutes early. Neil kept a discreet eye on Andrew until the plane leveled out, then turned his gaze out the window and thought of UT. Neil had never dealt with baggage claim before as he and his mother tossed out whatever wouldn't fit in a carry-on. It was an eye-opening and unpleasant experience. The same suitcases went around the conveyor belt so many times Neil started thinking the team's gear had been lost. The foxes looked bored, not worried, so he kept that bit of panic to himself. He was rewarded a few minutes later when Allison's bag finally dropped down a chute and onto the belt. The rest of the bags weren't far behind hers. Load em up and line it up, Wymax said as he and Abby grabbed their own bags. The foxes trailed him to ground transportation where Wymac had reserved a 12-seat passenger van. Their bags took up the entire trunk and then most of the footroom, but they managed to get the door closed and that was all that mattered. Wymac smoothed out a crumpled paper of handwritten directions, spared his notes the briefest of glances, and got them on their way. They stopped briefly at an Italian restaurant to wolf down chicken and pasta. Wymac grumbled about the bill, but his team knew better than to take him seriously. The stadium was crawling with cops and fans when they arrived. Security guards helped Wymac find a place to park, and the team was escorted to the locker room. They were early, so Wymac flicked on every TV he could find and went to check the crowd. The closest TV to Neil was playing highlights of last night's Class 1 games. Unsurprisingly, half of the moves worth rehashing were from the Ravens' 15-8 victory. Neil had watched their match between practices last night. Thirty minutes out from serve, they split up into the locker rooms to change. Neil was no longer surprised to find a complete lack of privacy in the men's changing room, but his teammates stayed out of the bathroom long enough for him to struggle into his gear. He left his helmet and gloves off, since they still had plenty of time before serve, and rejoined his teammates in the main room. Take them on a couple laps, Wymack told Dan. Let them get a look at the place. The University of Texas Stadium was comparable to the foxhole court in size. The Longhorns and Foxes shared the same team colors, too, so the packed rafters looked familiar and comforting. Neil just had to ignore the crowd's challenging roar as they noticed the Foxes in their midst. Dan stopped them after a mile, and they jogged back to the locker room to stretch it out. Abby had water waiting for them. Wymac was guarding the rest of their gear. Aaron and Nikki steered the stick rack out to the inner ring when it was time to take their spot on the benches. The Vixens had shown up and somehow found the section reserved for Palmetto State students. Dan had her team wave an energetic greeting to both the squad and their ardent fans. The Foxes were rewarded with enthusiastic cheers. A few seconds later, the Longhorns passed them in an infinite stream. The Foxes had come in their orange-on-white away jerseys, and the Longhorns wore their white-on-orange home uniforms. It was disorienting watching them go by on their laps. Neil hoped no one got confused in the heat of the moment. Even the smallest hesitation on the court could cost them a point. When the Longhorns were ready, they'd be on the court for drills, so the Foxes collected their rackets. Wymack gave them a few moments, then clapped his hands to get their attention. All right, listen up. It's time to get serious. These guys might look like friendlies in our colors, but they're here for one reason only, to eliminate you right out of the gate. They are wannabe champions, and they know what it takes to get to the next level. Your job tonight is to make them look like fools. Abby scowled at him, but Wymack didn't even look at her. We've been over their lineup a hundred times. You've read Neil's notes. I showed you what you needed to see. These guys are quick and dangerous, but they are not impenetrable. The trick is holding center court. For the love of all things unholy, watch those dealers. I'll watch them limp off my court, Dan said. Do what you have to do, Wymack said. But don't you dare get red carded. That goes for all of you. He shot Matt a pointed look. Matt's grin did nothing to reassure anyone, but Wymack didn't waste his breath warning him a second time. If you ladies start losing ground, call on defense to lend a hand. I don't care if it means putting one backliner on two strikers long enough to get some breathing room. The goalies are going to lock our goal down, right? We'll do our best, Renee said with a bright smile. The crowd's screams escalated to an excited, feverish pitch. Neil assumed the mascots had shown up to rile the stands. 
He glanced past Wymac, still half listening to the lecture and followed pointing fingers. A bracketed VIP section was alongside the press box between the Fox's benches and the Vixen squad. A couple bodyguards were checking the crowd for potential threats, but they moved back out of the way when their charges were comfortable. Neil's world slowed to a crawl at the sight of black tattoos and dark hair. Wymac snapped his fingers in Neil's face. Neil flinched so hard he rocked back into Kevin. He darted a quick look up at Wymac, mouth open on an apology he didn't have the breath for, but Wymac didn't wait for it. He whipped around to scour the inner ring. It took him almost no time at all to spot Rico and Jean. When he turned his back, his expression was darker than Neil had ever seen it. The foxes saw them too, and Matt was the first to react with a furious, What are they doing here? I'll ask, Andrew said and started that way. Wymac hauled him to a stop before he could get more than a step away from the fox's huddle. You are not allowed to kill anyone the first game of the season. Worry less about him and more about your offense line, got me? Focus, Kevin. You too, Neil. Neil, he said louder. Eyes on me. Neil realized he was looking at Rico again. He dragged his gaze back to Wymac's face. Wymac looked angry, but Neil knew Wymac too well by now. The anger was born of genuine worry. Neil chose to interpret it as disappointment instead because that was easier to motivate himself with. The foxes needed him tonight. He couldn't let Rico get to him. Neil caught tight of every bad memory that was snarling at his ear and shoved it deep. I'm starting to think he likes me after all, Neil said with forced nonchalance. Nicky's laugh sounded fake and a smile didn't reach his eyes, but at least he tried. Ha <laughs> ha, who can resist a looker like you for long, right? You're lucky I'm taken because, damn, maybe we can convince Eric to share me? Would it kill you to leave the freaky shit off the court for once? Aaron asked. If I have to watch you ogle Caitlyn, you have to watch me lure Neil to the dark side. I do not ogle Caitlyn. Okay, sure, you don't ogle. You long-distance pine, which is a thousand times more nauseating. You have two seconds to shut up before I send you all on laps, Wymax said. Nikki subsided with a lightning-quick grin in Neil's direction. Neil managed a small smile back. The familiar bickering had taken the edge off the fox's outrage, and now the upperclassmen looked to Neil instead of Rico. Andrew made himself comfortable on Neil's left, a one-man barricade between Neil and the crowd. The next time Wymac looked at Neil, Neil nodded a silent okay. Where was I? Wymac asked. Offense, I think, Neil said, and looked at Kevin. Kevin was staring white-faced at Rico, but Neil nudged him until he had Kevin's attention. Fair warning, if they put Beckstein as my mark, I'm going to have to do side passes all night. He's got a foot on me, so if he catches my stick on an upward swing, it'll pull me too far and I'll tear something. Kevin started to say something, but Andrew beat him to the punch with a calm, Eight inches. He's only 5'11". Neil and Kevin pivoted to stare at Andrew. The flash of a grin on Wymac's face said he caught the significance of that remark and knew what it meant for the Fox's chances tonight. The rest of the team blew right by without noticing. Dan said something to Allison about how to compensate for Neil's possible handicap. Neil knew he and Kevin were meant to be included in the conversation, but he couldn't follow along. Height was arguably the most critical detail on an exe court. A player's height decided how long of a racket they could wield and determined their reach. To most players, a general figure was good enough. It didn't matter if they were an inch or two off because they just needed an idea of what they were up against. They used the number solely to determine how tricky their mark would be to get around. Neil and Kevin knew the exact height of every Longhorn backliner because they couldn't play the game without that information. Technical players, like Kevin, could use a man's height to map out his every weak spot. More importantly, he could cross-reference his own field of reach against his marks and find the best places to push. That was how he got around defense so often. Instinctive players like Neil knew where those gaps were without calculating angles and overlap. If Wymac gave Neil a pen and told him to draw a backliner's blind spot on a diagram, he couldn't do it. But once the game was going, Neil could find it in a heartbeat. He wasn't good enough yet to take full advantage of that insight, but Kevin said a talent like that would have eventually secured Neil's spot on the U.S. court. Andrew had no excuse for knowing Beckstein's height. For starters, Beckstein was a backliner. If the Foxes did their job right, Beckstein shouldn't ever get close enough to gold to take a shot at it. 
More importantly, Wymack had only given out the Longhorns' heights once, when he'd first read the UT lineup out to his team. That statistic was printed on the Round 1 pamphlet Wymack handed out last week, but Andrew had stuffed that paperwork in his locker the first chance he got. Neil hadn't seen him take it out since. Andrew had looked a thousand miles away when Wymack went over the Longhorns roster, but he'd heard every word and he'd retained it. That perfect retention was what saved them in their match against Belmont last fall. Wymack made a throwaway comment about penalty shots during the halftime rundown. The game didn't come down to penalties, but with so few seconds left on the clock and so much pressure on the Belmont striker to tie the score, Andrew knew he'd go for what was familiar. He'd blocked an impossible shot without thinking twice. Neil looked at Kevin, then Wymack, wondering why no one had told him Andrew had an eidetic memory, wondering if they'd even known. He couldn't help but give it another test. He mentally scrolled through the Longhorns' offense line and settled on a fifth-year striker. How tall is Lakes? Look it up, Andrew said. Humor me just this once, Neil said. Andrew started to turn away, so Neil hooked his gloved fingers in the netted head of Andrew's racket and gave a careful tug. He tried again with an insistent... How tall is she? Five six, Matt guessed. Five eight, Andrew said. Close enough, Matt shrugged apathy. Neil let go of Andrew's racket in favor of holding on to his own. We're going to win. You were expecting us to lose? Dan asked. No, Neil admitted. His lips twitched, and he knew from the hard pull at his mouth that he was wearing his father's smile. He pressed the side of his glove to his face, nearly crushing his teeth into his lips. He tasted blood before it was safe to drop his hand again. Neil leaned back a bit and looked past Andrew at Rico. I'm just glad he's here to see it. Let's see if we can't rattle him. Let's, Wymax said. Anyway, imagine I got through everything important I needed to say because it's too late to finish now. The court's open. We're on with the usual drills. Ones and threes. I say this every time because you make me say this every time. Keep the balls on our goddamn side of the court, Andrew. The Foxes yanked on the last of their gear and headed on for a few drills. Neil was content to take it easy, more interested in judging the state of his body than one-upping his own goalkeepers. The side of Rico had sent every one of Neil's fading bruises to pounding. But now he barely felt a thing. The only thing that mattered was his team and the way they moved around him. They had to leave the court for coin toss. Dan won them for a serve, and Wymack had a couple seconds before the lineups were called to gather his team close. Remember, he said, it's two out of three to advance, and you can't afford to lose the first game of the season. Strikers get three goals apiece, or I'll register you for a marathon. Backliners, if you look like idiots, you'll keep them company. Dealers, you've got this. Rene, play it like you know how. Andrew, keep the score at three or under for your half and I'll buy you as much alcohol as will fit in your cabinet. The announcer called both starting lineups to the court. Neil took his place on the half-court line and sent a final look Kevin's way. By some miracle, Beckstein was on the court against Kevin. Kevin answered his glance with a nod. Neil was almost bouncing by the time the buzzer sounded. For a while, the game was an even back and forth. There were a couple collisions, a couple near misses, and more than a few rude words exchanged. Wymack was right to warn them about the Longhorns' dealers. The girl Texas put in as a starter was fast and dirty. She and Dan shoved at each other almost nonstop. Even when the ball was on the other side of the court, they wrapped their sticks together in a constant check. How Dan held out so long before snapping, Neil didn't know, but she lasted a good ten minutes. The next time the ball went toward the dealers, Dan ducked, hooked her body under her mark, and flipped the girl clear off her feet. To add insult to injury, she offered the fallen girl a gloved hand back to her feet. The next second, they were in each other's faces with jabbing fingers and strident tones. The referees made it halfway across the court to them, likely to card Dan for her dangerous body check, before the other dealer punched Dan in her mouth. Dan threw her hands up and refused to retaliate. There was no point when she'd gotten what she wanted. Both dealers got yellow cards, and the referees restarted gameplay from a neutral position. That almost fight was the tipping point, and the rest of the first half was brutal. Neil was sore all over by the time the bell rang for halftime, but he didn't care how much his body hurt. Andrew had done what Wymack asked and given up only two goals. The Foxes, on the other hand, had already netted four. 
Neil followed his teammates off the court for halftime break, past Wymac where he was giving breezy dismissals to the reporters, and paced the locker room until the feeling came back to his toes. Abby roped him into a quick checkup in the other room, and Neil was too out of breath to wave her off. The Longhorns went all out in the second half, getting two players red-carded and five yellowed. Their underhanded playing style wore the Foxes thin, but the Foxes knew better than to fight back. A yellow card wouldn't get them benched, but two in a row would get them booted from the match, and they had no one to spare. They kept their cool as best they could— towed a careful line on their own numerous transgressions, and harvested as many points as they could from penalty shots. In the end, it was worth it, because the final score was 7-6, Fox's favor. When the Foxes filed off the court, Renee headed for Rico. She wasn't the sort to pick a fight, so Neil stopped to stare after her. Rico didn't take the hand Renee offered, but Jean did. The handshake lasted a little too long, but Neil didn't know which one of them was slower to let go. Neil thought of Jean's odd reaction to René at the fall banquet, the lingering look and the uncomfortable introduction. It was the memory he'd been looking for last week when going through his messages at Redden. Jean accepted Rico and Tetsuji's cruelty because he had no one outside of the Ravens. With nothing else to live for and no reason to fight, he bowed his head and focused on surviving. René was the first bright thing to catch his eye. He's interested in her. Neil said, not quite a question. Kevin was watching them, too. It doesn't matter. It won't work. Renee told Neil last fall that Ravens weren't allowed to date. Tetsuji didn't want his team distracted from the game. Renee knew that, but she was over there anyway. Neil might be overthinking her intentions, but he was willing to exploit any angle they could find. Maybe not, Neil said, but it could give us an edge. Do you still know his number? Give it to her and see what she can do between now and finals. Dan and Kevin had agreed beforehand to handle the reporters post-game. Neil was happy to leave them to it and follow his jubilant teammates to the locker room, but he didn't make it far. He was probably eight steps from the bench before a reporter shouted after him, Neil, is it true you're marked for court? The smart thing to do was keep going and pretend he hadn't heard over the sound of the furious crowd, but Neil ground to a halt. He stared straight ahead, weighing all the ways he could and shouldn't respond to that. Finally, he turned back. Rico's presence meant Andrew was sticking close to Kevin, but Andrew's eyes were on Neil after a bold question like that. Neil tipped his head in silent question, and Andrew motioned for him to do as he pleased. Neil undid the straps on his helmet and headed for the trio of reporters. Andrew took Neil's helmet as he passed, and Renee took it from Andrew as she headed to the locker room. Neil tucked his gloves under one arm and stopped beside Kevin. I'm sorry, he said. Did you say something? Rumor has it that you've been invited to the perfect court. The reporter thrust a microphone at him, her eyes on the bandage plastered to Neil's cheekbone with sweat and tape. Care to comment on that? The first time someone had asked about Rico and Kevin's tattoos, Rico hadn't beat around the bush. He was the best striker in the game, he said, and he wanted everyone to know it. The story changed a little when Jean made his first public appearance with a three on his face. Rico was supposedly handpicking the future U.S. national team. He called it the perfect court, and even though it was unofficial and unbelievably arrogant, his talent and upbringing gave some credibility to the idea. Oh, Neil said, you mean this? He peeled the bandage off his face and let the reporters get a good look at his tattoo. One of the reporters snapped at her cameraman to get a close-up, and Neil obediently tilted his face for a better view. He was smiling again, and this time he didn't try to hide it. The reporters were too stupid, or too eager for a story, to read the threat in that expression. Kevin wasn't so blind, and he hissed under his breath in tense French. Don't push him. The urge to choke the life out of Kevin was as fierce as it was fleeting. Neil didn't waste his time looking at Kevin, but addressed the reporters. It's actually impressive, isn't it? I think it's the first time Rico's ever been wrong. He always seemed too thick-headed to admit when he'd made a mistake. You think he made a mistake marking you? A reporter asked. You don't think you deserve the number? Another said at the same time. Neil affected surprise at their misunderstanding. I don't think he deserves us, he said and gestured between himself and Kevin. But that's neither here nor there. What do you mean? Look, I'm going to be honest, Neil said. I know Rico's good. Everyone does. 
His uncle's name has gotten him pretty far in life, and the Ravens have an impressive record, but Rico as a person is hard to respect. Up until December, I figured he was an egocentric maniac who was so desperate for his own glory he refused to see the potential in anyone else. He, of course, assumed I was a know-nothing from nowhere with no right to have an opinion. This Christmas, we tried to meet halfway, Neil said. Rico invited me to practice with the Ravens over the holidays so I could see the discrepancy between our two teams. This is what we walked away with. Neil gestured to the tattoo on his cheekbone. He admitted he was wrong about me and I promised to live up to his expectations. We're never going to be friends and we'll definitely never like each other, but we'll work around each other for as long as we have to. There was a rumor you might transfer to Edgar Allen. It was mentioned while I was there, Neil said, but we both know it'll never happen. I'll never get where I need to be if I play with the Ravens. Besides, I could barely tolerate them for two weeks. I can't imagine playing with them for four years. They're horrible human beings. But you know what? Neil said before the reporters could respond. That's petty. I said I'd be honest, but that was a little too transparent. Let's say this instead. We promised the Ravens a rematch this spring, so I'll cheer them all the way to finals. If Rico didn't think we could meet them there, he wouldn't have marked me or flown halfway across the country to watch us play tonight. He knows we have a chance. He just hasn't figured out yet that we are going to win the next time we meet. Keep an eye on us, won't you? It's going to be an exciting year. Good night, he said when they started to ask him questions. He turned and headed for the locker room like he didn't hear them calling after him. Dan's delighted laughter said she was following him, but he didn't look to see if Andrew and Kevin were with her. The locker room door banged closed behind them, muffling most of the noise from the crowd, and Neil caught the tail end of Kevin's sour complaint. Neil's temper flared hot again, and this time he didn't choke it back. He turned and shoved Kevin into the door as hard as he could. Kevin had the better part of a foot on him and could easily take Neil in a fight, but he was too startled to defend himself. Dan gaped at Neil. Andrew, who'd attacked Matt for hitting Kevin, took a neat step out of the way. Neither of them was going to interfere, so Neil tuned them out in favor of Kevin. Enough, Neil said in fast and furious French. Don't ever try to censor me again. I'm not going to let him dictate how I end this. You are going to bring him down on all of us, Kevin shot back. You don't think. You aren't thinking either. You can't be afraid of him anymore. It's not a switch you turn on and off. You of all people know this. Kevin finally pushed Neil off him, but he didn't try to get past Neil. You did not grow up with him. You do not get to judge me. I'm not judging you. I'm telling you it's past time to stand your ground. What's the point of any of this if you're still his pet at the end of the day? If you really believed in us, if you really believed in yourself, you'd push back. You don't understand. I don't, Neil said hotly. You have a way out. You have a future. So why won't you take it? Why are you so afraid to take it? Just like that, his anger was cracking, breaking a part of the weight of premature grief and too much need. The way Kevin's expression faded from irritated to intense said he heard that hoarse edge in Neil's words. Neil struggled to hold on to his rage and bowled on. When I first found out about the Moriyamas, I stayed because I thought you had a chance. One of us had to make it and I wanted it to be you. But you still believe in that number on your face. What's so important about being second best? Kevin looked at Andrew, not that Andrew could follow any of this argument. It turned out it wasn't a bid for help because Kevin said, When we tried to sign Andrew to the Ravens, he said the same thing. He said I didn't interest him because I made a career of coming second. I don't want this, but I'm not like you. The look Kevin shot Neil was frustrated, but the anger in it was more self-directed than anything. I've always been Rico's. I know more than anyone what happens when you defy a Moriyama. You know... Neil agreed, but they already took everything away from you. What else do you have to lose? Kevin didn't answer. Neil gave him a minute, then turned away. Wymack was waiting at the end of the hall with his arms crossed and an unlit cigarette dangling from his lips. He quirked a brow at Neil as Neil headed his way. I don't know if you recall, but we won, Wymack said. Any particular reason you're trying to kill the good mood? Just a difference of opinions, Neil said as calmly as he could manage. He hesitated halfway through the changing room door and looked back at Wymack. Oh, and sorry in advance about the press. In my defense, they started it. Christ alive, Wymack said. What did you do this time? He called Rico a class one douchebag, Dan said. Not in so many words, but I think they got the message. 
Wymack dug a thumb into his temple. I should have asked for hazard pay when I took this job. Out! 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 I'm not dealing with your attitude problem until I've had a couple drinks. That goes for the rest of you, too. Get out of my sight and get cleaned up. If you're not on the van with your gear in twenty minutes, I'm leaving you here. And hey, he said before they could scatter. Good job tonight. He said they only had twenty minutes, but Neil wasted ten of them in the shower. He turned the water on too hot and didn't care that it scalded his skin. He wrote his name on the tile walls with his fingertips over and over and over until his hand went numb. Chapter 6 The Ravens handled Neil's insults with rude grace. Their only official comment on the matter was that they couldn't care less what a loud-mouthed amateur had to say about them. Neil was a little surprised they stopped there and didn't mock his miserable December performance. Belatedly, he realized they couldn't throw him under the bus when he'd come back to South Carolina with Rico's number on his face. It would undermine Rico's estimation of his worth. Neil went to bed feeling more than a little smug. The fans were less tolerant, and their retaliation started before sunrise Saturday. Pounding on the door startled Neil awake. He looked at the clock first, the dim window second, and scrubbed a hand across tired eyes. The pounding stopped, but Matt's phone started ringing a couple seconds later. Matt rolled over and blindly slapped a hand about for his phone. The pounding started up again, so Neil slung his legs over the side of the bed and went down his ladder. Voices in the hallway were loud enough to carry through the door, muffled but angry. Neil didn't recognize any of them, but as he pulled the door open, he definitely heard the word, "'Cops!' Neil opened his mouth to ask what was going on, but Dan slipped past him as soon as she could fit through the doorway. Neil watched her make a beeline for the bedroom, then leaned into the hall. Doors were open most of the way down, but only a couple athletes stuck around to rant at each other. The rest aimed for the stairwell like their lives depended on it. Neil closed the door and went after Dan. She'd shaken Matt awake and was talking as Neil walked in. Trashed the cars! Matt rolled out of bed and onto his feet in a heartbeat. Neil boosted himself up his ladder enough to grab his keys from under his pillow. Matt slowed just long enough to throw a jacket on over his pajama pants and pull his shoes on. He slapped his jacket pockets until his keys jangled in response. By the time Neil found his shoes, Matt was already gone with Dan close behind him. Neil locked the door and ran after them, catching up on the stairwell. Matt jumped the last flight and slammed the back door open. Neil didn't know what was worse, the sight or the smell. A layer of raw meat, broken eggs, and rocks covered the parking lot and stuck to the athlete's cars. Some cars got by with a couple dings and scratches. Others had cracks and holes in their windows and windshields. Enraged athletes swarmed the parking lot, half of them on their phones, the others raging at the state of their vehicles. Someone had already been inside long enough to get a bucket, and she was steadfastly scrubbing beef off her hood. Squad cars and campus security were on the scene, with a dozen officers taking statements and pictures. Any thought that this wasn't his fault died when Neil spotted Matt's truck. Someone had taken extra time to wreck it. Every window on the cab had been busted clean out, leaving only glittering spikes of glass around the frames. The tires were long deflated from wild slashes. New dents were pounded into the frame for whatever tool the rioters had used on the windows. Allison's car was in the same sorry shape two spots down from Matt's. She stood by the trunk with her arms folded tight across her chest and her face a stony mask. She looked up at their approach, followed Matt's blank stare to his truck, and cut a hard look at Neil. The hell? Matt said in a strangled tone. He reached for his truck, but drew up short, not wanting to actually touch the mess. How did no one hear them? They saved the windows for last, Allison said. She jerked her chin to indicate the men standing across the row from them. Paris called the police when he heard glass break, but he couldn't get down here fast enough to see any faces. Just a lot of cars peeling out of here, he said. At least four, maybe five. Oh, Jesus. Matt made another aborted reach for his truck, then settled for raking his hands through his hair. Dan pressed herself up against his back and wound her arms around him. He held tight to her wrists. Are we really gonna do this again? I'm sorry, Neil said. 
Allison curled her lip at him in scorn. Shut up. No, you're not. You're not, she insisted when Neil opened his mouth to argue. It sounded less like an accusation and more like an order, so Neil reluctantly subsided. Have you forgotten who has to paint you back together every morning? If you'd let them steamroll you yesterday after all of this, she flicked her fingers up at her own face, I would hate you. You told them the truth, Dan said. It's not your fault they don't like it. I don't want this fight coming back on you, Neil said. Too late for that now, but whatever, Allison said. She was going for lofty, but Neil could still see the anger in every tense line of her when she surveyed her car again. They want to break my toy? So what? I'll buy another one. Maybe I'll buy two. Fuck them if they think this will hurt me. Hey, Matt said, low but urgent. Neil followed the unsubtle jerk of his chin to the back door. It apparently was Renee's job to break the news to Andrew, because Renee was now leading Andrew down the back steps into the chaos. Andrew's car was further back in the parking lot and a couple rows over, but Andrew followed Renee to the upperclassmen first. Andrew stopped at Neil's side to inspect the damage. Neil, in turn, studied his face, but there was nothing to see. Andrew looked as unimpressed with this as he did with everything else. Renee hooked an arm through Allison's and gave her a hand a short squeeze. I'm sorry. Has anyone called Coach yet? Neil asked. He called us, Dan said. The cops are notifying all the coaches and getting them down here to help corral us. He should be here any minute. Andrew hummed and turned away. Allison nudged Renee in silent permission to abandon her for Andrew, but Renee glanced over her shoulder at Neil. Neil nodded and went after Andrew. He'd only been out here a couple minutes, but the crowd in the parking lot had tripled in size in that time. Despite Allison's tart support, Neil couldn't look anyone else in the face. These athletes had done nothing to earn the Ravens' disfavor. They were collateral damage, suffering now because Neil couldn't keep his mouth shut. It had never bothered him before. Caring about the Foxes was unexpected, but easily explained due to long exposure. Feeling guilty over these strangers' misfortunes was new and uncomfortable. Every strident voice was a knife on Neil's nerves, and he hated it. Luckily, or not, they reached Andrew's car then, and Neil could stop thinking about everyone else for a minute. Neil looked up from the asphalt when Andrew stopped, and his mouth fell open in silent disbelief. The Ravens fans hadn't stopped with Andrew's tires and windows, and they hadn't settled for simple dings. It looked like they'd taken a sledgehammer to the entire frame, pounding fist-deep craters throughout the entire vehicle. Red spray paint across what was left of the mangled hood screamed, Traitor! The front seats were shredded, as were the back, as far in as people could reach their knives through the non-existent windows. Someone had burst compost bags in the back seat. Everything from leftovers to coffee filters and chicken bones were piled a foot deep on the cushions. On top of the reeking mountain was a dead fox. An anguished wail jarred Neil from his shock. He shot a quick look to his left and saw Nicky had shown up with Aaron and Kevin in tow. Nicky looked devastated as he took in the car's wretched state. Aaron looked like he'd been sucker-punched. Kevin had a hand over his nose and mouth to block out the smell, but his green eyes were wide. It took him only a moment to notice Neil's attention, and the look he sent Neil was clear. I warned you. Neil clenched his teeth and tore his gaze away. Nicky stumbled over to the car and pressed unsteady hands to the misshapen hood. No, 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 he said piteously. What did they do to you, baby? What did... Is that a dead animal? Oh, Jesus, Aaron, there's a dead animal in our car. I'm gonna be sick. Aaron inched closer and leaned over to look inside. He cursed at the sight waiting for him and was quick to retreat. He hit his nose in the crook of his elbow as he gave the car another once-over, then glowered at Neil. Neil knew what was coming before Aaron even dropped his arm to speak. You had to just open your mouth, didn't you? I'm sorry, Neil said. I thought he'd come at me. I didn't think you'd get caught up in it. Right, Aaron said snidely. Seth was a one-off then? Neil flinched so hard he took a step back. He opened his mouth to argue, but he couldn't defend himself against an accusation like that. It turned out he didn't have to. He hadn't realized the upperclassmen had come around to check on them, but Allison was past Neil in a heartbeat, and she backhanded Aaron hard enough to nearly knock him down. 
She might have taken another swing, except Andrew moved like lightning. He caught her wrist to wrench her arm up behind her back and gave a violent twist to slam her to her knees. As she fell, his other hand came up and seized the back of her neck. It forced her head down when she landed and kept her from getting up again. Allison tried to say something but managed only a sick choke under his fierce grip. Renee was almost as fast. Maybe she'd started moving when she realized Allison was going for Aaron. She didn't waste her time tackling Andrew, but threw herself atop Allison's fallen form. She wrapped her arms around Allison, comfort and support or a fierce warning to stay still, and stared up at Andrew's blank face. Somewhere behind them, someone was calling, Whoa, whoa! as he noticed the short but vicious scuffle, but Neil was more aware of Renee's quiet but insistent, Andrew, it's just Allison, okay? It's just Allison. It is not just anyone when she lays a hand on what's mine, Andrew said. Let go! You know I won't, Renee said. You told me to protect them. You failed, Andrew said. You should have been faster. Damn it, Andrew, Matt said with a ferocity that was more fear than anger. Matt looked like it was killing him to stay put. Neil was glad for that self-control. There was no telling what Andrew would do if Matt challenged him right now. Dan stood white-faced and frozen at Matt's side, her wide eyes on Allison. Nicky was too afraid to go after Andrew, so he slowly dropped to his knees and slid a hand across the asphalt. He curled his fingers around Allison's and gave her hand a tight squeeze. Neil looked to Kevin, who'd gone still as stone, then Aaron. Aaron's expression was torn, a heavy mix of outrage at Allison and fear over what his brother might do. Neil didn't know what side of the fence he'd come down on, but Neil couldn't rely on him to intervene. Andrew, Renee said, give her back to me. They were drawing too much attention now. In another moment, someone was going to stand up where the foxes wouldn't, and Andrew would react to that threat in the worst possible way. Neil had maybe ten seconds to make this ride and no idea where to start. Andrew wasn't worried about hurting Allison, so Neil couldn't exactly appeal to his better nature. The last time Andrew looked a breath away from killing someone, Neil had used Kevin as a distraction. That wouldn't work this time, but maybe... Neil hesitated, then gave up second-guessing. "'That's enough!' he said in German. He was close enough to grab Andrew, but Andrew had warned him he didn't like being touched. He held his hand out over Renee's head instead and waited for Andrew to flick it a hooded look. Satisfied he had Andrew's attention, Neil said again, That's enough, Andrew. You don't get to decide that. If you hurt her, you disqualify us, Neil said. The ERC won't let us play with eight people. Your single-mindedness is as nauseating as always. You promised, Neil insisted, bending the truth until it almost broke. You said you'd stop cutting them off at the knees. You said you'd cooperate at least until we destroyed the Ravens in finals. Were you lying to me? I didn't promise that, Andrew said. You promised to have my back this year, Neil said, and I told you where I was going. It's all the same at this point whether you want it to be or not. So do you have my back or don't you? Andrew. Neil insisted when Andrew didn't answer fast enough. Look at me. Andrew's mouth gave a violent twitch, a grimace he forcibly repressed, and he finally looked up. The darkness in his stare almost took Neil's breath away. Fast on the heels of shock was a bolt of triumph. Andrew had been back from East Haven for almost two weeks, and this was the first sign that there was anything real going on behind that blank mask. Neil would have preferred to see the real Andrew under safer circumstances, but knowing he could be reached was a desperate relief. Fuck you, Andrew said. The edge in his voice had every hair on Neil's arm standing on end. Neil held Andrew's stare, silently daring that anger to break against him instead of Allison. Do you or don't you? Neil asked again. I made him a promise too, Andrew said. I won't break his to keep yours. Neil didn't understand, but Aaron was finally startled into choosing a side. Andrew, that's... he faltered, and Neil wished he dared look away from Andrew to see Aaron's expression. Every hint of anger had vanished from Aaron's voice. He sounded almost lost. Andrew didn't look at him, but the slight tilt of his head toward Aaron said he was listening. No, Andrew. No, it's all right. I'm all right. It didn't even hurt. Neil filed that away to ask about later. He was afraid he already knew what the answer would be.
He hoped he was wrong, because if he found out Aaron really was that stupid, he was probably going to choke the life out of him. Andrew stared at Neil for another endless moment, then relaxed his death grip on Allison and let her collapse, gasping to the asphalt. With the immediate threat out of the way, Neil expected retribution from Dan or Matt. He put his hand out toward them to warn them off, just in case. He couldn't stop them if they really wanted to get past him, but luckily they obeyed his silent order to stay put. At their feet, Renee buried muffled reassurances against Allison's hair. Allison's response was too hoarse to understand, but she let Renee help her to her feet. Renee turned her away and guided her to Dan and Matt. They were quick to take her in their arms, holding her up between them. Renee stood back a bit, a quiet but physical barricade between the upperclassmen and Andrew. Neil risked a glance at Aaron. Aaron was staring at Andrew like he'd never seen him before. When Dan was sure Allison was all right, she shot Andrew a look that should have flayed the skin from his bones. You asshole! You could have seriously hurt her! You do not have the right to act surprised, Andrew said. The fury was gone from his eyes, his expression was back to its dead slate, and his shoulders were relaxed. He sounded bored again, like none of this had happened or mattered. That is the second time in as many weeks one of you has forgotten yourself. You should have learned your lesson the first time. You do not get to take offense when you force my hand. This isn't... A booming voice cut Dan off. What the fuck is going on here? Neil's heart almost punched a hole through his ribcage. He'd been so intent on Andrew, he hadn't heard why Max approach. He darted a look over his shoulder, but had to quickly look away from the anger on Wymac's face. Wymac raked his team with a glare and waited for them to recover. Dan was the first to find her voice again. Nothing, she said, a heated and obvious lie. Just rethinking every time we defended our decision to recruit the monsters. Hey! Nicky said, too uncomfortable to sound offended. He winced when Dan glowered at him, but persisted with, Andrew might have overreacted, but he has a point. She did start it. Don't even try to justify it, Matt said. You don't return a punch with a broken neck. Where you come from, maybe not, Andrew said. The real world, Matt said, heavy with sarcasm. Don't, Andrew said with a calm Neil didn't believe for a second. Andrew tapped his finger to his lips twice, warning Matt to silence, and pointed at him. A privileged child like you has never seen the real world. Don't speak of it like you understand. Enough, Wymax said and snapped his fingers at the upperclassmen. Where are you parked? Dan gestured over her shoulder, too angry to answer aloud. Wymax pointed. Go wait with your cars. I'll be there in two seconds. Go, I said. He waited until they'd squeezed between cars to get back to their row, then turned a stony stare on Andrew's lot. His gaze landed on Neil last. No one answered my question. What the fuck is going on? There was no point lying when the upperclassmen were going to tell Wymac everything, so Neil summed it up as succinctly as he could. Allison hit Aaron, so Andrew hit back. Wymac closed his eyes, pinched the bridge of his nose. He was obviously trying not to snap on them, not wanting to reignite an awful situation, but it took an age before he dropped his hand. Andrew, we're going to talk about this. No, I am going to talk about this, and you are going to listen. Today, but not now. After the rest of this chaos has been sorted out, do you understand? Wymac gave Andrew a minute to acknowledge that, then said, I didn't hear you. You'll talk. I'll listen, Andrew said and even Neil wasn't sure if he was agreeing or summarizing Wymac's demands. I'm going to check on them, Wymac said. I'll be right back. When I come back, we are going to focus on the real problem and the real enemy. Is that clear? Crystal, Nicky said weakly. Yes, coach, Neil said. Wymac stomped off, and Andrew's lot waited in silence for his return. Neil looked between Andrew and Aaron. Andrew, like Nicky, had turned his attention back on the mangled car. Aaron was still looking at Andrew as if the answer to the universe was just out of reach. Kevin had stayed out of the way during the entire fight, but now he finally edged forward and took up a post at Andrew's side. Wymac was gone for a while, but he eventually made it back to them. He'd meant it when he said they were putting the Fox's fight on hold. He didn't say another word about Andrew's violence or Allison's safety. Instead, he gave Andrew's car a long look and shook a cigarette into his hand. 
Andrew put an expectant hand out as soon as it was lit. Wymack handed it over without hesitation and lit himself another. Well, Wymack said, at least you upgraded your insurance policy last year. Fat lot of good that does us. Nicky jammed his hands in his pockets and towed the car's bent bumper. This mess can't be fixed. Even if they ripped out and replaced the entire interior, I couldn't get back into it without getting the heebie-jeebies. Did you see the dead fox, coach? They put a dead animal in our car. Ugh! Pigs, Aaron said. Neil was lost for the second it took him to notice the cops. They were only two cars down from Andrews now. Neil didn't tense up at the sight of them, but it was a near thing. He dragged his stare away without trying to be obvious, but the view wasn't much better in the other direction. Cameras, too, he said. At some point, the police had cordoned off the parking lot and made a checkpoint for the arriving coaches. Two press vans were stopped outside the line, and reporters were snapping shots of the dismal scene. The cops made it to them a few minutes later. One made a slow lap, jotting down the license plate number and presumably writing out descriptions of the extensive damage. On his second lap, he had a camera out, and he shooed the foxes out of his way with an impatient hand so he could get good shots. The other cop swept them with a tired look, pen poised above his notepad, and said, Whose car is this? Ours, Nicky said, raising a hand. Well, it's in Andrew's name, but I'm on the insurance policy, too. We're cousins, see? Nicky Hemmick and Andrew Minyard, room 317. You need the registration or anything, I can tell you where to find it, but I'd really rather not reach in and get it for you. Look inside the car and you'll understand why. No, really, look inside. The cop spared a glance for the car but said nothing about its sorry state. Neil guessed he'd stopped caring about sixty angry athletes ago. All he said was, Did you see or hear anything unusual last night or this morning? Friday night on a college campus, Nicky said with an apologetic shrug. You learn to tune things out if you want to get any sleep. Besides, our room faces the front of the building. What about you? The cop asked Aaron. No, Aaron said. The cop looked to Andrew last. Andrew gazed back in unimpressed silence and took a slow drag off his cigarette. Nicky only gave him a couple seconds before answering for him. He found out when I did. Renee stopped by and woke us up when she heard the news. Uh, Renee's our teammate. At the look the cops sent him for speaking up, Nicky shrugged. Yeah, sorry. Andrew doesn't talk to cops. It's a long story and completely irrelevant. What else do you need to know? The cop only had a couple more questions, some of which he aimed at Andrew, despite Nicky's warning, the rest of which he split between Nicky and Aaron. Andrew stopped paying attention to the interview before long and let his gaze wander. Nicky filled in the gaps as quickly as he could, and eventually the cops moved on. A couple insurance agents showed up from local offices to get a first-hand look at the mess and touch base with whichever athletes were their clients. The woman representing Andrew's agency must have brought a cheat sheet with her, because she greeted the cousins by name and expressed sympathy for going through this a second time. While she chattered and took notes and pictures of her own, tow trucks rolled onto the scene and began the slow process of hauling every car to repair shops. We're footing the bill for rental cars and vans for a week, Wymack said when she trotted off to her next client. I'll get the two we need sometime today. It might take the shop a while to get around to you, he gestured, indicating the enormity of the task awaiting the local crews. So let me know as soon as you get an ETA. I can extend the cars if I have to. Yes, coach, Nicky said. You good here for a minute? Wymack asked, and at their nods went in search of the rest of his team. There wasn't much left to do then but wait. It took the cops over an hour to get through everyone and the tow trucks longer to make a noticeable dent in their workload. Wymack came back when the cops were done talking to Allison and Matt. The upperclassmen weren't far behind him, to Neil's surprise. Dan and Matt still looked a little angry, but they all looked more tired than anything. Allison made a point of meeting Andrew's gaze, a silent declaration of defiance and fearlessness. Andrew and I are going to pick up some lunch for everyone, Wymack said. Any preferences? Neil doubted anyone was hungry after drowning in the parking lot stench all morning, but no one was going to pass down free food. They took an unenthusiastic vote and Andrew followed Wymack away. The foxes were left staring after them in awkward silence. Finally, Neil risked a look at Allison. He opened his mouth, needing and wanting to say what he should have said months ago. 
But all this time later, he still didn't have the right words. Thank you, Allison said stiffly. It was so undeserved, Neil was stung into saying, I'm sorry. It was woefully inadequate for what he'd cost her, what he'd cost all of them by deciding to stay, but it was all he had. The look Allison sent him said she knew what he was trying to apologize for. She pursed her lips like she wasn't sure what response she wanted to waste on him. Before she could make up her mind, Dan spoke. We knew when we signed you there were going to be problems, she said, looking from Aaron to Nikki. We took you in despite the rumors and the protests because we believed in you. We've defended you and stood by you and forgiven a lot of shit no one else would have understood. We've tried to be your teammates and tried to be your friends and have reached out to you over and over and over again. But there is a line here where it all stops. If you ever cross it again, we are done. You will not, will not, she said again with fierce emphasis, hurt another person on this team again. Do you understand? Nikki's characteristic cheer was gone. He looked almost defeated as he glanced between Dan and Allison. I understand, and you're right, but I'm sorry. I can't promise anything. Andrew's... Andrew. We can't predict him or control him. He can, Matt said, jerking his chin at Neil. Why can't you? Fewer survival instincts? Nicky guessed, but his attempt at humor fell flat. More, Neil corrected, knowing Nicky wouldn't understand. Matt turned on Neil, expression intense. Even Renee wasn't getting through to him. What did you say to him to make him stop? If you're not there next time, someone else needs to know how to talk him down from the edge. Neil couldn't explain without getting into things that weren't their business. Don't let there be a next time. Neil, I'm serious, Matt said. Neil shook his head. So am I. Allison, Kevin said. Did he hurt you? Allison knew Kevin too well to think he was concerned for her well-being. She sent him an impatient glare and didn't answer. Kevin interpreted the silence how he liked and sent a considering look at Neil. After a moment, he reached out and covered Neil's tattoo with his thumb. The result made him frown, not in disappointment but confusion, and Kevin dropped his hand again. Neil waited, but Kevin said nothing. We're going in. Dan said, and the dejected foxes trudged inside. Aaron, Kevin, and Nicky disappeared into their room. Neil put a hand in the doorway before Nicky could close it behind them. The women were following Matt to his room further down, but it only took them a moment to realize they'd lost Neil. Neil held up a finger to promise he'd be right over and slipped past Nicky. Nicky closed and locked it as soon as Neil was safe inside. Aaron dropped into one of the beanbag chairs and didn't bother to look up when Neil stopped in front of him. Neil shoved his hands in his pockets so he wouldn't use them on Aaron and sank to a crouch. Aaron curled his lip at Neil, unapologetic and defiant. Neil clenched his hands into fists. He tried counting to ten in his head, but only made it to six. Tell me you're not that stupid, Neil said. This isn't your room, Aaron said. Get out. What did he promise you? Neil demanded, ignoring that. He didn't say he'd keep you safe. If he had, he wouldn't have let Kevin stay last year. So who did he promise to protect you from? He gave Aaron a minute to cooperate before guessing. He moved back in the house and found out your mother was beating you. He said if you couldn't defend yourself against a woman, he'd have to, didn't he? All you had to do in exchange was stick with him until graduation. It doesn't matter. Obviously it does, Neil snapped. Aaron scowled but gave up denying it. You've always known why he killed your mother. Why did you make me spell it out for you? No, Aaron argued immediately. That had nothing to do with me. He made that promise his second night home with us, but he waited five months to kill Mom. You didn't see the bruises she left on him when she thought he was me that night. Andrew didn't care that she hurt him. He cared that she hurt you. It only took him that long because accidents take time to plan. You don't know that. I do. So would you if you'd paid attention to how he treated you in Columbia, Neil said. You knew before I did why he turned on Allison today. The only one who can stop this is you. Figure out what you have to do, what you have to forgive, to make him let you go. He slammed the door behind him on his way out, but stood frozen in the hallway. He knew better than to go back to the upperclassmen in a mood like this. This wasn't the time or place for it. Not with the team already so fragile, but Neil's temper had never had good timing. He wasn't even sure who he was angrier at. 
Aaron for being so impossibly blind, or himself for not putting the pieces together sooner. It didn't help that he was still mad at Nicky and Kevin for being so useless. He couldn't calm down, so he did the only thing he could. He took the stairs to the ground floor and went for a run. He wasn't aiming for the court, but he inevitably wound up there. He dropped his keys by the home bench when he passed and ran the stadium steps. Halfway through, he finally outran his thoughts. He stopped feeling, stopped being Neil, stopped being anything but a body in motion. He walked it off afterward in the inner ring. Every shuddering breath was too hot in his strained lungs, but Neil finally felt normal again. He collected his keys on his way out and locked up behind himself. It was a slow walk back to Fox Tower, and he took the stairs to the third floor. Matt was on the couch in their room, Dan to one side and Renee to the other. Allison had claimed one of the desks. They all looked to the door when he walked in, and from the looks on their faces, Neil got the feeling he'd interrupted an important conversation. He held up a hand on his way to the bathroom, a silent apology for bad timing and a promise he was going to be out of earshot in the shower momentarily. "'Lunch is in the fridge,' Matt said. "'Coach dropped it off while you were gone. Neil had forgotten all about it. Thank you.' He opened his closet to dig out clothes, but hesitated at the sight of his safe. He crouched to run his fingers over the lock, thoughts spinning a million miles an hour. He wondered how much the insurance company would cover toward repairs for his teammates' cars. Even if it couldn't cover everything, Allison and Matt had enough money to pick up the rest. The cousins didn't have that kind of cash, and their car was nearly as expensive as Allison's was. Nicky had already predicted they'd get bad news back on it. The tap of a shoe on thin carpet distracted him. He leaned back out of the closet to look. Allison was standing in the doorway, expression guarded, and arms folded across her chest. Neil still didn't know what to say to her, but he had to try. I'm sorry. He didn't deserve it. Allison was silent for an eternity, then said, You already said it. If we got what we deserved, we wouldn't be foxes. His words sounded callous when applied to Seth's death. Neil winced, but Allison shrugged and looked away. Maybe it's better like this. If he'd done it to himself, I'd live knowing I'd never gotten through to him. At least this way there's someone else to take the blame. Andrew told you about Rico? I've known since it happened, Allison said. The monster stopped by Abby's house before the funeral to ask me about Seth's medicine. He told me his theory to make sure I got back on the court. Neil thought about Allison returning to the game too soon after Seth's death and the way Andrew stopped by her side on his way to goal. He thought it suspicious at the time that Andrew would offer any sort of support. Maybe Andrew had been reminding her to get angry. Allison stopped speaking to Neil for weeks after Seth's overdose. Neil thought her withdrawal was because of her grief. He'd welcomed the cold shoulder, unsure how to approach her with his guilty conscience. If she'd always known Andrew's theory, though, she'd always known Neil was partly to blame. Maybe that was why Andrew got involved. He'd already taken Neil under his protection by then, so he needed to make sure Allison wasn't going to be a problem for them. Somewhere along the way, she'd forgiven him and Neil hadn't even realized it. I should have said something sooner, I just didn't... Neil gestured, helpless and lost and awful. I don't know how to talk to people about the important things. We noticed... Allison shrugged like it was no big deal, when they both knew it was. You're a real piece of work. One of these days, you're gonna tell me why. She went back to the other room, leaving Neil alone with his thoughts and secrets. Chapter 7 Neil was on his way out of the bedroom after his shower when his phone buzzed. He patted his pockets, found them empty, and dug his cell phone out from under his pillow. Two messages were waiting for him. One from Nikki, time-stamped almost an hour ago, and the more recent one from Caitlin. Caitlin's was just a desperate, What happened? that Neil didn't waste his time answering. Nikki's was a heads-up that Andrew was back. It seemed redundant, since if Wymac had brought them food, of course he'd have dropped Andrew off as well. Knowing Nikki it was a veiled plea to get involved and make sure everything was okay. Neil stuffed his phone in his back pocket and left his room without a word to anyone. Nicky answered his knock within seconds and didn't have to ask why Neil was there. He took a bottle and left again, Nicky said. Don't know where he went. 
There wasn't far Andrew could go with an open bottle of liquor in hand and no car. With Coach? Don't think so, Nicky said. Aaron left too, right after you did. Neil didn't care what Aaron did. He nodded and left, and Nicky didn't call after him. Neil took the stairs up to the roof and fought the knob the way he'd seen Andrew jar it loose. It only needed a couple tries before he got it open and he stepped out onto the windy rooftop. Andrew was sitting on the back end of the roof this time. The handle of vodka at his knee looked empty from here, but Neil saw sunlight flash off a little bit of liquid as he headed for Andrew. Neil quieted the instinctive thump of his heart as he got so close to the edge and helped himself to a spot just out of Andrew's reach. He looked out at the ruins of the parking lot. There were still a dozen cars left, but a crew was already scrubbing the asphalt clean. The police were gone, leaving one of campus security's teams behind to supervise and the press had vanished. Andrew flicked his pack of cigarettes at Neil. Give me one good reason to not push you off the side. Neil shook a stick out and lit it. I'll drag you with me. It's a long way down. I hate you, Andrew said, but it was hard to believe him when he sounded so bored by the concept. Andrew took a swig from the bottle and swiped his mouth clean with a thumb. The look he slanted Neil was both unimpressed and unconcerned. Ninety percent of the time, the very sight of you makes me want to commit murder. I think about carving the skin from your body and hanging it out as a warning to every other fool who thinks he can stand in my way. What about the other ten? Neil asked. Andrew ignored that. I warned you not to put a leash on me. I didn't, Neil said. You put that leash on yourself when you told me to stay no matter what. Don't be mad at me just because I was smart enough to pick up the other end of it. If you pull it again, I will kill you. Maybe when the year is up, you will, Neil said. Right now, there's not a lot you can do about it, so don't waste our time threatening me. I don't think it was the money, Andrew said, and elaborated at Neil's questioning look. Why they chased you so long? I imagine at some point they realized it was far more important to hurt you than to recoup anything they'd lost. So you say... But you still won't hit me. Andrew stubbed his cigarette out between them. The time is fast approaching. Neil studied his face, looking for a hint of the earlier fathomless anger and finding nothing. Despite Andrew's unfriendly words, his expression and tone were calm. He said these things like they meant nothing to him. Neil didn't know if it was a mask or the truth. Was Andrew hiding that rage from Neil or from himself? Maybe the monster was buried where neither of them could find it until Neil crossed another unforgivable line. Good, Neil said at length. Tugging a sleeping dragon's tail sounded like a good way to die a painful death, but Neil would be dead before Andrew's protection wore off. I want to see you lose control. Andrew went still with his hand halfway to the vodka. Last year you wanted to live. Now you seem hell-bent on getting killed. If I felt like playing another round with you right now, I would ask you why you've had a change of heart. As it stands, I've had enough of your stupidity to last me a week. Go back inside and bother the others now. Neil feigned confusion as he got to his feet. Am I bothering you? Beyond telling. Interesting, Neil said. Last week you said nothing gets under your skin. Andrew didn't waste his breath responding, but Neil counted it as a victory. He tossed his cigarette into the wind and went back inside alone. He took the stairs to the third floor but didn't make it more than a couple steps down the hall before the elevator opened. Looking back was instinctive. Neil had one second to recognize Aaron and another to register the fury on his face. Then Aaron slammed into him like a freight train and crushed him up against the wall. Neil took a glancing blow to his cheek and a harder punch in the mouth before he wrestled Aaron off of him. Neil landed a good hit high in Aaron's gut as Aaron jumped him again and then heavy hands ripped them away from each other. Neil darted a quick look around at the intervention. The fight had drawn a quick crowd from the nearest rooms. He knew these faces from passing them enough times in the hallway and stairwell. He knew their names and teams despite his best efforts to not learn anything about them. Aaron made a violent attempt to get free then settled for glowering at Neil across the hall. Neil tested his own restraints, found them equally unforgiving, and prodded the inside of his mouth with his tongue. He chomped his cheek when Aaron punched him, and the first swallow wasn't enough to get rid of the taste of blood. Cool it, Ricky warned, with his hands out toward both of them. We've got enough trouble to deal with right now without your bullshit. We're good, 
Neil said. Aaron wasn't keen on letting other people into his business, so Neil expected him to play along until they were alone. He underestimated how angry Aaron was. Instead of waiting for privacy, Aaron tore at him in furious German. Fuck you! What the fuck did you tell her? The harsh sounds caught the other athletes off guard, giving Neil enough time to respond. There was only one her that could get Aaron this riled. Neil regretted not answering Caitlin's text, but he just shrugged nonchalant, said Aaron. Why, did she finally make up her mind? What happened? You showed up at her door to complain about the car and got an ultimatum in response? You should know. Hey, Ricky said. Calm down, we said. Neil ignored him. I told her to make a stand. I never went back and asked her if she found her spine. For what it's worth, I did it before I found out how specific Andrew's promise was. I might have been a little more considerate if I'd known how stupid you were. You had no right to drag her into this. Dorm doors weren't made to be soundproof, and the loud German finally got the fox's attention. Nicky was the first out into the hallway, but the upperclassmen weren't far behind him. Soccer players stepped aside to let them closer, but Dan and Matt held back to watch. Neil expected a lecture, but Dan looked from one to the other and said nothing. Neil didn't know if she was too surprised they were making a spectacle to intervene, or if she was still mad at Aaron for whatever role he'd played in Allison's close call. Nicky got as close to Aaron as he could and sent a bewildered look at Neil. Do I want to know? he asked in German. Aaron made another rough attempt to get free. This time, Amal let him go, though he kept his hands out in case Aaron went after Neil again. Aaron took a half-step back instead, like he couldn't stand to be this close to Neil. Caitlin's refusing to see me or talk to me until Andrew and I get counseling. Nicky's jaw dropped, but he sounded more admiring than anything. Damn, Neil. Aaron shot him a livid look. Don't you dare take his side. Why not? Nicky asked. It's not like you've ever let me take yours. Aaron shoved Nicky aside and stomped for his room. Nicky grimaced at Neil and went after him. Kevin was standing in the doorway, but he stepped into the hall to let them by. He hadn't understood a word they'd said, but the hard pull of his mouth was displeased. Neil stared back at him, trying to silently convey how little he cared about Kevin's bad mood. Dan motioned to the athletes hanging on to Neil. Thanks. We'll keep an eye on them. Neil was released into her custody and the small crowd slowly dispersed. Dan gestured for Neil to take the lead, so he headed for his room with Matt and Dan on his heels. Renee and Allison were inside still, and they watched Neil's return with interest. Neil wasn't hungry, but eating gave him something to do. It also made him easier to corner. Dan propped her hip against the counter and watched him rummage through the fridge. She was trying to outlast him, Neil thought, but Neil wasn't going to be the first to speak. He popped his takeout container into the microwave, twisted the dial, and returned her heavy stare. Dan managed the silent treatment only until the timer dinged. Are we going to talk about this? She asked. You might want to avoid Aaron for a couple days. That was already the plan, Dan said. What the hell is going on? I'm doing what you asked me to do, Neil said. I'm fixing them. That's not what it looked like. Neil shrugged, poked his noodles, and restarted the timer. If a bone isn't healing straight, you have no choice but to break it. They'll be fine. Matt leaned against the doorframe and arched a brow at Neil. That's not exactly reassuring. From you, fine could mean anything from I'm going to hitchhike across the state to I'm beaten to a bloody pulp, but I can still hold a racket. Did you bet on them? Neil asked, realizing Matt couldn't follow his train of thought. He said, Aaron and Caitlin. Everyone except Andrew bet on them, Matt said. It's not a matter of them working out. It's a matter of when. Neil considered that. Then they'll be fine. Dan didn't look convinced, but she left him to eat in peace and took Matt with her. Neil spent the rest of the afternoon staring at his textbooks instead of getting any real work done. Dinner was delivery because Allison didn't want to see anyone in the dining hall, and dinner was followed by complicated card games and a lot of shots. Dan, Matt, and Allison played like the only way to win was to be the first one tanked. Allison was the first one to nod off, but Matt and Dan didn't last much longer. Allison claimed the couch, so Dan and Matt stumbled into the bedroom to share Matt's bed. Neil straightened the mess they'd made of the living room while Renee fetched an extra blanket from the girls' room. She was back in time to clear away the last of the trash. They washed sticky glasses side by side in the kitchen and were finishing up when Renee spoke. Thank you, she said, for reaching him when I couldn't. 
Neil glanced at her. He asked you to protect them? Renee nodded. Kevin told Andrew the truth about the Moriyamas first. Andrew knew letting Kevin stay could mean serious consequences for the rest of us. He was willing to protect his own against the backlash, but he didn't care enough to fight for the rest of us. He gave them to me instead. She tipped her head to indicate her sleeping friends and held a glass up for inspection. One of the first things I asked him last June was who was keeping you. He said he'd know after a night out in Colombia. Neil took the cup back and gave it a second scrub. He regrets keeping me now, I'm sure. Andrew doesn't believe in regret. He says regret is grounded in shame and guilt, neither of which serves any real purpose. That being said, I tried taking you off his hands at one point. Neil looked at her in surprise. Renee affected an innocent look that for once was not entirely convincing. Andrew refused on the grounds he wouldn't wish you on anyone except a mortician. Drama queen, Neil muttered. Renee gave a quiet laugh and traded him a hand towel for the glass. Neil dried his hands and passed it back. Renee hung the towel off its hook on the front of the fridge and stepped out of the kitchen to survey the living room. Will you be all right here? Renee asked. Neil cocked his head to one side, listening for noises from the bedroom, and heard only silence. I'm fine. He saw her out, locked the door behind her, and headed to bed. Morning came too soon, and with it came more bad news. Wymack called them early to say the campus was defaced. Black paint covered buildings and sidewalks and thick sloshes, and the pond was stained bright red from dye. Rude graffiti tarnished the white outer walls of the foxhole court. Wymack didn't want the team stopping by to see it, but didn't want them hearing about it secondhand either. The facilities department was out and about trying to restore everything as fast as possible. Wymack vowed to shred campus security as soon as he got them on the phone. The second wave of vandalism brought the press running back, and a reporter finally got close enough to Wymack to put a microphone in his face. Wymack was too smart to go after the Ravens, so he settled for attacking the fans. I think it's pathetic, he said. What good do these cowards think they're accomplishing by lashing out at us like this? All they're doing is bringing negative attention and publicity to the team they're trying to defend. It's past time the Ravens spoke out. Edgar Allen's president, Louis Andrich, responded within the hour and made an obligatory appeal to Raven fans to cease such unruly behavior. Tetsuji Moriyama released a harsher statement shortly afterward, condemning the attacks as both insulting and unnecessary. It sounded suspiciously supportive until Moriyama finished with, You cannot house train a dog by beating it a day late. It is not smart enough to correlate action and punishment. You have to discipline it the moment it misbehaves. Leave it to us to correct them on the court. Dan seethed the rest of the day, but Moriyama's words got through to the fans. Monday dawned with no new disasters. Neil almost regretted it because, without outside distractions, the team was free to focus on their internal problems again. Dan and Matt spoke to Neil but ignored the rest of Andrew's group. Allison acted like nothing had happened but noticeably stayed out of Andrew's reach. Aaron didn't so much as look in Neil's direction and wouldn't talk to anyone, Nikki included. Neil expected him to speak up when Neil caught a ride with them to practice, but Aaron was trying to keep Andrew out of the fight for as long as possible. Kevin griped about the rampant discord for forty minutes of afternoon practice, then gave up chewing out his teammates and rounded on Neil. If you cost us our game because you couldn't keep your mouth shut, he didn't finish that threat, assuming Neil could fill in the blanks himself. His expression only darkened when Neil waved him off. This is not the time for your attitude. Stop causing unnecessary problems before you ruin anything else. Neil weighed all the possible responses to that and settled on the simplest. Fuck you. Kevin shoved him like he could push sense into Neil. Neil shoved back with everything he had and sent Kevin careening into Matt. Luckily, Matt had been watching the short argument. He stumbled under Kevin's sudden weight but didn't fall and grabbed Kevin to stop him from going after Neil. Neil pointed his racket at Kevin in warning and strode for half-court. He knew Kevin tried coming after him because he heard Matt's fierce warning to knock it off. By the time Neil reached the half-court line, Dan had gotten involved. It took several minutes of angry threats to calm Kevin down, but the questionable peace only lasted because Kevin and Neil resorted to ignoring each other. As soon as they were dismissed for break, Neil went to the locker room for a drink. 
Wymack followed him up and stood just inside the back door. He planted his hands on his hips and stared Neil down across the room. I'm really interested to know how this went from an us-and-them feud to an all-out war, Wymack said. Popular opinion is it's your fault. That true? I had good intentions, Neil said. I don't care what your intentions were, Wymack said. We can't afford to lose Friday's game, not after what they did to us and especially not after what Coach Moriyama said. I don't know if you've noticed, but we're not exactly in winning shape right now. I know, Neil said. I'm sorry about the timing, but I'm not sorry for anything I said. I don't want your apologies. I want this fixed as soon as possible, Wymack said. Yes, Coach. Neil started for the door to return to the inner ring, but Wymack put a hand out to stop him and said, Speaking of timing, how's your mental clock doing? Does having a set schedule again help any? Not as much as having them all here does, Neil said. I'm not alone enough to get lost. Good, Wymack said. Now come on. Let's see if we can't salvage this mess. Neil followed him back to the inner ring. His teammates had dispersed in his short absence. Matt, Dan, and Allison had claimed one of the Vixen's benches. Kevin stood alone near the court wall, Wymax clipboard in hand, and rummaged through the day's notes. Nicky lounged on the steps leading into the stands, and Neil spotted Aaron about twenty rows up. Andrew and Renee were making their usual laps around the inner ring and hadn't gotten far. Neil didn't feel like dealing with anyone else yet, so he went after the goalies. Renee spotted him as they rounded the first corner and motioned for Andrew to wait. Neil had excuses ready if they asked why he was invading their space, but Renee greeted his arrival with a brilliant smile, and Andrew acknowledged him with an unconcerned glance. They set off again at a lazy pace as soon as Neil caught up. Neil had wondered what the two talked about when they were away from everyone else. The last thing he expected was for them to be discussing Exy. Renee wanted to switch which halves they played now that Andrew wasn't limited by his withdrawal. Their opponents were going to get more challenging every week, and Andrew was the stronger goalkeeper. She wanted him to pick up the slack when their teammates wound down in second half. Andrew accepted her suggestion without argument, and Renee moved on. What started as a normal conversation quickly spiraled out of hand, and Neil had no idea how they went from the construction work on the far side of campus grounds to a likely starting point for World War III. There had to be a correlation between the two, but as hard as he racked his brain, he couldn't find one. Eventually, he gave up, because trying to make sense of the jump meant he couldn't actually listen to their argument. Rene expected it to start over resources, particularly water shortages, whereas Andrew was convinced the U.S. government would get involved in the wrong conflict and draw vicious retaliation. There wasn't enough time left in break for either one of them to win the other over, and since Neil wouldn't play tiebreaker, they set the debate aside for another day. Wymack called his team to the home bench and restarted practice with a blistering pep talk. He got through to the upperclassmen first. When he cast them onto the court for scrimmages, Dan swallowed her resentment long enough to pull Aaron and Nikki aside. She and Matt had a couple ideas they wanted the backliners to try, so they held an impromptu powwow on the first fourth line. Aaron listened because he had to, but he didn't look at Dan and didn't say anything. Tuesday was fractionally better, but that was only because Dan's group was making an active effort to get along with everyone. Aaron was unmoved by their act. Nicky clung desperately to any hint of warmth he could get, and Andrew was his usual uninterested self on the outskirts. Kevin spent an hour tearing into the cousins, then directed all his angry energy at whipping the upperclassmen into shape. He spared only a few caustic words for Neil, and Neil wasted no words at all on Kevin. When Wymack dismissed them for a break, Andrew immediately set off down the length of the court wall. Renee glanced at Neil. Neil wasn't sure it was an invitation until he turned toward her and got an approving smile. He was keenly aware that they were attracting attention as they set off after Andrew, but Neil didn't look back at anyone. There was a good chance the others didn't want him hanging out with the goalies, and it wasn't because it meant he and Kevin were still on the outs. The Foxes might be leery of Andrew and Renee's friendship, but there was over $300 in the pot on their would-be relationship working out. Neil distracted them from each other. Neil harbored no such illusions about Renee's chances. Besides, Renee did a good enough job distracting herself. She faded out of the conversation several times to check her phone and tap out quick messages. Neil picked up a little of the slack because they were planning evacuation routes and critical supply stops in case of a zombie invasion. 
Surviving on the run was Neil's forte, and, even though it was a ridiculous scenario, it was interesting to see how his priorities compared with theirs. Rene stressed the importance of collecting survivors, which Andrew shot down immediately. You wouldn't go back for anyone? Rene asked. Andrew turned his hand over. I can count them on one hand. I think Coach would be good in a fight, Rene said as they passed the benches again. Wymack glanced their way, hearing his name, but only needed a moment to realize they weren't talking to him. He's got a weapons permit, too. He sold the gun when I kept breaking into his apartment, Andrew said. What about Abby? What are you to she to me? Andrew asked. You can't bandage a zombie bite, and she wouldn't let us execute the infected. Besides, Coach wouldn't let her leave his sight. Let him keep her safe as long as he can. Rene conceded the point with a nod, and the conversation moved on to less crazy ideas. It stuck with Neil, though, and he tuned out their next debate. He wondered what he'd do it if an invasion really happened. Neil was used to cutting all ties and hitting the ground running. Chances were it'd be instinctive to abandon all of them if the undead put in a ravenous appearance. It wasn't exactly an uplifting realization, but Neil could accept the ugly truths about himself. Oh, Rene said, checking her newest message. Excuse me. She cut away from them and went up the stairs, phone already at her ear. Andrew slanted a look at Neil as they continued on without her. Jean, he said. Care to explain that? I didn't know Kevin passed his number along, Neil said, looking over his shoulder. Rene didn't go far, just up a couple rows where she could make her call in relative privacy. Andrew said nothing, so Neil shrugged. He seemed interested in her when we saw the ravens at the banquet. I'm hoping she can weaken his blind loyalty. Neil thought about it a moment longer, then said, Maybe that's why Matt stopped betting on the two of you. Andrew didn't answer, and they finished the lap in silence. Since Andrew's weekly therapy was no longer mandatory and the foxes were down to two cars, Andrew skipped his Wednesday afternoon session with Dobson. Neil remembered he hadn't talked to Andrew about his insurance policy yet, and he made a mental note to pull Andrew aside at some point. He thought he could sneak time in on break, but the conversation was never at a lull when they passed the benches and Neil couldn't exactly drive Rene off mid-sentence. His chance didn't come until they were back at Fox Tower. Andrew, he said when they piled out of the rental car. Nicky rocked to a stop and sent him a curious look. Kevin and Aaron didn't wait but followed the upperclassmen to the dorm. Neil shook his head at Nicky and, when that subtle dismissal didn't work, said, We'll be up in a minute. Keep an eye on them. Nicky grimaced and turned away. Easier said than done. Neil watched until the last of the foxes disappeared inside, then scanned the parking lot with a slow look. The school had done a good job of putting the place back to order. The only sign that anything bad had happened was that there were fewer cars than usual. The presence of a few trucks and SUVs said some athletes had already started getting their vehicles back, but at least half the cars were unfamiliar. Have you heard back from the shop? Neil asked, dragging his attention back to Andrew. Matt got a call this morning saying his truck would be ready for pickup tomorrow. Allison should have hers back Saturday morning. Can they fix yours? Andrew flipped his phone open, pressed a couple buttons, and handed it over. Neil waited, mystified, until Andrew's voicemail started playing on speaker. A mechanical voice announced Tuesday's date, and a sobering message followed. The damage was even more extensive than it had appeared. The garbage in back had hidden whatever the Ravens fan did to the backseat cushions, and none of them had looked in the trunk before the car was towed. The shop wanted Andrew to call them back to talk about his options and discuss what it would take to restore the car to its former glory. Andrew hoisted himself onto the rental car's trunk and dug a pack of cigarettes out of his pocket. He lit two and traded Neil one for his phone. Neil cupped a hand around his to shield it from the breeze. He studied Andrew's face as Andrew put his phone and cigarettes away, but Andrew gave no sign he was bothered by the bad news. You're gonna have to replace it, Neil guessed. If the insurance company won't cover a replacement for your car, take the difference from me. You know I have enough for it. Andrew slid him a cool look. I'm uninterested in your charity. It isn't charity, Neil said. It's revenge. It wasn't my money in the first place, remember? I told you my father skimmed it from the Moriyamas. If you take some for your car, you're making Rico replace what his fans destroyed. Revenge is a motivator only for the weak-willed, Andrew said. If you believed that, you wouldn't be planning how to kill Proust. The doctor's name still tasted like acid, 
burning Neil's tongue and throat, but it wasn't enough to put a dent in Andrew's calm expression. Andrew gazed at him in silence for what felt like an eternity, then propped his cigarette between his lips and motioned Neil closer. Neil was sure he was stepping forward into a knife for bringing Proust up again, but he obediently closed the short space between them. Andrew caught the back of Neil's neck in a bruising grip to keep him from retreating. He pulled Neil's head toward him and blew smoke in Neil's face. This is not revenge, Andrew said. I warned him what I would do to him if he touched me. This is me keeping my word. He waited a beat to make sure Neil understood, then let go. The next time he raised his cigarette to his mouth, Neil took it from him. Neil broke it between his fingers and let it fall to the asphalt by their feet. Andrew watched the halves roll away from each other and turned an unimpressed look on Neil. Ninety-one percent, Andrew said. Just take the money, Neil said. You bought the last car with someone's death. You can buy this one with someone's life. My life. That money was going to buy my next name when I ran away from here. Thanks to you, I don't need it anymore. Your life has a price tag you are already paying, Andrew reminded him. You cannot barter away the same thing twice. You've lost the right to call me difficult, Neil said. Andrew shrugged that off, so Neil said, Make a new deal with me. Andrew tipped his head to one side, considering that. What would you take for it? What would you give me? Neil asked. Don't ask questions you already know the answer to. Neil frowned at him, lost, but Andrew didn't waste his breath explaining. He held his hand up between them and turned it palm up. When Neil just looked at it, Andrew motioned to Neil's hand. Mystified, Neil mimicked the gesture. Andrew took the cigarette from his unresisting fingers and stuck it between his lips. It had nearly burnt out with no breath to keep it alive, but Andrew coaxed the flame back to life with a long drag. That was mine, Neil said. Oh, Andrew said, unconcerned. Neil didn't care enough to take it back, so he watched Andrew smoke. Andrew held his gaze and said nothing. He was waiting, Neil guessed, for Neil to come up with a suitable trade. Neil had no idea what he was supposed to ask for, but he knew there were a hundred ways to mess this deal up. Common sense said push for a reconciliation with Aaron, but if Andrew got backed into that truce, neither brother would enjoy it. Neil should ask for something that would strengthen the foxes, like permission to restart the group dinners and movies they'd had in Andrew's absence. He hesitated because it felt like a waste of a chance. Halloween had been surprisingly easy to talk Andrew into. Not surprisingly, Neil realized, because hadn't Kevin said it last fall? When you know what a person wants, it's easy to manipulate them, he'd said. Neil just hadn't known until this year what, who, Andrew wanted. Neil shook that off as counterproductive. His mind went from Halloween to Eden's Twilight to Sweetie's, and Neil finally figured it out. I want you to stop taking cracker dust. And he says it is in a righteous streak, Andrew mused, more to himself than to Neil. If it was righteousness, I'd ask you to give up drinking and smoking too, Neil said. I'm only asking for this one thing. It doesn't have any effect on you anyway, and it's an unnecessary risk. You don't need a third addiction. I don't need anything, Andrew reminded him, right on cue. If you don't need it, it'll be easy to give up, Neil said. Right? Andrew thought it over a minute, then flicked his cigarette at Neil. It singed the material where it bounced off his shirt. Neil ground it out under his shoe when it hit the asphalt. The cool look he flicked Andrew was wasted. Andrew's gaze had already drifted past him in search of something more interesting. I'm going to take your temper tantrum as a yes, Neil said. I'll bring the money by your room tonight. Will you? Andrew slid his stare back to Neil's face. Rather can you? Aaron doesn't want you in the room anymore, Nikki says. Something about you inviting yourself to fights that aren't your concern? He waggled his hand in a so-so kind of gesture. This phone tag nonsense has left the message a little unclear. Perhaps you'll explain to my face why you're suddenly so interested in my brother's life. I'm not, Neil said. Without the lies, Andrew added. I'm not, Neil said again. I can't stand him, but we're out of time. I told you last October we can't make it to finals if we're a fractured mess. You two are holding us back. I had to start with one of you. Since everyone bets on Aaron and Caitlin, I thought he'd fight you for her. Wouldn't that be an interesting change of pace? Andrew said. See also, a waste of energy and effort. He might try, but he won't win. You have to let him go. Oh? 
Andrew said, as if this was new to him. Do I? You'll lose him if you don't, Neil said. He'll keep pushing Caitlin away if you tell him to, but he'll resent you for it. He'll count down the days until graduation, and when it comes, you'll never see him again. You're not stupid. I know you can see it. Let him go now if you ever want him to come back. Who asked you? You didn't have to. I'm volunteering my opinion. Don't, Andrew advised him. Children should be seen and not heard. Don't dismiss me for lying to you, then ignore me when I tell the truth. This is not truth, Andrew said. Truth is irrefutable and untainted by bias. Sunrise, Abram, death, these are truths. You cannot judge a problem with your obsession goggles on and call it truth. You aren't fooling either of us. If you ask for half the truth, you only get half the truth, Neil said. It's your fault if you don't like the answers I give you, not mine. But as long as we're talking about obsession in Aaron's life, what are you going to do about his trial? She's going to be here for it, isn't she? Cass, I mean, Neil said, though he was sure Andrew knew who he was talking about. You're going to have to face her. Seen and not heard, Andrew reminded him. He sounded bored, but Neil knew a warning when he heard one. Neil let it slide and went back inside. Chapter 8 For once, Neil woke up before Matt's alarm sounded. He lay still for a minute, then rolled over and switched his own alarm off. He flipped his phone open to stare at the date. It was Friday, January 19th. Neil Jostin was supposed to turn 20 on March 31st. Today, Nathaniel Wisninski turned 19 years old. Neil had never made a habit of celebrating his birthday, but each one he was alive for deserved a moment of silence. He rubbed his thumb over the date on his small screen and made a wish that they'd win against Belmont. Neil knew he went to his classes, but he didn't learn anything. He wrote down what his teacher said, but didn't absorb a single word. He stuffed his notes into the bottom of his bag, ate a flavorless meal alone at the athlete's dining hall, and returned to Fox Tower. He passed a couple volleyball players in the stairwell, who wished him enthusiastic luck and remembered to thank them. He thought he thanked them anyway. He didn't know. He couldn't focus when he was thinking about the game. The Foxes didn't have afternoon practices when they had home games, so Neil had a lot of time to kill. He tried studying but got nowhere, then tried napping to no avail. By the time they left for the stadium an hour out from serve, he was going crazy. The locker room smelled faintly of bleach and window cleaner. Neil had never understood the point of cleaning the locker room before a game, but a small crew came by every day. The smell was usually gone by the time the Foxes showed up for practices, but Neil assumed game day campus traffic had slowed them down. It explained why Wymack was sitting on the entertainment center instead of holed up in his office, though. Wymack claimed he was allergic to cleaning materials. Abby thought it was an uncreative excuse for the unkempt state of his apartment, but Wymack stubbornly maintained his story. Wymack watched his team go by, likely hoping for a sign they'd made peace. Each practice that week had gone a little better than the one before, but they weren't quite where they needed to be. Neil and Kevin started talking again on Thursday because there was only so long they could ignore each other. While the upperclassmen couldn't yet forgive Andrew for his violence, they accepted it out of a misplaced sense of necessity. They still thought of him as a half-cocked sociopath, incapable of regretting his actions or understanding their anger. Aaron, on the other hand, was an unmoving stone of loathing in the fox's midst, a speed bump tripping them up as they tried to find their feet again. Neil didn't know how much longer to tolerate such immature animosity before giving Aaron another hard prod. He wished Nicky had more influence over his cousins, since their rooming situation meant Nicky had more chances to lean on them. Even Kevin would be an acceptable ally, but Kevin only defied Andrew when it came to Exy. He wouldn't get involved in their personal problems. There wasn't time to worry about it anymore tonight. Neil would have to sort it out over the weekend. He pushed the brothers from his mind and followed the men into the changing room. He twisted his combination into the lock on his gear locker and pulled the door open. There was a split second of unexpected resistance, then a sharp pop of something breaking, and then blood. It exploded in his locker, triggered by the door opening, and Neil recoiled as it cascaded over everything inside. The smell of it was so thick it clogged his throat and choked him. 
Neil's shock only lasted for a white-hot second before panic took over. He dove at his locker, grabbing for his uniform and gear. It was too late, and he knew it, but he had to try. His jersey squelched in his hands like a swollen sponge, spurting blood all over his fingers. He dropped it and scrabbled for his helmet. His fingertips grazed hard plastic but couldn't latch on before Matt grabbed him. No, Neil said, but Matt hauled him away from his locker. Wait! He dug his feet in, but the tread of his shoes were soaked and slid across the ground. The blood had hit the bottom of his locker and was now spilling onto the floor in a swiftly spreading puddle. Hanging from the top of his locker was an empty plastic bag, rigged to tear open when the door pulled too wide. It looked big enough to hold at least two gallons. It was more than big enough to destroy every single piece of gear Neil owned. Nicky, Andrew said. Get coach. Nicky bolted. Neil elbowed Matt as hard as he could. Matt cursed as he lost his grip on Neil. Neil ran back to his locker, skidding a little as he got closer. He had to catch himself on the neighboring locker to keep from falling. As soon as he had his balance, he frantically unloaded everything piece by piece. He couldn't tell his home and away jerseys apart anymore. Even the padding on his armor was wrecked. Neil picked his helmet up and turned it to watch blood slide off the hard plastic face guard. Neil, Matt asked. Neil dropped the helmet to the pile at his feet and punched the back of his locker. His fist hit plastic instead of metal, and Neil wrenched the broken bag off its hook. When he turned to throw it, Andrew caught his wrist. Neil hadn't even heard Andrew cross the room toward him. Neil stared at him and threw him, heart pounding in his temples. It's ruined, Neil said, voice ragged with an awful rage. It's all ruined! Wymack burst into the room with Nicky on his heels. The sight of so much blood stopped him short for a moment before he strode for Neil. Is that yours? Coach, my gear, Neil said. It's... it's not his. Andrew let go of Neil and went back to his own locker. He's fine. Peroxide, Neil said. Does Abby have any in her office? When Wymack just looked at him, Neil started for the door to find some himself. Wymack put an arm in his way to stop him. I need to clean my clothes before the blood sets in or I won't have anything to wear tonight. And I need you to derail that one-track fucking mind of yours for two seconds and focus on the fact that you are covered in someone or something's blood. Are you okay? Andrew already said I was fine, Neil bit out. I'm not asking Andrew, Wymack said. I'm asking you. Here, I've got a towel, Matt said and dug one out of his open locker. He hurried to the bathroom to soak it in the sink but jerked to a stop as he was turning back to them. His startled voice echoed off the bathroom walls. What the hell? Neil knew better than to look, but he went anyway. Wymack and Andrew were right behind him. Neil followed Matt's gaze to the far wall and felt his stomach bottom out. Written in blood across the tile was a bold message. Happy 19th birthday, Junior. Neil's head filled with static and screams. The strident mumble in the background was out of place, and it took Neil an eternity to realize that sound was coming from his teammates. He understood their anxious tones, but he didn't understand a word they were saying. Fear trailed icy claws over his stomach and crawled up his throat. Neil closed his eyes for two seconds and breathed. He couldn't deal with this now. He couldn't. He wouldn't. He grabbed the fledgling sense of panic and buried it deep, the same way he'd smothered his broken heart long enough to burn his mother's body. He would have to react to this later, but if he did it now with all of the foxes as his witnesses, he was going to lose everything. The world came back into focus in jagged pieces, just in time for Neil to hear Wymack mutter something about calling the police. Neil grabbed his elbow before Wymack turned away and squeezed so hard he felt bones creak. Coach he said as calmly as he could. You're gonna have to leave them out of this one, okay? Let's just get through the game. I'll clean this up afterward. No one else has to know. Give me one good reason not to cancel the game and pull security in here, Wymax said. I can't give you that yet, Neil said, slanting a look at him. I told you to wait until May. He willed Wymack to remember the promise he'd made on New Year's Eve when Wymack challenged his lies and scars. He hadn't told Wymack he was on the run, but he'd cut it close enough Wymack should have put the pieces together. Neil needed him to remember that now and figure out the obvious. Rico's men wouldn't have left evidence behind, but Neil had prints all over the place. 
Wymax said nothing but studied Neil with a disquieting intensity. Neil let go of Wymac and took the wet towel from an unresisting mat. His lungs felt like they were pulling tight as he crossed the room to his birthday message. He breathed shallowly so as not to set off his gag reflex and scrubbed the letters off the wall. There were enough clean patches on the towel afterward for Neil to wipe his hands off. He came back to the others and dropped the towel in the sink to worry about later. Neil, Matt said. Neil didn't want to hear it. Change out, Matt. He went back into the main room and considered his locker. It didn't take long to realize none of his teammates were moving. Matt was still frozen by the sinks. Wymack and Andrew stood in the bathroom doorway. Aaron, Kevin, and Nikki were by their lockers. Neil could feel all eyes on him. He felt like the truth was written on his skin for all of them to see. The message only said Junior, but he expected someone to call him by his name. Neil looked around at them and focused on the one most likely to help him salvage this. Kevin, he said and continued in French. Get them moving. We've only got 40 minutes until serve. Can you play? Kevin asked. I'm pissed off, not injured, Neil snapped. I'm not going to let this keep us from winning tonight, are you? Kevin considered him for a moment, then turned a caustic look on his teammates. Get moving. We have a game to win. You're joking. Matt said, coming up behind Andrew and looking between the strikers. You're really going to ignore the fact that this? He stabbed a finger in the direction of Neil's locker. Just happened? Neil, you look like a carry stunt double. You don't even want to get security up here while the scene's still fresh? No, Neil said. I don't. You're joking, Matt said again. Neil looked at him. Rico is an egotist and an asshole. He wants us to react to this. If we do, he wins. Don't give him that satisfaction. Pretend this never happened and focus on the Terrapins. It took Wymack only a few more moments to pick his side. No one's changing in here. Get your gear and get out. You can have the girls' room when they're done with it. I will give you one chance tonight, he said when Neil looked at him. If I think your head isn't in the game, I will pull you so fast you'll get whiplash and Dan will take your place. Do you understand me? Yes, coach, Neil said. Wymack glanced at the mess one more time, looking a little like he hated himself for siding with Neil. Finally, he shook his head and dug Neil's clothes from the small mountain on the floor. I'll get Abby cleaning this. Someone loan Neil another towel. Thank you, Neil said. Shut up, Wymack said, and stormed out. A terrible silence descended in the locker room. Finally, Andrew crossed the room to his locker and finished unloading his gear. That was the trigger the others needed, apparently, because they took their things and left. Nicky gave Neil one of his spare towels on his way out. Matt was the last to go, and he hesitated when he realized Neil wasn't moving. I'll wash up in here, Neil said, and gestured at his wretched appearance. I don't want to track this any further than I have to. Matt accepted that without argument and left Neil in peace. Neil looked at his locker, then resolutely looked away and went to wash up. He stared at the ground as he showered and watched the red slowly fade from the water. Even when the water ran clear, he felt like he was dying inside. He washed three times before finally giving up. As soon as the water cut off, Wymack called to him from out of sight. Matt went back to Fox Tower to get you some boxes and socks. I brought the spare gear in, but you'll have to figure out which ones fit best. I'll bring back your uniform when it's clean. Sit tight until then. Yes, coach, Neil said. He listened for the door to close behind Wymack and dried off in his stall. The Foxes had a couple sets of backup gear left over from years when the line was a little bigger. Rene had scrounged armor from there when subbing in as a backliner this past fall. Most of the gear was adjustable, but only to a certain degree. It took Neil trial and error to pick a complete set from the pile Wymack had left him. Then there was nothing to do but wait. It felt like forever before Matt made it back. Game night traffic made the short trek to Fox Tower much longer than it should have been. Neil was jarred from his dire thoughts when someone knocked. He slid off the bench and went to investigate. The gear he'd put on made it impossible to fit the towel around his body. Instead of wrapping it around him, he held it up by his neck and let it hang down his scarred front. Neil opened the door just far enough to realize it was Matt in the hallway and was startled into saying, You knocked? Matt looked at him oddly. Abby said she still has your uniform. It wasn't the first time the Foxes had gone out of their way to accommodate Neil's privacy issues, but they usually had time to think it through. Matt was late for warm-ups because of Neil and shaken by Rico's awful trick. 
Despite that, he'd remembered not to barge in. Thank you, Neil finally said, and took the clothes Matt squeezed through the doorway. Matt had brought him an entire outfit so he'd have something to wear after the game. The thought of Matt going through his things made his skin crawl, but Neil fought off that instinctive fit of nerves. No problem, Matt said. Need anything else? A clear shot at Rico and no witnesses, Neil said. Matt grinned like he thought Neil was joking and left. Neil closed the door behind him and tugged on his underwear and socks. He carried his shoes to the bathroom and rinsed them off in the sink. There was only so much he could do. Blood had soaked into the liner inside. Neil could wear them tonight, but he'd have to replace them as soon as possible. Neil could pull his shorts on over his shoes, so he towed into his shoes and tied them. He paced the locker room, watching the clock so he wouldn't look at the blood. Finally, Wymack showed up with his uniform. We did what we could, but we're going to have to get you a complete new set. I'll order it tonight and get it here express. He handed it over and set to work rolling his sleeves up. Neil had gotten blood on his shirt when he grabbed Wymack's arm. It took Wymack a bit of tugging to hide all of it. Neil thought he should apologize, but he didn't think Wymack would let him. Instead, he squeezed excess water from the hem and sleeves of his jersey. It's as dry as we could get it, Wymack said, looking up at the splatter of water against the floor. Matt brought back one of the girls' hair dryers, but Abby didn't want to use it for fear of setting the stain. If anyone asks, I'll tell them it was a pregame prank, Neil said. It's technically the truth. Neil finished getting dressed. Wymack gave him a once-over, deemed him fit for public scrutiny with an unconvincing nod, and shooed Neil ahead of him out of the locker room. This close to serve, the team had already finished warm-ups and stretches. Neil took a couple laps on his own while Wymack ran his team through a pre-game spiel. Wymack was done by the time Neil came back, and Neil abruptly became the center of attention. "'Are you sure you're okay, Neil?' Dan asked. "'I'm sure we have a game to win,' Neil said." Worry more about that and less about me. The referees let them on court for drills. Neil focused on his every move so as not to think about anything else. By the time starting lineup took their places for serve, Neil was so lost in himself in tonight's game he'd almost forgotten what transpired in the locker room. The ghost of it still clung to him, even if he wouldn't acknowledge it, and it egged him to go harder and faster. Kevin didn't warn him to scale back, and they crashed into their backliner marks with an unusual aggression. Neil had a yellow card before the halftime break. He expected Wymack to use it as an excuse to pull him, but Wymack said nothing about it when he took his team back to the locker room. Neil thought he smelled blood, but knew it was impossible. There was too much space between the changing room and the foyer, and the stench of his teammates' sweat and deodorant clogged the air. "'Where's Abby?' Dan asked, and Neil realized he hadn't seen her since serve. "'She had to go on campus for a bit. No one get mauled in her absence.' Wymack gestured to the cooler. Everyone drink up and stretch out. We don't have a lot of time. The Foxes played second half like they had everything to lose. Neil used the passing and shooting skills Kevin had taught him and slipped in some of the defensive footwork he'd learned with the Ravens. When he had to call to Kevin, he did so in French. He didn't say a word to his backliner, Mark, no matter what the man said to him. He didn't have the breath for senseless snark and he needed every ounce of his flagging energy to get through the game. He knew the silence was getting to his mark, judging by the growing sharpness in the other man's tone. Neil didn't acknowledge him except to push against him and past him. Matt was a dominating force on the far side of the court. Nicky was still the weakest link on the defense line, but Andrew balanced him out with ruthless efficiency. When Aaron came on, he and Andrew played together as if nothing was wrong. Neil didn't know if they closed ranks because of Rico's interference or if the game was enough to distract them from their personal problems. For now, Neil didn't care what the reason was, so long as they cooperated. With eight minutes on the clock, the Foxes started to slow down. They'd gone too hard, too early. As long as they could hold their ground, they'd be okay, because they had a two-point lead, but Neil wanted another point to revitalize the team. He and Kevin were up against fresh backliners, though, and the defense cut them off at every turn. Neil knew Kevin was as frustrated as he was, because Kevin was starting to toe the line of unacceptable checking. Neil snapped a warning at him when they lost control of the ball again. Kevin snarled something rude back. Two minutes later, the Foxes got the surge they needed. A Terrapin striker got around Matt and raced at the goal. Matt couldn't quite catch up, but he managed a glancing blow when the striker went to shoot. The striker stumbled, racket twisting in an attempt to hold onto the ball, and got one step too close to the goal. 
Andrew was outside of his box in a heartbeat, and he body-checked the striker hard enough to floor him. The striker stayed where he was for a good five seconds, two days to get back up again. The game didn't wait for him. Matt went after the ball with a war cry and flung it up the court to Allison. The next time Neil took a shot on goal, he made it, and the Foxes rallied. The Foxes won, 8-5, and the crowd almost blew the roof off with their racket. The Foxes took their celebration to goal because Andrew wouldn't come to them. Nicky and Renee had hooked him into the partying last season because he was too sick to fight back. Now Nicky made as if to pounce on him and Andrew pointed his racket at Nicky in warning. Nicky thought better of it and hung off Aaron instead. Aaron stayed a disinterested spectator on the outskirts while the Foxes jumped and yelled a few feet in front of him. Somehow Kevin got around everyone else to say something to Andrew. Neil couldn't hear it over his teammate's noise, but Andrew's dismissive gesture said he wasn't concerned with Kevin's approval. They shook the Terrapins' hands as quickly as they could and booked it off the court. Wymack and Abby were waiting for them, Wymack with a toothy grin and Abby all smiles. Wymack's glee only kicked Dan's excitement up another notch, and she ran at the crowd to rile them. Nikki and Matt tore off after her. Wymack let them go, knowing the reporters would rope them in as the easiest targets, and ushered his foxes to the locker room. Neil made it all the way to the foyer before he remembered the mess that was waiting for him. "'Do you have a mop I can use?' Neil asked. "'Shut your face,' Wymack said. "'You're not dealing with that right now. We just won!' Eight five, Allison said, as if Neil had already forgotten. The edge in her voice betrayed how angry she still was about all this— Neil didn't flinch at the next words out of her mouth, but it was a near thing. I guess you can consider that your birthday present from the team. Allison, Renee said. No! Allison stabbed a finger at Renee to cut her off, but kept her eyes on Neil. I've hit the limit of what bullshit I'll tolerate this week, let alone this year. I need to know how much worse this pissing contest between Neil and Rico is going to get. We're going to talk about this, Wymack said, but not until everyone's here. Go get washed up. We're going in turns again, ladies first. He watched them leave and waited until the changing room door closed behind them. I'm instating a new team rule where everyone is required to be happy after a win. You downers are going to suck the life out of me before my time. Wymack looked at them, but Kevin was watching Neil and the twins were back to ignoring one another. Wymack threw his hands up in defeat and left. The room descended to tense silence until Dan showed up with Nicky and Matt in tow. The three still looked enthused from the win in their interviews, but being around their moody teammates killed their cheer. Dan hesitated only a moment before continuing to the changing room without a word. Nicky came and propped up his shoulder against Neil. So we totally just bagged our two out of three. Next week's win is gonna be the icing on the cake. Nicky flicked Kevin a meaningful look as if demanding he join the conversation. Then it's on to the first death match. Chances of us playing someone interesting? Zero, Kevin said. All of the interesting teams are in the odds bracket. All except us, you mean? Nicky gave him a moment to agree, then heaved an exaggerated sigh when he didn't. Ah, you're so biased. Just don't forget whose team you're on. If we end up facing USC, you'd better be rooting for us. I'll consider it, Kevin said. The Ravens and Trojans were fierce rivals, but Kevin was an unrepentant USC fan. Neil wasn't surprised, since USC had one of the best teams in the nation. They were famous for their sportsmanship, and they'd spearheaded the movement to keep the Foxes in the running last fall. They were worth Kevin's attention and favor. Jerk, Nicky said. I'm telling Coach you like Coach Riemann more. Tell him, Kevin said. If Coach is worth his position, he knows the Trojans are better than the Foxes are. They always have been and always will be. Biased, Nicky muttered again. Dan came to get them when the women were done, and the men took over the changing room. Neil stood under the spray and checked under his fingernails for blood. He found none, but for a minute he swore he smelled burning flesh. Neil was the last one dressed, as usual, and he found his teammates waiting for him in the lounge. Wymack was standing in front of the entertainment center with his arms crossed over his chest. Abby was hovering in the doorway. Neil was tempted to continue past her outside and skip this conversation entirely. He doubted anyone would let him get away with it, so he sat beside Andrew on the couch. Wymack waited until he'd gone still before starting. First off, the massacred elephant in the room. Massacred birds, rather. 
I called in a favor with the faculty and got Abby access to the microscopes in the science labs. We needed to make sure that wasn't human blood. That's morbid, Nikki said, but necessary considering who we're dealing with. Wymack shook his head. The last thing I want is to put you all at risk. The court is supposed to be a safe place for you, but I've failed to protect you. I've half a mind to install cameras in here in the public areas, but I won't do that unless everyone agrees. If we do rig something up, the only ones who will see those tapes are the people in this room right now. I want people in our business as much as you do. Which leads me to my second point. Neil asked us to leave the authorities out of this, Wymack said, looking each of his foxes in the face. I respect him enough to allow that, but it's not up to just me. Are you going to be okay with that? You're really just going to let Rico get away with this? Dan asked. He wouldn't have done this if he thought he would get caught, Neil said. Maybe we can't get him, but we could get his middlemen, Matt said. No one's perfect. Everyone leaves a trail. Aaron spoke up then, and his callous accusation made Neil's blood go cold. You'd know all about that, wouldn't you, Junior? Neil flicked a quick look at Aaron's dark expression and braced for the worst. When it came, though, it was worse than he expected. They'll never find proof that Rico was involved in this, Aaron said. But they might find you, right? That's what this is all about, isn't it? Aaron gestured at his own face, indicating Neil's abrupt change in appearance. Your looks, your languages, your lies. You're running from something or someone. That biting demand was a sucker punch, knocking the breath from Neil's lungs and crushing his stomach to his spine. The silence that followed felt infinite. Neil was sure his teammates could hear his heartbeat. It was pounding so loud he felt it on every inch of his skin. Their stares were piercing enough to peel up every disguise he'd ever worn. Finding his voice was an act of desperation. Keeping it calm took every ounce of energy he had left. You know... I expected low blows and backstabbing from the ravens. I thought foxes were better than that. No, Neil said when Aaron opened his mouth again. Don't you dare take your issues with Andrew out on me. I know you're mad at me for getting Caitlin involved, but you're going to have to get over that. You dragged her into my business. I'm dragging them into yours. Not as much fun when someone does it to you, is it? Aaron asked. You're so stupid, Neil said. I invited myself to your fight because I wanted to help you too. You're doing this because you think it's going to hurt me. There's a pretty critical difference there. On the bright side, you being an asshole at heart means I was right about your chances. Neil tipped his head to one side and eyed Aaron. You do understand by now that your cowardice is what's keeping you and Andrew apart, right? I'm not a coward. You're a spineless asshole, Neil said. You let the world happen to you and don't bother to fight back. You let other people dictate how you can live your life and who you can spend your time with. Remind me why you put up with your mother's abuse for so long? Did you actually love her despite her madness, or were you just too afraid to walk away? Neil, Dan said, shocked. That's not... Fuck you, Aaron said. I'm still waiting for an answer to my question, and I'm still waiting for a thank you, Neil said. He slanted a look at Andrew. From both of you, to each other. You're even now, aren't you? So why can't you just wipe the slate clean and start over? Why do you have to drag it out another three years when you can fix it right now? You don't know anything, Aaron said, low and acidic. You don't want me to be right, Neil guessed, because if I am, it's your fault she's dead. Andrew finally joined the argument. No, it's always going to be her fault. She didn't kill herself, Andrew, Aaron said, savage with grief. Andrew flicked him a cool look. I told her what would happen if she raised her hand again. She had no right to look so surprised. Oh, Jesus, Matt said. Did you just... Wymack pinched the bridge of his nose and exhaled noisily. Could you at least let us leave the room before you confess? Aaron glanced from Wymack to the upperclassmen, then turned back on Andrew. Neil half expected him to take Wymack's warning as an order to silence. Instead, Aaron switched to German and said, That's not why you did it. Don't lie to me. She was nothing and no one to me, Andrew said. Why else would I have killed her? It took Aaron a minute to find his voice again. He still sounded angry, but there was a muted edge to his. You wouldn't even look at me. You wouldn't say a word to me unless I said something first. I'm not psychic. How was I supposed to know? Because I made you a promise, Andrew said. I did not forget it just because you chose not to believe me. I did what I said I would do, and fuck you for expecting anything else. There it was again. A hint of that 
infinite anger at Andrew's core. Aaron opened his mouth, closed it again, and dropped his eyes. Andrew stared at his brother's bowed head for an endless minute. Aaron had given up the fight, but every passing second seemed to put more tension in Andrew's frame. Neil watched Andrew's fingers curl against his thighs, not into fists, but a mimicry of crushing the life from someone, and knew Andrew's temper was nearing a breaking point. He put his hand up between them, trying to block Andrew's view of Aaron, and Andrew cut a vicious look at him. A heartbeat later, Andrew's expression went dead. Neil regretted his intervention immediately. No one could let go of that much rage that easily. Andrew had simply buried it where it could hurt only him. It was too late to take it back, so Neil dropped his hand to his lap in defeat. Is that it, coach? Neil asked. No, Allison said. As enlightening as this little diversion was, it doesn't answer the original question. What does Rico have on you? Lying at this point wouldn't work, considering Aaron's bold accusations. Neil opted for honesty in its simplest, most unhelpful form. He knows who I am. It took them a moment to realize that was it, and Matt prompted Neil with, Uh... Neil's family has a reputation, Kevin said, unexpectedly coming to Neil's defense. Neil looked at him, willing him to silence even as he tried to keep his expression as neutral as possible. Kevin didn't return his stare, but all he said was, Rico is trying to use it against Neil. Is it going to be a problem? Dan asked. No, Neil said. Allison arched a brow at him and gestured over her shoulder, presumably toward the wrecked changing room. Are you sure about that? Yes, Neil said, but no one looked convinced. Neil weighed his words carefully, looking for the right balance between truth and lies that would get them off his back. Rico knows who I am because our families operate in similar circles, but he is a Moriyama in name only. He doesn't have the resources to do more than threaten me. Damn, Neil, Matt said. Your parents must be something else if Rico's got to follow the rules. Aaron was right then? This is what you're supposed to look like? Yes, Neil said. But why lie about your age? Matt asked. I don't get it. I don't want anyone tracking me back to my family, Neil said. The harder it is for people to put two and two together, the better. Being 18 in Millport meant my teachers and coach didn't have to consult my parents for anything. Telling you the truth meant having to explain why I lied in the first place, and I'm not used to trusting people. I don't want you to judge me for my parents' crimes. As if we have room to judge anyone, Dan said, and Neil shrugged a silent apology. She looked like there was more she wanted to say, but somehow she stifled her curiosity and let it go. She looked at Matt first, then to Allison and Renee. When no one had anything to add, Dan said, Yeah, I guess that's it for now, coach. Wymack nodded. Cameras okay with everyone? Yes? I'll have them up over the weekend. We'll talk about their locations in the game on Monday afternoon. Before then, figure out what you have to do to resolve these personal issues, he said with a meaningful look at Aaron. Don't any of you dare bring these attitudes to my court ever again. Understand? The foxes mumbled assent and Wymack motioned for them to clear out. Dismissed. Drive safe. It was chaos outside the stadium. Drunken fans hollered and ran about like madmen. The rest of the crowd danced and sang triumphant cheers. Policemen were out in full force trying to control the mess. Security guards kept an eye on the foxes until they made it to their cars. Aaron went right past the rental car and climbed into the back of Matt's truck. Nicky started to say something, but Andrew sparked his lighter an inch from Nicky's face in silent warning. Nicky silently climbed into the back seat with Neil and spent the ride staring at his lap. Traffic around the stadium was bumper to bumper, so the Fox's cars got separated as they edged into traffic. Matt beat them to the dorm. By the time the others caught up, Aaron was long gone. Neil watched Andrew usher Kevin and Nicky into their room before heading to his own. Matt followed Neil, and Neil tried to be surprised that the girls were right behind him. The soft buzz of his phone distracted him, and Neil tugged it out of his pocket. There was a new message in his inbox. He didn't recognize the number or the area code. He understood the message even less. Forty-nine. Neil gave it a minute, but nothing else was forthcoming. He deleted the text and put his phone away. Neil, Dan said, and waited until Neil was looking at her to continue. Thank you. For the truth, I mean. I know that's not all of it, but I know you didn't let us in by choice. We're ready to listen when you're ready to talk. You know that, right? I know, Neil said. 
She squeezed his shoulder in silent but fierce support. And thank you for... Well, whatever you're doing with Andrew and Aaron. I'm not entirely sure I understand what happened tonight, but I know it was important. Important? Matt echoed. Are we going to talk about the fact that Andrew killed their mother? I thought she died in a car accident. That's what everyone's always said. She did die in a car wreck, Neil said. I said accident, Matt said with emphasis. Neil gazed calmly back and said nothing else, so Matt asked, How did you find out? Nikki told me months ago, Neil said. Just like that? Matt said dubiously. You've always known what he's capable of, but you said he's never given you a real reason to be afraid of him. What the hell are your parents into? If you can glide past murder like it's no big deal and get in Rico's face all the time. Neil shook his head and was saved by Renee's gentle, Perhaps Neil trusts Andrew's reasons. Andrew admitted to murder, yes, but he also said he did it for his brother's sake. It was premeditated, Dan said. That isn't defense. He could have called the police or social services or gotten Nikki's parents involved. People with our backgrounds are not inclined to trust the police, Renee said. It probably never occurred to Andrew that they were a viable option. And look what happened last November, Neil added. Andrew's always known Luther wouldn't protect Aaron. Dan looked between them, disbelieving. You condone this? Renee spread her hands and gave her friend a reassuring smile. We cannot understand the situation entirely, Dan. We will never know Andrew's frame of mind at the time or how bad life with her was for them. All we can do is make a choice. Believe that he was protecting Aaron or condemn him for taking the most extreme path. I would rather go with the former, wouldn't you? It is encouraging and comforting to think he wasn't acting out of malice. Next you'll say it's sweet. Allison mocked her. Please don't, Dan said with a small grimace. My stomach's weak enough as it is right now. Neil waited to make sure that was it, then said... I'm going to bed. None of them tried to stop him. Neil shut himself in the bedroom, changed out, and crawled into bed. His thoughts threatened to tug him down to dark places, so Neil silently counted as high as he could in every language he knew. It did nothing to help him sleep, but it at least kept the demons at bay for a little longer. Chapter 9 When the sun came up, Neil gave up pretending to sleep and got out of bed again. He went for a run along Perimeter Road and pointed his feet toward the Foxhole Court when the turnoff came. The usual security guards were making their rounds. Neil trusted them less today than he had yesterday, now that he knew how easy it was to get past them, and made a wide loop around them. He let himself in with his keys and flicked on the lights as he headed to the changing room. He pushed open the door, already rolling up the sleeves of his sweatshirt, and hesitated halfway into the room. The mess was gone, and the floor was spotless. Neil looked over his shoulder, but the place had been dark when he'd shown up. He was the only one here. He crossed the room to his locker and tugged the lock undone. His locker was clean and empty. It was half past seven, which meant Wymack had been up for hours. Neil straddled one of the benches and called him. Wymack answered on the second ring by saying, I don't know what amazes me more, that your phone is actually turned on or that you're awake this early on a Saturday morning. Coach, the changing room is clean. Yeah, I know. Abby and I took care of it last night after you left. I'm sorry, Neil said. I was going to clean it this morning. Didn't I tell you not to worry about it? Wymack demanded. You told me not to deal with it yesterday, Neil said. Whatever, Wymack said. You can make it up to me later. Actually... What are you doing now that I've ruined your morning plans? Nothing? He waited for Neil's affirmative and said, You can sort through files with me instead. I'll lug them over and grab breakfast on the way. Or did you eat already? Not yet, Neil said. I'll wait here. Wymack hung up. Neil looked at his open locker again, then migrated to the lounge to wait. He walked the length of the walls, studying the photographs Dan had put up over the years. Neil never saw Dan add to it, but the collection had grown to include a couple dozen shots from this year. The majority were of the upperclassmen, since Dan rarely had a chance to catch her younger teammates off the court, but Neil spotted several from Halloween, and a couple stray pictures of their team dinners in November and December. Right near the corner was a picture Neil didn't recognize at all, a shot of Neil and Andrew standing alone. They were bundled up in their matching coats and staring each other down, barely a breath apart. It took Neil a moment to place it. The people packed into the background didn't look like a game crowd. The windows finally gave it away. 
Dan had taken this at Upstate Regional Airport on their way to play against Texas. Neil hadn't even realized she'd been watching them. Neil had gotten caught in a couple of her group pictures, but this was the only one up that had Neil's natural looks. Dan had even caught Neil on his right side, so the bandage over his tattoo wasn't showing. This was a picture of Nathaniel Wisninski. This was the moment Neil gave Andrew his name. Neil reached out to tear the picture down, but stopped as soon as he'd caught hold of the edge. He'd come to Palmetto State to play, but he'd also come because Kevin was proof that a real person existed behind all of his lies. In May, both Nathaniel and Neil would be gone, but in June, this picture would still be here. He'd be a tiny part of the foxhole court for years to come. It was comforting, or it should be. Neil didn't think comfort should feel like such a sick knot in his stomach. Luckily for him, Wymac showed up then. He had a brown paper bag hanging from one hand and a box stuffed with papers in his arms. Neil got the door behind him so Wymac could put his things down. Wymac looked around the lounge a moment, then put the TV on the ground and shoved the entertainment center closer to the couches as a makeshift table. Neil watched him lay out folders in four stacks. When Wymac tossed the empty box aside, Neil opened the closest folder for a peek. It was a profile sheet with an unfamiliar picture on it. Potential recruits, Wymac explained. We need six minimum. Six, Neil echoed as he knelt opposite Wymac. You're doubling the line? Not by choice, Wymac said. He pulled bagel sandwiches and juice from the brown bag and split the hall with Neil. It was one of the conditions of us staying in the game when Andrew got locked up. The ERC doesn't like how close we've cut it this year, and they don't want to keep bending the rules for us. I promised it'd never happen again. That means filling up on subs next year. Wymac checked each stack, then pushed one toward Neil. The girls are all going to be fifth-year seniors, so we need at least three bodies training to replace them. In total, we're looking for two strikers, two dealers, a backliner, and a goalie. Find me some potential in the strikers, and we'll narrow it down later. Shouldn't Kevin be doing this with you? Neil asked. You choose the first cut, Wymac said. He'll do the second. I'll make the final call. Neil looked at the stack of files in front of him. At length, he opened the top one and started to read through pages of statistics, fitness, scoring trends, ratios, and so on. He wasn't entirely sure what he was looking for, but he had an idea by the time he made it to the third striker. The third striker was consistently good, but the fourth was more interesting because there was measurable improvement. Discs were taped to the inside back cover of every folder, likely containing clips of the player's brightest moments. He split the files into two stacks, the most promising and the maybes, and went back through both piles when he was done. He thought the second round would be faster now that he'd seen everyone's information, but he second-guessed himself on everyone. Wymac would probably finish every other position by the time Neil made up his mind, but when Neil sneaked a glance in his direction, Wymac wasn't much further along than he was. Wymac's gaze wasn't even moving. He wasn't reading statistics. He was studying the player's picture like it could tell him everything he needed to know. Neil looked back at the open file in front of him and tried to see what Wymac saw. Maybe Wymac could read pain in people like Neil could read anger. Where Neil saw a girl's unshakable calm, maybe Wymac saw a vacant stare and defeated shoulders. Neil wondered if Wymac had seen anything in his high school snapshot, or if he'd just trusted Hernandez's assessment that something was wrong. He'd like to think he had a good poker face, but Wymac was rarely fooled by it anymore. Problem? Wymac asked. No, Neil lied, and went back to the task at hand. It took half the morning to get through the would-be strikers, but Neil finally had a stack ready for Kevin and Wymac to pour through. Wymac set it on the ground by his knee and put the rejected files back in the box. Anything else? Neil asked. Free to go, Wymac said. You need a ride? I'm fine, Neil said. Uh-huh, Wymac said without looking up. Neil let it go and gathered their breakfast trash. He was almost to the garbage can before Wymax spoke up. By the way, I'm making you vice captain next year. Neil's heart lodged in his throat. He twisted to stare at Wymac, but it took two tries to find his voice. Y y you're what? Dan's gotta leave eventually, Wymax said. She needs a replacement. Not me, Neil protested. You should be asking Matt or Kevin. 
Talented players with more experience, Wymack allowed, but they don't have what this team needs. Do you know why I made Dan captain? Wymack glanced up at Neil and waited for Neil to shake his head. I knew the moment I saw her she could lead this team. It didn't matter what her teammates thought of her. It didn't matter what the press thought of her. She refused to be a failure, so she refused to give up on this team. That's what I needed to get the Foxes off the ground. You're the only one here who can succeed her, Wymax said. Didn't you notice? They're uniting around and behind you. That's something special. You're something special. You don't even know who I am. The hell I don't, Wymax said. You're Neil Jostin, 19-year-old recruit from Millport, Arizona. Born March 31st, five foot three, right-handed, stick size three. Starting striker for my foxes and most improved freshman striker in NCAA Class 1 XE. No, Wymax said, getting louder when Neil started to interrupt. Look me in the eye and tell me if you think I care who you used to be. Hmm? Wymax stabbed a finger up at his face, then jabbed it into the table. I care about who you are right now, and who you can be going forward. I'm not asking you to forget your past, but I am telling you to overcome it. I can't captain them, Neil said. I won't. This isn't a democracy, Wymax said. You don't get to vote on what you do or don't want to do. I make the rules and you get to deal. And you are going to deal with it. You need this as much as they need you. Give me one reason why you'd try to turn this down. I, Neil said, but he couldn't say, I'm dying. He couldn't tell why Mac he wouldn't live long enough to take the position. I have to go. He was afraid why Mac would argue, but all why Mac said was, See you Monday. Neil thought he'd breathe easier once he got out of the stadium, but his chest was still too tight when he stumbled out onto the sidewalk. He stared at the empty parking lot, heart pounding in his temples. The thought of going back to Fox Tower and facing his teammates right now made his stomach hurt, but there was nowhere else to go. He should run it off, burn himself down to fumes until he couldn't think or feel any more. But Neil's feet stayed planted on the sidewalk. Maybe they knew he wouldn't stop if he ran now. He sank to the curb to buy himself time, but his thoughts kept twisting in anxious circles. Neil felt a half-second from losing his mind, but then Andrew said his name and Neil's thoughts grounded to a startled halt. He was belatedly aware of his hand at his ear and his fingers clenched tight around his phone. He didn't remember pulling it from his pocket or making the decision to dial out. He lowered it and tapped a button, thinking maybe he'd imagined things, but Andrew's name was on his display and the timer put the call at almost a minute already. Neil put the phone back to his ear, but he couldn't find the words for the wretched feeling that was tearing away at him. In three months, championships would be over. In four months, he'd be dead. In five months, the Foxes would be right back here for summer practices with six new faces. Neil could count his life on one hand now. On the other hand was the future he couldn't have. Vice-captain, captain, court. Neil had no right to mourn these missed chances. He'd gotten more than he deserved this year. It was selfish to ask for more. He should be grateful for what he had, and gladder still that his death would mean something. He was going to drag his father and the Moriyamas down with him when he went, and they'd never recover from the things he said. It was justice when he'd never thought he'd get any revenge for his mother's death. He thought he'd come to terms with it, but that hollow ache was back in his chest where it had no right to be. Neil felt like he was drowning. Neil found his voice at last, but the best he had was, Come and get me from the stadium. Andrew didn't answer, but the quiet took on a new tone. Neil checked the screen again and saw the timer flashing at 72 seconds. Andrew had hung up on him. Neil put his phone away and waited. It was only a couple minutes from Fox Tower to the Fox Oak Court, but it took almost 15 minutes for Andrew to turn into the parking lot. He pulled into the space a couple inches from Neil's left foot and didn't bother to kill the engine. Kevin was in the passenger seat, frowning silent judgment at Neil through the windshield. Andrew got out of the car when Neil didn't move and stood in front of Neil. Neil looked up at him, studying Andrew's bored expression and waiting for questions he knew wouldn't come. That apathy should have grated against his raw nerves, but somehow it steadied him. Andrew's disinterest in his psychological well-being was what had drawn Neil to him in the first place, the realization that Andrew would never flinch away from whatever poison was eating Neil alive. I don't want to be here today, Neil said. 
We were almost to the interstate, Andrew said. It was the most half-hearted invitation to come along that Neil had ever heard, but Neil didn't care. Andrew had turned around and come back for him without hesitation. That was more than enough reason to get up and go with him. Neil climbed in behind the passenger seat and stared out the window. Kevin glanced back at him but said nothing and Andrew got them moving before his door had even slammed all the way closed. They didn't ask what was wrong, so Neil didn't ask why they were taking I-85 toward Atlanta. They were the longest two hours of Neil's life, but the silence and the illusion of escaping Palmetto State University helped Neil pull his head back together. By the time they made it to Alpharetta, he'd sunk to a comfortable numbness. Last night's sleeplessness started to catch up with him, and he let himself nod off. He woke when Andrew's phone rang, but Andrew was only on the call long enough to say, Don't. A couple minutes later, they pulled into a dealership. Kevin got out as soon as Andrew parked. Andrew killed the engine and tossed his keys in the now-empty passenger seat. Get out or stay here, Andrew said. Those are your only choices. Running wasn't an option, he meant. Andrew knew why Neil had called him. I'll stay. Andrew got out and slammed the door behind him. Neil watched him disappear through the front doors in search of a sales rep, then closed his eyes and fell asleep again. When he woke, there was a metallic black beast parked alongside the rental car. Neil wasn't any smarter about cars now than he'd been at the start of the year, but every curve of this one screamed expensive. Neil assumed Andrew did with this purchase what he'd done with the last, simply looked for whichever car would burn through his budget the fastest. It was a perplexing quirk for a man who claimed to have no attachments to his material possessions. Andrew opened the back door and looked across the back seat at Neil. Kevin? Neil scrubbed the sleep out of his eyes and undid his buckle. Let him ride with you. I have nothing to say to him. Andrew shut the door again and Neil moved up to the driver's seat. Andrew pulled out of the lot first and Neil followed him to the interstate. They stopped at a gas station with a fast food joint attached. Neil wasn't hungry, but he filled the largest available cup with coffee while they ate. He sat in the adjacent booth to sip on it and stare into space. Kevin glanced at him occasionally as they ate but said nothing, likely attributing his odd mood to yesterday's fiasco. Andrew gazed out the floor-to-ceiling windows at his new car. The ride back felt shorter than the ride out to Georgia had been, even though they had to pass Palmetto State and drop the rental car off in Greenville. The rep checked the car for new damage, turned the engine on long enough to see how much gas was in the tank, and had Andrew sign off on a couple forms. Then there was nothing to do but return to campus. Neil thought he'd been away long enough to be okay, but the first sight of Fox Tower out the window left him feeling tired. They took the stairs up, and Neil didn't stop at the third landing. The soft tap of footsteps said Andrew was following him, but the hall door banged closed as Kevin headed for his room. Andrew caught up with Neil when Neil stopped to fight the rooftop access door. He had two cigarettes out and lit before they were even outside. Neil took his and carried it to the front end of the roof. He sat as close to the edge as he could get, hoping that jolt of fear would distract him from his dire thoughts and looked out at the sprawling campus. Andrew sat beside him and held something up. Neil looked, but it took a minute before he understood what Andrew was offering him. The dealership had given him two keys for his new ride, and Andrew was giving the second one to Neil. When Neil took too long to take it from him, Andrew dropped it on the concrete between them. A man can only have so many issues, Andrew said. It is just a key. You're a foster child. You know it isn't. Neil said. He didn't pick the key up but pressed two fingers to it, learning the shape and feel of this newest gift. I've always had enough cash to live comfortably, but all the decent places ask too many questions. There are background checks and credit checks and references, things I can't provide on my own without leaving too much of a trail. I squatted in Millport. Before that I stayed in decrepit weekly hotels or broke into people's cars or found places that were happy being paid under the table. It's always been go, Neil said. He turned his hand palm up and traced a key into his skin with his fingertip. He'd toyed with Andrew's house key so many times he knew every dip and ridge by heart. It's always been lie and hide and disappear. I've never belonged anywhere or had the right to call anything my own. But Coach gave me keys to the court, and you told me to stay. You gave me a key and called it home. 
Neil clenched his hand, imagining the bite of metal against his palm, and lifted his gaze to Andrew's face. I haven't had a home since my parents died. Andrew dug a finger in Neil's cheek and forcibly turned his head away. Don't look at me like that. I am not your answer, and you sure as fuck aren't mine. I'm not looking for an answer. I just want... Neil gestured helplessly, unable to finish that plea. He didn't know what he wanted. He didn't know what he needed. The past twenty-four hours had kicked his feet out from under him, and Neil still couldn't find his footing. He didn't know how to make that ache go away or how to silence the voice whispering unfair in his ears. I'm tired of being nothing, Neil said. Neil had seen this look on Andrew's face once before, when he and Andrew called a truce in Wymac's living room last summer. Neil fed him half-truths to buy his acceptance, but it wasn't vague descriptions of his parents' crimes and deaths that got through to Andrew. It was his bone-deep jealousy of Kevin, his loneliness and desperation. After everything they'd been through, these last few months, Neil finally knew what this look meant. The darkness in Andrew's stare wasn't censure. It was perfect understanding. Andrew had hit this point years ago and broken. Neil was hanging on by a fraying thread and grabbing at anything he could to stay afloat. You are a fox. You're always going to be nothing. Andrew stubbed his cigarette out. I hate you. Nine percent of the time you don't. Nine percent of the time I don't want to kill you. I always hate you. Every time you say that I believe you a little less. No one asked you. With that, Andrew caught Neil's face in his hands and leaned in. Nikki's drugged assault aside, Neil hadn't kissed anyone in four years. The last girl was a scrawny French-Canadian who'd held him with just her fingertips and kissed like she was afraid of smudging her tacky bright lipstick. Neil couldn't remember her name or face anymore. He remembered only how unsatisfying the illicit encounter had been and how furious his mother was when she found them. That awkward peck wasn't worth the punishment that had followed. This was nothing like that. Andrew kissed him like this was a fight with their lives on the line, like this world stopped and started with Neil's mouth. Neil's heart stuttered to a stop at the first hard press of his lips against his, and he reached up without thinking. His hand made it as far as Andrew's jaw before he remembered Andrew didn't like to be touched. Neil caught hold of Andrew's coat sleeve instead and knotted his fingers in the heavy wool. The touch was a trigger. Andrew leaned back just enough to say, tell me no. Neil's lips were sore. His skin was buzzing. He felt winded, like he'd survived a half marathon. He felt strong, like he could run another five more. Panic threatened to tear his stomach to shreds. Common sense said to refuse this and retreat before they both did something they'd regret. But Rene said Andrew regretted nothing, and Neil wouldn't live long enough for it to matter. He hadn't figured out which way to lean before Andrew pried Neil's hand off his coat. Let go, Andrew said. I'm not doing this with you right now. He practically shoved Neil's arm away from him and leaned back out of Neil's space. He picked up his crumpled cigarette butt, decided in a glance it wasn't salvageable, and dug his pack out of his pocket again. Neil watched him until it was lit, tracking the new tension in Andrew's shoulders and the violence in his short movements. He thought he should say something, but he didn't know where to start. Andrew's kiss and abrupt retreat were equally bewildering. Andrew managed only one drag before he crushed his second cigarette beside the first. He lit a third anyway, but Neil reached out and took it from him. It was a good sign, maybe, that Andrew didn't react to the theft. Neil set the stick beside his own dropped cigarette and looked back at Andrew. Andrew chucked his pack off to one side and tucked his knee to his chest. Neil should let it go, but he needed to understand. Why not? Because you're too stupid to tell me no, Andrew said. And you don't want me to tell you yes? This isn't yes. This is a nervous breakdown. I know the difference even if you don't. Andrew dug his thumb into his lower lip like he could erase the weight of Neil's mouth and fixed his stare on the horizon. I won't be like them. I won't let you let me be. Neil opened his mouth, closed it, and tried again. The next time one of them says you're soulless, I might have to fight them. Ninety-two percent, Andrew said. Going on ninety-three. It wasn't funny. None of this was. But that response was so obnoxious and so typically Andrew that Neil couldn't help but smile. He forced it off his face before Andrew noticed and looked out at the campus again. 
For the first time that day, maybe for the first time that rocky week, he could breathe without feeling like his chest was pulling too tight. As his tension seeped away, the weight of Neil's exhaustion came back, but this time it was genuine tiredness. He hadn't slept last night and had only snatched an hour's rest in the car. Sleeping now would throw the rest of his weekend off, but Neil didn't care. He scooped Andrew's key up and got to his feet. Hey, he said, but Andrew didn't look at him. Thank you. Go away before I push you off the side, Andrew said. Do it. I drag you with me, Neil reminded him, and left Andrew to his thoughts. By some miracle, his room was empty. Neil still closed the bedroom door before changing into sweats. He set his alarm to wake him up around dinner time, then pushed it back when his thoughts kept him up for another hour. He dragged his hand out from under the blanket and unclenched his fist to inspect his newest possession. The key's teeth had left indents along the flesh of his thumb. Neil worked the key onto his key ring beside Andrew's old car key and watched them sway without really seeing them. Neil gave up fantasizing shortly after his mother beat his interest in intimacy out of him. He still had needs, but he dealt with them with no more attention than he might afford hunger or thirst. Maybe refusing to want anything else was a coping mechanism. He couldn't have it, so there was no point resenting its absence. Paranoia helped reinforce that mindset over the years until keeping people at arm's length was the only logical thing to do. Befriending the foxes was inadvisable but inevitable. Kissing one of them was unthinkable and went against everything he knew. Neil hadn't meant to tow that line or invite Andrew across it. Chances were he wouldn't have to worry about it, considering Andrew's rather vocal dislike of him and his serious boundary issues. Andrew wasn't like Nicky, who would wheedle and argue and protest if Neil said it was a bad idea. If Neil turned him down flat, Andrew would never ask why or bring it up again. It'd be like nothing ever happened and Neil could live out the last few months of his life in peace. But was this peace or cowardice, and was this survival or avoidance? Neil couldn't tell himself all day long what the smart thing to do was, but if he really cared that much about what was smart, he wouldn't have come here in the first place. He would have left when he found out the Moriyamas were criminals, or when Rico called him by his real name, or when Rico dared him to trade his safety for Andrews. Neil had been doing one stupid thing after another all year long, and this had turned into the best year of his life. That wasn't reason enough to accept this, but Neil wasn't willing to reject it, either. Time wasn't something he had a lot of, but it was going to take more than these frazzled moments to figure it out. Neil knew he wasn't in the right state of mind to decide one way or another. He stuffed his keys under his pillow and rolled onto his side like that would change what had just happened. He told himself not to think about it right now, but his mouth still remembered the weight of Andrew's lips, and that made his hair stand on end. He distracted himself the only way he knew how, counting as high as he could in every language he knew. He didn't remember falling asleep, and he didn't know how long he was out before his phone hummed at him. The new message in his inbox was from an unfamiliar number, and all it said was, 48. Neil deleted it and would have passed out again if not for the muffled sound of a TV in the next room. Neil searched for the strength to face the upperclassmen and found it closer than it had been this morning. With a quiet sigh, he kicked his blankets off, shut his alarm off, and climbed down from the loft. Dan sat tucked against Matt's side on the couch. She snatched up the remote and cut the TV off as soon as she spotted Neil in the doorway. "'We wake you?' she asked." and even though Neil shook his head, said, Sorry, I shouldn't sleep this late in the day anyway, Neil said. He went to get a glass of water from the kitchen. He expected them to go back to whatever he'd interrupted, but when he returned to the living room, the TV was still dark. There was a silent conversation in the looks Matt and Dan sent each other. Neil didn't know which of them won, but Matt shook his head and looked across the room at Neil. We wanted to throw you a birthday party, Matt said. It doesn't seem right having a birthday and doing nothing for it. Renee thought it was a bad idea, though, to the point that she called Andrew for backup. He took her side. Neil remembered a phone call waking him up as they turned into Alpharetta. Andrew had only listened for a moment before saying, Don't. Neil quietly took back every suspicious thought he'd had about Renee. Her serene veneer would probably always have him second-guessing her, but she understood the little things when it mattered most. Thank you, but they're right, Neil said. 
I'd rather pretend it didn't happen. What if we skipped the party and just bought presents? Dan asked, and sighed when Neil shook his head. Fine. But if we let this go, we're going to do something crazy on March 31st. Deal? Define crazy, Neil said. Dan smiled like he hadn't spoken. Deal? Deal, Neil said. Good, Dan said. Now come on. Neil joined them on the couch and they turned their show back on. He might have forgotten about the text that woke him up if he didn't get a 47 message from a new number the following evening. Neil looked down at his phone in consternation as he realized someone was sending him a countdown. He pushed his schoolwork aside in favor of the calendar hanging from the kitchen fridge. He counted days with his fingers, flipping pages until he found March. For a moment, he thought he'd get to Neil Jostin's birthday, but he landed on Friday, March 9th. It was an odd day to end on. It was the last day before Palmetto State University's spring break. There was a game that night, but it wasn't one of the championship's two death matches. Neil checked his phone again, debating whether or not to respond. In the end, he deleted the text and went back to conjugating Spanish verbs. The rest of the foxes didn't find out until Monday morning that Andrew had replaced his wrecked car. Nicky trailed Neil across the parking lot, yammering away about a project he should have finished by today but was only halfway done with. When Andrew stopped walking, Nicky did too, but since Nicky didn't see the rental car, he kept talking. He stopped when Andrew opened the driver's door. Nicky looked, did a double take, and nearly fell down when he jumped back. No way! His yelp got the other's attention, and Matt was predictably the next to react. He bolted past Neil to stare at the car. What are you doing with a Maserati? Driving it, Andrew said like it should be obvious, and got in the driver's seat. Matt reached for the hood with both hands, but didn't touch it, like he thought his fingerprints might ruin the perfect exterior. The blatant awe on his face had Neil looking to Andrew. Andrew met his gaze through the windshield, but didn't hold it for long. He reached for the door to close it, but Matt darted around and put his hand in the way. He leaned over to look inside, owl-eyed and rapturous. Nicky had fewer reservations about putting his hands all over the new ride, and he made a slack-jawed lap of the car. But when? Matt asked. And how? Allison was less tactful. Did he steal it? Dan hissed at her to keep her voice down, but Allison shrugged her off. Matt beckoned to Andrew. Start it up. Let me hear it. Andrew twisted the key in the ignition and the car came to life with a quiet roar. Matt threw his hands up and spun away like he was orchestrating a symphony. Andrew closed his door, so Matt wheeled back to Dan, sputtering facts and statistics that went way over Neil's head. Neil glanced at Aaron to gauge his reaction. Aaron looked torn, as if he wanted to be awed by the prestigious ride, but couldn't let go of his resentment enough to be excited. Kevin was rarely impressed by wealth thanks to his upbringing, and he'd been there when Andrew bought the car. He didn't have the patience to put up with his teammates' antics, and he swept them all with an annoyed look. Don't make us late for practice. Whatever, Nicky said, but he scrambled into the back seat. He'd taken to riding in the middle seat so he could keep Aaron and Neil away from each other. He didn't waste his time buckling, but leaned between the front seats to stare at the dashboard. He was ooing and eyeing when Neil and Aaron got in. Andrew tolerated it for a couple seconds before shoving him out of the way with a hand on his face. Nicky was too excited to be bothered. Instead of complaining, he said, But seriously, Andrew, where did you get this thing? Georgia, Andrew said. Nicky sighed, but didn't ask again. Andrew and Aaron still weren't talking, and Aaron and Neil stayed out of each other's way whenever possible, but the rest of the foxes filled in the gaps as best they could. Rico's cruel prank last Friday brought out an unnecessary but well-meaning protective streak in the upperclassmen. Even Kevin made an effort to be more tolerable, maybe because he'd seen how shaken up Neil was on Saturday. Neil could have told them all he was fine, but they were playing together better than they had in a week and he didn't want to rock the boat. The Foxes had one more game to get through for the first round. Their back-to-back -back wins meant they'd secured their spot in the death match, but they weren't willing to take it easy this week. Neil tried stuffing Exy into every scrap of free time he had. He brought SUA tactics and lineups to class with him to hide under his textbooks, and he met Kevin at the dining hall for lunch to argue plays. Despite the active effort he made to focus on Friday's game, his thoughts kept derailing without warning. 
Whenever Andrew crossed the room, Neil's gaze followed. Every time Neil took his keys out of his pocket and saw the newest addition to his set, he remembered Andrew's kiss. He looked at Matt and Nicky to see if he saw them any differently, but nothing had changed. Neil didn't know what that meant, but he knew this still wasn't the time to figure it out. He should wait until next week, when the Foxes had a week off before the death match. The perfect distraction from himself came on Wednesday, when Kengo Moriyama collapsed at a board meeting and was raced to the hospital in an ambulance. Wymack always kept the news on for background noise when he was working at the stadium, so he messaged his team a heads up the second he heard. Neil was pretty sure there were microphones in Rico's face before Kengo was even checked in, and if he didn't hate Rico so much, he'd be disgusted by the reporter's heartless enthusiasm. He found snips of the interview online at the library computers between classes. Rico tolerated most of their prying questions with good grace and a calm demeanor, but the ugliness showed when he was asked if he was on his way to the hospital. The reporters knew full well that Kengo and Rico were estranged. They just didn't understand the severity of the separation. Kevin once told the Foxes Rico had never met his father or brother. The Moriyama family had no time to waste on second-born sons, so Rico was shipped to Tetsuji as soon as possible after birth. The look Rico turned on the woman should have melted the microphone she was holding. You are aware we have a game tomorrow? My place is here with my team. If the doctors are worth their degrees, they will return him to full health, whether or not I am there to see it happen. Neil got out his phone and texted Kevin. Do you think it's serious? It better not be, was Kevin's first response, and then, Rico still believes he can win his father's attention with his fame. If the Lord does not recover, Rico will take his anger and grief out on everyone around him. Neil considered that, then said, Good thing you're not there anymore. Jean still is, Kevin answered, and Neil knew better than to comment. Neil's replacement gear showed up Thursday. Friday's away game against Arkansas meant an all-day drive. They were on the Fox bus before the sun came up, and they stopped every four hours at rest stops. Neil finished his homework and studies with too much time to spare and got sick of his book halfway through. He knew SUA's line inside and out, so there was no point in reviewing it. He was tired from boredom, but not tired enough to sleep. Kevin and Nicky were fast asleep, and Andrew was staring out his window at nothing. Aaron was ignoring them as usual. Neil gave up on them as a source of entertainment and headed to the front of the bus, where the upperclassmen were caught up in a lively conversation. They didn't ask why he'd strayed from his usual seat, but absorbed him into their group without hesitation. It didn't make the ride feel any shorter, but it was significantly less mind-numbing. How Wymack slept through their noise, Neil didn't know. Willpower, he guessed, because Wymack still refused to hire a driver and didn't want his foxes staying in Arkansas overnight. He was bringing them back to South Carolina right after the game. They got into town around 6 central time, two hours before serve. Dinner was at a local buffet, where they desperately inhaled enough calories to get them through the game and they had enough time afterward to walk slow laps around SUA's court. When the gates finally opened to let the crowd in, Wymack sent his foxes to get ready. SUA didn't play with the speed or aggression UT and Belmont had brought to the court, but they were the most communicative team Neil had faced. They were constantly shouting back and forth to each other, calling openings and tracking each other's marks. They put up a fight, but they weren't awful about it. SUA had already lost out to both UT and Belmont. Winning against the Foxes wouldn't save them or their dignity. By halftime, the results from the other night's match were in. UT had slaughtered Belmont and would proceed to the death match. Having a rival knocked out gave the Foxes the second wind they needed, and they dominated the court through second half. The Foxes won by a comfortable margin, took their time washing off afterward, and were back on the bus by 11. Neil found a message waiting for him when he turned his phone back on. 42. He typed out a go away, but deleted it immediately. The last thing he wanted to do was encourage whoever was taunting him by acknowledging the messages. Neil shut his phone off again instead and went to celebrate with the upperclassmen. Chapter 10 A week without a match didn't lessen the intensity of their practices any, but Wymack built in a little elbow room where he could. It wasn't consideration, but necessity. 
He'd made the first round of cuts with his stack of would-be foxes and needed his team's help to narrow it down. The girls took to the task with enthusiasm Neil hadn't expected. He thought choosing their replacements would be a bittersweet reminder they were graduating in a year. If any of them were aware that their time was running out, though, they gave no sign of it. Less surprising was Kevin's scornful rejection of every file Wymack had to offer him. He insisted Wymack put out a second request, to which Wymack demanded Kevin be a little more accepting of strikers who hadn't been raised to be champions. Neil didn't have the experience or insight to argue with Kevin, but he quickly clung to one of the choices he'd made and refused to let it go. Kevin tried wrenching it from his hands only once before writing Neil off as a know-nothing and rounding on Wymack again. Abby stepped in when the argument got loud and banished Wymack and Kevin to opposite ends of the locker room. On Tuesday, Kengo was released from the hospital. If he wasn't Rico's father, he might have made it home without question or fanfare, since Kengo Moriyama passed as just another wealthy businessman. As it was, there were a couple reporters waiting on his doorstep. Kengo answered their questions with stony silence and let his assistants clear a path for him. HIPAA laws kept anyone from figuring out what had put him in the hospital in the first place, but he appeared to have recovered, so eventually the press gave up and moved on. On Wednesday afternoon, Andrew had his weekly session with Betsy Dobson, which meant his group would catch a ride with Matt. Kevin and Nikki were waiting for them in the hallway when Neil followed Matt out of their dorm room. Aaron was nowhere in sight. Neil locked the door behind him and looked to Nikki. Nikki shook his head. He said he was catching a ride with Andrew today. To the court? Dan asked. Neil considered Nikki's wide-eyed expression and guessed. To Dobson's. Aaron wants to sit in with him. No shit, Matt said, startled. You think so? Crazy, right? Nikki asked. I said I didn't know Andrew agreed to it, and Aaron said Andrew didn't know what he was planning. Aaron hasn't come back yet, so either he's dead in the parking lot or he pulled it off. Guess he got tired of Caitlin avoiding him? Speaking of, one of these days I want you to tell me how you roped her into it. I asked, Neil said. There goes that asked thing again, Matt said. Does it mean something different where you come from? Most of the time, yes, Neil said. The unexpected honesty startled a laugh from Matt. Without Andrew and Aaron's antagonism throwing up roadblocks, it was easy for the foxes to mingle. They went down the stairs, a mixed group. Nicky checked the parking lot for signs of Aaron's gruesome demise and hoisted himself into Matt's truck with a wide grin when he found none. Despite that glee, he was fast to volunteer Neil as spokesman when Wymack needed an explanation for Aaron's absence. Wymack responded by assigning the foxes extra laps. Neil expected at least Nicky to grumble about it, but Nicky was so floored by his cousin's questionable progress he shouldered the work without complaint. Andrew and Aaron had to notice the intense scrutiny they were subjected to upon their eventual arrival, but neither one acknowledged the attention. The foxes weren't suicidal enough to ask how it had gone. Andrew looked unruffled, but Aaron's expression was downright vicious. Wymack looked from one to the other. Is this going to be an ongoing thing? I need to know how to plan around you. No, Andrew said. Aaron flicked him an irritated look. Yes. Okay. Wymack said, and that was that. They didn't have a game on Friday, but the ERC finally posted the following week's lineup. Six teams from the evens bracket were proceeding to the death match, compared with eight from the odds. The Foxes would face the University of Vermont Catamounts at home. UT was up against Nevada, and Washington State would take on Binghamton. In the odds bracket, the big three had miraculously avoided drawing each other's names. They'd all proceed to the third round, along with whichever team won the Oregon-Maryland match. There would be another week-long break between the death match and round three. A free weekend meant they should have spent the night drinking in Columbia, but Aaron's stunt on Wednesday dragged the twins' Cold War down to a whole new level. According to Nikki, Aaron was only at the dorm long enough to sleep or change clothes. Nikki assumed Aaron spent the rest of his free time with Caitlin. Neil hoped he was wrong. Caitlin might be willing to talk to Aaron again now that he'd put his foot down, but Andrew had a promise to keep, and more reason than ever to lash out at her. If Caitlin was smart, she'd lie low for a couple weeks. They couldn't go to Columbia without Aaron, so Nikki dragged Neil to their room instead. 
Aaron was missing, but Nikki and Andrew claimed the beanbag chairs and teamed up in a horror game. Neil had brought his backpack, but the creepy music and occasional on-screen scream were perfect excuses not to attempt any homework. He looked to Kevin, who unplugged his headphones from his laptop and motioned over his shoulder to the bedroom. Kevin grabbed the computer, so Neil fetched a notepad and closed the bedroom door behind them. Kevin had a subscription to an Exe streaming site. He searched for Vermont's most recent game and turned the screen so they could both see. Neil took notes. Kevin absorbed what he could from watching, and they compared insights afterward. UVM had an imbalanced team, an intimidating defense backing up a mediocre offense line. Neil and Kevin would have their hands full, but at least their fractured backliners would have an easier time of things. One game turned into two and would have become three if Nicky hadn't come looking for them. It took Nicky only a second to realize what they were doing and he flicked a dismayed look between them. You aren't serious. It's Friday night and this is how you're entertaining yourselves? Give me a break. Think about something else for a while, would you? Like ice cream. I thought we were going down to Columbia. My body's been ready for some ice cream all day. I've been gypped and I demand compensation. That's not our problem, Kevin said. I'm making it your problem, Nikki said. Neil, you're coming with me to the store. Go by yourself, Kevin said. Great idea, Nikki said. Tiny flaw, though. I'm not on the insurance policy anymore and don't have a key to the new ride. You what? Neil asked, startled. Nikki shrugged and didn't explain. Let's go, Neil. The games will still be there tomorrow. I'm here right now. I'm hungry, and I'm tired of you ignoring me in my own room. Kevin opened another game and paused it so it could buffer. Andrew can take you. I'm not talking to you anymore, Nikki said. I'm talking to your mini-me. I, Neil started, but faltered when his phone buzzed. He could guess what it was, but there was a chance it wasn't. He pulled his phone out of his pocket and flipped it open to read today's contribution to the countdown. Thirty-five. Neil gazed down at it in silence. If Neil believed in signs, this would be proof he should stay here with Kevin. They could get another match in before they had to crash for the night. One more game and he'd probably have names and numbers memorized. They had less than three months until finals. The Foxes couldn't afford a single misstep between here and there. Neil looked up, ready to turn Nicky down, but Andrew had come up beside Nicky in the doorway. Neil looked at him and thought about Nicky's worried appeal last fall, the warning that one day Exy wouldn't be enough on its own. It could be a safe haven from his thoughts and a reason to get up and the inspiration to fight harder. It could mean the world to him, but it couldn't be everything. It couldn't fill in the broken pieces of him the way the foxes did. It wouldn't drop everything to get him from the airport or come back for him without question or call him friend. Neil built his life around Exy after his mother died because he needed something to live for, but Neil wasn't alone anymore. Maybe he'd regret this on Monday when he was a thousand steps behind Kevin at practice, but it wasn't like Neil would ever catch up to him anyway. Neil snapped his phone shut and looked at Kevin. What kind do you want? Kevin stared at him. You're not leaving he said, not quite a question. If we get into another one, we'll be up too late tonight. Pick a flavor. Kevin didn't respond. Maybe he was too disappointed in Neil to take the question seriously. Neil didn't care anymore what Kevin thought of him. Like he'd reminded Kevin the other week, Kevin's journey didn't stop in May. He could spend every night watching endless replays and tactics because he had all the time in the world to spare. Neil tucked his phone into his pocket and got to his feet. Text Nicky when you make up your mind. Nicky looked beside himself with glee over winning the tug of war. Neil let that self satisfaction trump Kevin's attitude and led Nicky down to the car. Nicky chattered about Eric for most of the drive to the grocery store. Nicky was planning on spending most of May in Germany. His short reunion with Eric over Christmas break just made Nicky miss him more than ever, and Nicky was counting down days until they could see each other again. He was a little worried what Andrew and Aaron might do in his absence, but he trusted Neil to keep them both alive until the dorms reopened in June. Kevin still hadn't messaged Nicky by the time they reached the ice cream aisle, so Nicky gave in and called him. Neil half expected Kevin to ignore Nicky's call, but Kevin wasn't so sour with them that he'd turn down a free snack. Nicky paid for the pints before Neil could offer to get his own, and they headed back to the dorm with their haul.
Kevin was nowhere in sight, but the bedroom door was closed again. Neil assumed he'd resumed watching matches alone. It bothered Neil for a moment that Kevin wasn't willing to wait for him, but he refused to regret his decision. Nikki grabbed spoons from the kitchen and distributed pints to their hungry owners. Neil checked his expression when Nikki came back from dropping Kevin's off, but Nikki just rolled his eyes at Neil and grinned again. Nikki tossed the empty plastic bag in the general direction of the garbage can and surveyed his DVD stand with his fists on his hips. After a minute's serious study, Nikki complained, There's nothing to watch. I'm going to scour Matt's collection. He said it definitively, but he waited a beat in case Andrew shot that idea down. Neil looked from him to Andrew, who was rolling his pint between his hands to soften it. When Andrew said nothing, Nicky vanished. Neil locked the door behind him and carried his ice cream to Andrew. He knelt on the floor near Andrew's beanbag chair and listened. He didn't hear the sound of a game coming from the bedroom, but Kevin's headphones weren't on his desk anymore. Neil set his ice cream and spoon to one side and turned a searching look on Andrew. Question, Neil said, but it took him a few moments to figure out the right words. When you said you don't like being touched, is it because you don't like it at all or because you don't trust anyone else enough to let them touch you? Andrew glanced at him. It doesn't matter. If it didn't, I wouldn't ask, Neil said. It doesn't matter to a man who doesn't swing, Andrew clarified. Neil shrugged. I don't because I've never been allowed to. The only thing I could think about growing up was surviving. Maybe that was why this was in that gray area of what was acceptable. It didn't matter that Andrew was a would-be sociopath or a man. The idea of Andrew was so intertwined with the idea of Neil's safety that this too was a means of self-preservation. Letting someone in meant trusting them not to stab me in the back when terrible people came looking for me. I was too afraid to risk it, so it was easier to be alone and not think about it. But I trust you. You shouldn't, says the man who stopped. Neil gave Andrew a few moments to respond before saying, I don't understand it, and I don't know what I'm doing, but I don't want to ignore it just because it's new. So are you completely off limits, or are there any safe zones? What are you hoping for, coordinates? I'm hoping to know where the lines are before I cross them, Neil said but I'm open to drawing a map on you if you want to loan me a marker. That's not a bad idea. Everything about you is a bad idea, Andrew said, as if Neil didn't already know that. I'm still waiting for an answer. I'm still waiting for a yes or no I actually believe, Andrew returned. Yes. Neil took the pint from Andrew's unresisting fingers, stacked it on top of his, and leaned in. He stopped shy of actually kissing Andrew, not daring to touch him until Andrew gave him a green light. Andrew's expression didn't change, but there was a subtle shift in his body's tension that told Neil he'd gotten Andrew's attention. Neil lifted a hand but stopped at a safe difference from Andrew's face. Andrew caught hold of his wrist and squeezed in warning. "'It's fine if you hate me,' Neil said. It was the truth, if a bit of an understatement. So long as Andrew was only physically attracted to Neil, this was safe to experiment with. Neil's death wouldn't be more than a faint inconvenience to Andrew. Good, Andrew said, because I do. For a second, Neil thought Andrew would push him away and be done with this. Andrew did push, but he followed Neil down. The short carpet was rough against Neil's knuckles where Andrew pinned his hand over his head. Neil couldn't complain when Andrew was an unyielding weight on top of him. He started to reach for Andrew again but stopped himself halfway there. Andrew snagged that hand too and held it down out of the way. Stay, Andrew said, and leaned down to kiss him. Time was nothing. Seconds were days, were years, were the breaths that caught between their mouths and the bite of Neil's fingernails against his palms, the scrape of teeth against his lower lip, and the warm slide of a tongue against his... He could feel Andrew's heartbeat thrumming against his wrists, a staccato rhythm that echoed in Neil's veins. How a man who viewed the world with such studied disconnect could kiss like this, Neil didn't know, but he wasn't going to complain. Neil had forgotten what it was like to be touched without malicious intent. He'd forgotten what body heat felt like. Everything about Andrew was hot, from the hands holding him down to the mouth steadily taking Neil apart. Neil finally understood why his mother thought this was so dangerous. This was distraction and indiscretion, avoidance and denial. 
It was letting his guard down, letting someone in, and taking comfort in something he shouldn't have and couldn't keep. Right now, Neil needed it too much to care. It didn't, couldn't last long because Kevin was in the next room, and Nicky was just two doors down, but Neil's mouth was numb and his thoughts buzzed to incoherency by the time a thump said Nicky had walked into the locked door. Neil fought back a flash of irritation as Andrew pushed himself up and away from Neil. Neil tried to call to Nicky to wait a moment, but he didn't have the breath to speak. Andrew studied Neil's expression for a few seconds, then got to his feet and started for the door. Neil pushed himself up with unsteady hands and retreated to Kevin's desk with his ice cream. Getting the plastic safety seal off was the hardest thing he'd done all year, but at least it gave him an excuse not to look at Nicky. Nicky grumbled about being locked out of his own room as he came through the doorway, but by the time he made it to his beanbag chair, he'd already forgotten it in favor of the movies he'd borrowed. Look, you guys get to vote this time, Nicky said, like he was doing them a huge favor. He rattled off titles and lead actors. Neil let the list go in one ear and out the other. He recognized most of the actors' names after living with the Foxes for so long, but he didn't know any of the movies. He didn't care right now anyway, and it didn't take Nicky long to catch on. Hello, Earth to Neil. You even listening to me? Neil looked at the half-moon marks he'd left on his palm. You choose. You two are the least helpful people in the entire universe, Nicky complained but it took him only a second to make up his mind. The case snapped open and closed as he popped the DVD out. Neil listened to Bean's crunch as Nicky got comfortable in his chair. Neil didn't hear Andrew getting settled again, but he didn't trust himself enough to look and see where Andrew was. Come on, Neil! Neil couldn't come up with an excuse to stall longer. I'm coming! The overhead lights cut off then, which meant Andrew had stayed by the door after letting Nicky in. Thinking that Andrew needed space and time to regroup the same way Neil did almost wrecked Neil's attempts to get his neutral facade back together. The chili ice cream was a little more helpful at sucking the heat from his skin, so Neil held tight to it and got up from the desk. There wasn't room to sit between the beanbag chairs, and he couldn't look like he was avoiding Andrew, so he sat on the floor to Andrew's left. Nicky got the movie started as soon as Andrew joined them. Neil watched it so he wouldn't stare at Andrew, but if someone asked him later what it was about, he wouldn't be able to tell them. He was sure he still felt Andrew's heartbeat on his skin when he went to bed a few hours later. Neil had survived more than a few hectic weeks growing up, but the week leading up to the Fox's first death match was almost enough to rattle even him. His teammates' stress levels were through the roof, and Neil couldn't help but be affected by their quiet panic. Dan tried playing it cool, but Neil could hear the strain in her voice as she directed her team at practices. Allison harped at the fractured defense line any chance she got, and Kevin was awful to all of them. Matt was marginally better at keeping his act together, but the further into the week they got, the more restless and anxious he seemed. Even Renee was feeling it, though she hid it well. When her friends were around, she was the perfect rock to lean on, as encouraging and pleasant as always. It was a different story when she was walking laps on break with just Neil and Andrew. She admitted to nothing, but she looked a little more tired every day. Neil knew better than to ask her if she was all right. She might feel obligated to put on a smile for him, too, when what she really needed was time to catch her breath and soothe her own nerves. It took Neil a couple days to realize it wasn't the foxes draining most of her energy. Renee rarely said anything on their walks anymore, too intent on what was happening on her phone. The occasional unhappy twitch at the corner of her mouth said her text conversations with Jean weren't going well. Afternoon scrimmages had all of them walking away bruised and sore. Kevin and Neil pulled out all the stops to get around their teammates, and their backliners pushed back as hard as they could. Despite the aches Neil took home with him, the only thing he could think about over dinner was getting back to the court that night. When Neil drove Kevin to the court Wednesday night, he said, We should have brought Andrew with us. No, Kevin said. I told you, he must come with us of his own volition. It means nothing if he agrees for our sake. I know what you said, Neil said, but we need more practice against a guarded goal. It would not do us any good, Kevin said. Your target is not the goalkeeper, it's the goal itself. Goalkeepers change every week. No two have the same strengths or styles. Why obsess over besting one man when it has no effect on the rest? 
Perfect your own performance, and it won't matter who is in goal. I'm just saying, continue arguing with me and you will be practicing alone tonight. Neil scowled out the windshield and went quiet. Despite his annoyance, Neil thought about Kevin's words the remainder of the drive. He couldn't make sense of them, but he refused to ask Kevin to explain. Goalkeepers weren't invisible obstacles. They were the last line of defense for their teams and usually the most agile players on the court. Scoring wasn't just landing a ball within the marked goal lines. It was getting the ball to that point in a way the goalkeeper couldn't predict or deflect. It still bothered Neil the next day, so he asked the Foxes goalies about it on break Thursday afternoon. Renee turned her phone over in her hands as she considered it. Andrew didn't even acknowledge the question. It's an interesting idea, Renee said, and it seems to be working for him. Asking someone to change his mindset and approach is a tall order, though, especially so late in the season. Then again, she said after a moment, you did change rackets mid-season. A racket is one thing, Neil said. I don't think I can do this. If you don't want to, don't, Renee said, as if it was that simple to turn Kevin down. If you want to try, we will help you any way I can. No, Andrew said before Neil could answer. Stop copying him. I'm trying to get better, Neil said. I can't improve on my own. Andrew flicked him a bored look and said nothing else. Neil gave him a minute, then planted himself in front of Andrew when he realized Andrew really wasn't planning on elaborating or explaining. Renee quietly put her phone away and looked between them. Her gaze lingered on Neil, but Neil didn't return it. He searched Andrew's calm expression for answers. Why shouldn't I copy him? Neil asked. You are never going to play like he does, Andrew said. Before Neil could take that as an insult against his potential, Andrew continued. He is a fool whose style is numbers and angles, formulas and statistics, trial and error, repetition and insanity. All he cares about is finding the perfect game. Is that so bad? Don't ask stupid questions. Don't make me. A junkie like you can't be that cold, Andrew said. I'm not a junkie. Andrew just looked at him, so Rene broke in with a careful, I think he means to say Kevin is very analytical, whereas you're passionate. You both care about winning, but not in the same way. Andrew said nothing to confirm or deny that interpretation, so Neil stepped out of his way. Andrew continued on, done with this conversation. Renee remained behind with Neil but said nothing else. Neil gazed after Andrew as he considered their take on it. If Andrew was right, Kevin didn't care about goalkeepers because he was a technical player. His focus was on perfecting impossible shots and tricky angles. He played against himself, not the goalkeeper, so the goalie was always an afterthought. Andrew was right. Neil couldn't play like that. Learning Kevin's tricks was necessary to his development as a player, but Neil could never implement them the exact same way on the court. Neil was too aware of the obstacles, and his thrill came in outsmarting his marks. He liked being the better, faster player. He liked frantic plays, close calls, and heart-stopping goals. It didn't have to be pretty or perfect so long as they won in the end. Understanding took the edge off last night's lingering tension. As Neil relaxed, he realized Renee was still watching him. She smiled when Neil looked at her and tipped her head a beckon to come along. They started after Andrew and walked their last lap in comfortable silence. When the Foxes hit the court February 9th, no one was expecting the fight they brought to it. Forty-five minutes into the game, the Catamounts were trailing by three points. On the TV in the Foxes' locker room, the sportscasters were shaking their heads in amazement. I'm with you on this one, Marie. I'm not entirely sure who we're looking at now or what they did with last year's Foxes, but they've completely blown me away. Neil glanced at the TV as he stretched. The two were reporting live from inside the foxhole court, a few feet from the Foxes' empty benches. It was hard to hear them over the noise from the stands, especially when Rocky Foxy, the mascot, went wheeling by. Quite honestly, I never expected them to finish the season, Marie said. The number of setbacks they've endured this year is unbelievable, and I was sure they'd bow out in November. It's a serious credit to this year's lineup that they've made it this far. This is the first Fox roster that actually embraces teamwork. Indeed, her male counterpart agreed.
This is the kind of synchrony you expect from top-notch schools. A few weeks ago, we all laughed when freshman Neil Jostin said the Foxes were raring for a rematch with the Ravens. No one's laughing now. If they can keep this momentum and keep playing like they are tonight, they stand a real chance of proceeding to semifinals. Ten minutes left of halftime, Marie said. The score is 6-3. It's going to take some serious footwork for the Catamounts to recover. We're less than an hour from seeing if the Foxes can secure their first deathmatch victory. Let's take a look at some highlights from the first half, and then... Dan turned the TV off and stood in front of the dark screen. Matt gave her a minute, then touched her shoulder to get her attention. She answered his questioning look with a wry smile. It's weird hearing them say good things about us, she said. It took them long enough, Allison huffed. It took us long enough to earn their consideration, Renee pointed out, not unkindly. The seniors exchanged a long look, exhausted and triumphant. The Foxes' first lineup had crashed and burned two steps out of the starting gate, and halfway through the season they'd been the laughing stock of the sport. The girls came to Palmetto State University knowing it'd take work to salvage that sour reputation, and knowing WiMac was their only ally. XE was a co-ed sport, but women were vastly outnumbered in the NCAA. Even fewer made it to major leagues and professional teams. The school board approved the three on WiMax say-so, but their own teammates made their lives a living hell. Despite every loss and every roadblock, they'd made it, and now they were finally getting the nod they deserved. All right, Dan said, turning away from the TV. Her gaze lingered for a moment on the newest addition to the locker room a mahogany stand in the corner near Andrew and Neil's picture. She'd said last month she wanted a stand for their eventual championship trophy. Neil thought she'd been talking big to inspire the team, but apparently not. Allison found the perfect one yesterday after dinner. When Neil and Kevin came to the court to practice last night, they'd found the upperclassmen getting the stand situated. Dan smiled, short and fierce, and looked around at her teammates. I'm in the mood to completely ruin the Catamount's night. Anyone with me? Let's do it, Matt said with a toothy grin. What have you got for us, coach? Wymack ran down the first half pointers as quickly as he could and led them back to the court when the warning buzzer sounded. UVM came out as strong as they could at serve, angered by first half's results and spurred on by their coach's halftime rants. They were an entirely new monster, but Neil squished his flicker of panic. Losing his cool here would only destroy the Fox's chances. He focused only on what he and Kevin could control and trusted his teammates to handle their side of the court. Twenty minutes into second half, the score still hadn't budged. Neil and Kevin couldn't get around their fresh backliners, and the UVM strikers couldn't get past Andrew. The game hadn't been friendly before, but as tempers flared and patience thin, play got a little rougher. Neil was used to a bit of back-and-forth shoving with his marks as they waited for the ball to come their way, but this aggressive pushing had him skidding across the floor. Neil gritted his teeth and pushed back, but his backliner had a half foot and forty pounds on him. He wasn't going anywhere without some violence. A fight was coming. They all knew it. It was just a toss-up as to which player snapped first. Surprisingly, or not, it was Andrew. After smashing another ball up court, Andrew beat his racket against the wall and called Nicky. Neil only had a half second to see Nicky wheel toward the goal. The ball was on its way to Kevin, and that was more important than what was happening at the far end of the court. Kevin couldn't get past his backliner and was in a bad angle to pass to Neil, so he flicked the ball to Dan. Dan shouldered her mark out of the way and raced up the court to buy the striker's room. She heaved the ball to the far wall so it rebound to the striker's. Neil and Kevin raced for it, but the goalkeeper took a running leap to get the ball first. He popped it up toward the ceiling at a steep angle and it came back down at midcourt between the dealers and Fox's defense. Nicky's mark started for it and Nicky swept his legs out from under him with his racket. Such a blatant foul brought the entire game to a screeching halt, at least until Nicky's striker found his feet again. He came at Nicky with fists flying, but Andrew was already there. He thrust his racket out lengthways between them and used it to shove the furious striker away from his cousin. The striker was almost stupid enough to take a swing at Andrew instead, but Matt and his mark intervened. By then, the referees were on court and Nicky blew them a kiss when he was handed his red card. He sailed off the court like a triumphant champion, both fists high in the air and grinning ear to ear. Aaron came on to replace him, and the teams prepped for a foul shot. Neil was smiling as he took his place. He glanced down the line at Kevin. 
Kevin was already braced to run, confident in Andrew's ability to defend the shot. Andrew did, like always. He fired the rebound where Neil could get it. Neil tore off up the court like his father was on his heels, and there was nothing his striker could do to stop him. A glance at Kevin showed his mark was too close for a safe pass. Neil snagged the ball and passed it to himself instead, hitting the ground low where it had bounced off the wall a few feet from goal. The goalkeeper took a swing for it, but Neil was just quick enough. He grabbed the ball, twisted his racket out of the way in the nick of time, and fired at the goal. He was going too fast and was too close to the wall to stop, but he had just enough space to turn. He crashed shoulder blade first, back and helmet next, and grunted as the breath was crushed from his lungs. Neil didn't care about the pain. The goal was red and the buzzer was deafening in his ears. He stumbled away from the wall, using his racket as a cane until he found his balance again and gasped air back into his aching body. The goalkeeper snarled something rude at him, but Neil tuned it out with the ease of long practice. His teammates caught up with him on his way across the court. Neil clacked sticks and accepted their excited congratulations, but all that mattered was getting through them to the goal. Neil didn't have a lot of time left before the referees could dock them for stalling play, so he jogged the rest of the way to Andrew. Nicky's not a fighter, Neil said. You told him to take a swing. It was getting boring, Andrew said. Neil grinned. Now are you having fun? That part was vaguely interesting, Andrew said. I can take or leave the rest. It's a start, Neil said, and headed to half court. Ten minutes later, Kevin exploited the catamount's rattled nerves and scored. The catamounts didn't score again at all, though they tried with a ferocity born of desperation. Andrew stopped every shot on goal and bounced a couple rebounds off the strikers' helmets just to rile them further. The stands were in an uproar the entire last minute on the clock. With five seconds left in the game, Dan threw her racket aside and took a running leap into Matt's arms. The buzzer sounded on an 8-3 win. They dominated the first death match and were on to round three for the first time ever. Dan had Matt's helmet off by the time the Foxes got up to her and kissed him to the roar of the crowd. Kevin and Aaron clacked sticks and exchanged triumphant looks. Neil was dimly aware of the subs tearing across the court toward them, but he looked past them to where Andrew was standing alone in goal. He'd already set his racket aside and was busy undoing his gloves. He had to know this was a historic night for the Foxes, and Neil knew he could hear the crowd losing its mind, but Andrew was unhurried and uninterested. Whatever had inspired him to intervene earlier was long gone. Neil hadn't honestly expected this to be the game that finally got through to Andrew, but that didn't make it easier to see him regress. Nicky was a perfectly timed distraction, barreling into Aaron and Neil nearly hard enough to take them off their feet. He hooked his arms around their shoulders and gave them a back-cracking squeeze. "'Can you believe it?' he asked, amazed. "'We are such hot shit sometimes!' Allison gave Neil's shoulder a thump on her way past them to Dan and Matt. Renee snagged Kevin for a quick hug before looping arms with Allison and Dan. Dan was laughing, giddy with impossible success. Matt left them to each other and slung an arm around Kevin's shoulders. Neil looked from one happy face to another, savoring and memorizing this moment. Andrew missed the half-court party, but he showed up in time to follow his teammates past the Catamounts lineup. Wymack, Abby, and two cameras were waiting for them when they filed off the court. Dan flashed the cameras a toothy grin before hugging both Wymack and Abby. Neil joined his teammates in waving up at the stands but was quick to abandon the girls to the reporters' microphones and questions. Wymack was waiting for them in the lounge when they were all showered and dressed. He did a quick head count and nodded when he found all nine accounted for. "'Remember when I told you not to make plans for tonight?' he jerked his thumb at Abby. "'We're going to her place. That's we as in everyone.' He sent a significant look at Andrew's group. "'Consider this a mandatory team event. Abby's already agreed to cook for us, and I spent most of the morning stocking her cabinets with booze.' "'Was that a vote of confidence or plans for a consolation party?' Dan asked. "'Doesn't matter,' Wymax said. "'Let's go. I'm starving, and I really need a cigarette.' Security guards helped them get to their cars. Traffic made the ride to Abby's five times longer than it should have been, but the foxes were in too good of moods to really care. Abby's fridge was full of covered dishes she'd prepped earlier in the day. She popped a couple pans in the oven while Wymack and Dan poured drinks. Kevin stayed in the kitchen when Wymack and Dan started talking about the night's game. 
Matt commandeered the sound system in the other room. Nicky and Allison argued with all of his choices and each other, but they didn't sound serious, so Neil didn't intervene. Aaron had claimed a chair by the window and was watching them with a distant look on his face. He shot Neil a dirty look when he realized Neil was watching him, but Neil waved him off and went in search of the absentee goalkeepers. He didn't waste time going down the hall, since the only rooms back that way were bedrooms, but went out onto the front porch. Andrew was sitting on the hood of his car with Rene standing in front of him. Rene glanced at the house at the sound of the door and motioned for Neil to join them. When Neil was halfway there, though, Rene turned around from Andrew and headed up the sidewalk. She flashed Neil a smile on her way by, but said nothing. Neil wondered what he'd interrupted and whether or not he should apologize. He didn't have time to make up his mind before Rene disappeared inside. Neil took the spot she'd just abandoned and studied Andrew's blank face. We won, Neil said. He waited, but of course Andrew didn't respond to that. Neil tried to stamp out his frustration, but couldn't stop all of a sigh. Uh, would it kill you to let something in? It almost did last time, Andrew said. He said it matter-of-factly, but Neil still winced when he realized his misstep. He reached out but stopped his hand a careful distance from Andrew's arm. Andrew's long sleeves and bands hid his scars, but Neil remembered how they felt under his fingers. This is different, Neil said. The only one in your way now is you. You really could be court one day, but you can't get there if you won't try. Neil waited, but Andrew stared wordlessly back at him. Neil could win a stare down with almost anyone else, but he didn't have the patience to fight Andrew tonight. Andrew, talk to me. You sound like a wind-up doll with only one topic, Andrew said. I have nothing to say to you. If I talk about something else, will you talk to me? Andrew quirked a brow at him. Can you talk about something else? That stung. Neil opened his mouth to snap something back, but words failed him. The small talk that kept their teammates entertained so easily meant nothing to either of them. Neil didn't want to talk about movies and classes with Andrew. He wanted to talk about tonight's unprecedented win. He wanted to talk about their chances of breaking through round three for another death match. He wanted to talk about the look on Rico's face when the Foxes faced them again in May. He wanted to savor this, not write it off as something trivial and uninteresting. The front door opened. Nikki held onto the door frame, but leaned out to call them. Drinks are ready. You coming or what? Andrew pushed Neil out of the way and slid off the car. Too late. Neil was too disgruntled to stop him. He stayed by the car until Andrew caught up to Nikki, then finally set off toward the house. Halfway across the lawn, his phone went off. Neil was annoyed enough to answer tonight's 28 in his inbox with an enough. No one responded. Chapter 11 The rules changed in round three. Up until now, a team's chances depended solely on its ability to win as many games as possible. From here through finals, the emphasis switched to points. The three schools that had survived the evens bracket deathmatch would face off against each other over the next three weeks. Whichever two teams netted the most points between the games would proceed to the second elimination round. Technically, a team could lose both games and still advance, but that hadn't happened in years. Because of the odd number of teams, the Foxes would play Nevada home on February 23rd having the following week off, and face off against Binghamton in an away game on March 9th. The week between the death match and Nevada's game was a rest week, but the Foxes weren't willing to take it easy. They were as inspired by as they were terrified of their win on Friday, and they didn't want to lose momentum. Luckily for them, there was no way they could slow down. Mac kept them ramped up until Thursday. A TV crew came by the Foxhole Court Thursday afternoon to film a segment on the Foxes for their NCAA show. Neil thought Kevin would argue, since the interviews and filming men practice was a stop-and-start broken mess, but Kevin knew how badly the Foxes needed good publicity. Neil had almost forgotten how pleasant Kevin could be when there was a camera in his face. Neil stifled the urge to call Kevin out on his act and avoided the microphones as much as possible. Neil couldn't escape the spotlight forever. Wymack and Kevin both watched over the reporter's head when Neil was finally singled out for an interview. Neil answered Kevin's warning stare with a placid look and attempted to remain civil for as long as he could. It was easy at first, since most of the questions were about the Fox's progress. 
It was inevitable they'd finish up with a question about Rico and the Ravens. Neil tried for something neutral, but the interviewer took a good-natured jab at his newfound discretion. The last time I said something no one wanted to hear, my school got vandalized, Neil said. I was trying to prevent collateral damage this time, but you know what? You're right. I can't afford to be quiet. Silence means I condone their behavior, and that's a dangerous illusion. I'm not going to forgive or tolerate them just because they're talented and popular. Let me answer that question again, okay? Yes, Neil said. I'm a thousand percent sure we are going to face the Ravens in finals this spring, and I know for a fact we are going to win this time. And when the nation's best loses to a nine-man, know-nothing team, when they lose to a team their own coach likened to feral dogs, Edgar Allen is going to have to change things up. Personally, I think they should start by demanding Coach Moriyama's resignation. The noise Kevin made wasn't human. The interviewer and his cameraman both shot startled looks over their shoulders at him. Kevin didn't stick around long enough for them to ask, but bolted down the hall, out of sight. Wymack, despite having complained numerously and at length about Neil's attitude problem, flashed his teeth in a fierce smile. Neil answered the interviewer's curious stare with a blank look and waited for the signal that he was done. As soon as the camera was off, he headed back to the court. Unsurprisingly, Kevin ignored him the rest of the day. Neil had a feeling practice that night would be chilly and silent. Matt drew the same conclusion and wished Neil a cheery good luck before heading out to a late dinner with Dan. Neil locked the door behind him, checked the clock, and spent the next half hour toiling through math problems. He was on the last one when there was a single rap at his door. It wasn't Kevin's imperious knock or Nicky's enthusiastic rat-tat-tat, but the upperclassmen wouldn't drop by when Matt and Dan were both out. Neil pushed his schoolwork aside and went to investigate. Andrew stood in the hallway, hands stuffed inside the front pocket of a dark hoodie. Neil opened the door wider and stepped out of the way. Andrew glanced past him before entering the room. Neil guessed he was looking for an audience, so explained, Matt went out with Dan for a couple hours. Are you coming with us to the court? Entertain yourself tonight. Andrew invited himself into the kitchen and opened the fridge. Kevin is too drunk to curse your name, much less stand up and hold a racket. He what? Neil asked, but Andrew didn't waste his breath repeating it. Neil looked down the hall like he could somehow see Kevin in his wretched state. Coward. Don't sound surprised, Andrew said. It's nothing new. I thought I'd gotten through to him last time, Neil admitted. He closed the door and propped his shoulder against the kitchen door frame. On a scale of one to ten, how bad do you think this will get? How bad can it? Andrew returned. Rico can't kill you yet, and Moriyama already told the Raven fans to stay out of it. They could still disqualify us somehow, Neil said. They got their showdown last October. Since they don't think we can make it to finals, there's no reason for them to tolerate us any longer. They don't have a choice anymore. If the Ravens don't let us run our course, there will always be room for doubt and speculations. The Ravens can't share their throne with what-ifs. They have to be supreme victors. Andrew gave that a moment to sink in before saying, I'm undecided. About our chances this spring? Neil asked. Andrew held his hands palm up between them. The thought that you've unintentionally conned them into this corner is intolerable, as it means you're stupider than I even gave you credit for. If you did it knowingly, however, you're cleverer than you've led me to believe. That means the Ravens aren't the only ones you're playing with. One of these is the lesser evil. Not everything's a con. Neil said. Andrew didn't answer, but Neil read his calm expression as disbelief. Neil considered defending himself and decided it was a waste of energy. Andrew wouldn't believe him anyway. Which one is the lesser evil? I'm undecided, Andrew said again. That's helpful, Neil muttered. You could just ask. Why bother? Andrew asked with a slight shrug. I'll figure it out eventually. Andrew stole a beer from the fridge and worked the tab back and forth. Neil watched him for a moment before looking across the room at his desk. He was annoyed with Kevin for canceling practice, but he knew a free evening was a lucky break. He had a math test next week and a paper due tomorrow that he hadn't started yet. Midterms weren't far away and Neil's grades were straddling their usual shaky line. This was the perfect night to play catch-up. A metal tab bounced off his cheek. Neil looked back at Andrew and was suddenly keenly aware of Matt's absence. It had been over a week since Andrew pushed Neil down and kissed him. They hadn't been alone long enough to do anything since. 
He didn't know if Andrew saw that understanding on his face, or if Andrew had just wanted his undivided attention. Andrew set the beer aside without taking a sip and closed the fridge door with his foot. It took two steps to close the small space between them, and Andrew stopped as close as he could get without actually leaning against Neil. His fingers were cold from the can when he curled them around Neil's chin. Yes or no? Andrew asked. Yes, Neil said. Andrew sent a significant look down at Neil's arms where they were folded across his chest. It took Neil a moment to catch on, and then he dropped his arms and stuffed his hands in his jeans pockets. Andrew waited until he'd gone still before kissing him. Neil stopped thinking about classes, Exy, and Kevin's liquid spine, and let Andrew kiss him senseless. He was cotton-headed and unsteady by the time Andrew pressed his other hand flat against Neil's abdomen. Every nerve ending from his chest down seemed to twitch in response. Neil clenched his hands into fists like that would keep them where they were, and let Andrew back him into the wall. His phone hummed as he received his daily countdown, and pressed against the wall it sounded obnoxiously loud. Andrew let go of Neil's chin and fished the phone out of his back jeans pocket. He leaned back a bit as he held the phone up in offering. Neil half expected him to open it and was relieved Andrew didn't. Neil took his phone and tossed it out of their reach without bothering to open the next. He knew what day it was. He knew how little time was left. He didn't care to see it, especially right now. Andrew watched the phone bounce off the couch and skitter across the carpet. It was a toss-up whether or not he'd ask. Neil kissed his neck, hoping to distract him, and was rewarded with a startled jolt. That was enough reason to do it again. Andrew pushed his face away, but they were standing too close together for Neil to miss the way he shivered. Andrew kissed him before Neil could say anything about it.